Section 39 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 39. June 1770. 1770, June 1. In the night it rained, and at times blew strong, not much to our satisfaction, who were in a situation not very desirable, as if our anchor should come home or cable break, we had nothing to expect but going ashore on some one or another of the shoals which lay around us. The night passed, however, without the least accident, and at daylight in the morn the anchor was got up and we proceeded, in hopes of getting out of our archipelago. By noon we got in with the mainland, which made hilly and barren. On it were some smokes. In the evening the weather settled fine and we sailed along shore. At night came to an anchor. Jupiah complained this evening of swelled gums. He had, it seems, had his mouth sore for near a fortnight, but not knowing what cause it proceeded from, did not complain. The surgeon immediately put him upon taking extract of lemons in all his drink. 1770, June 2. Sailing along shore with fine weather. The country hilly and ill-wooded. Some islands were still in sight ahead of us. At noon the irregularity of the soundings made it necessary to send the boat ahead again. In the evening the country was moderately hilly, and seemed green and pleasant. One smoke was seen upon it. At night we anchored, several large islands being without us. 1770, June 3. At daybreak the anchor was weighed, and we stood along shore, till we found ourselves in a bay, off the outermost point of which were the islands seen yesterday. By eight it was resolved to stand out again, through a passage which was seen between them and the main, which was accordingly done. The country within the bay, especially on the innermost side, was well wooded, looked fertile and pleasant. After dinner, standing among islands which were very barren, rising high and steep from the sea, on one of these we saw with our glasses two men, a woman, and a small canoe fitted with an outrigger, which made us hope that the people were something improved, as their boat was far preferable to the bark canoes of Stingray's Bay. 1770, June 4. Hills in the morn were very high and steep but soon fell into very low land, to all appearance barren. The water began now to be discoloured, and an appearance of islands was seen ahead, which made us look out for more shoals. At noon one smoke was seen behind some hills inland. At night we passed pretty near a headland, which appeared miserably rocky and barren. Much seaweed with very fine leaves passed by the ship all day. 1770, June 5. Land near the sea very low and flat, behind which the hills rose. In the country, very little appearance of fertility, however, either on one or the other. At noon, one large fire was seen. Several cuttle-bones and two sea-snakes swam past the ship. In the even, the thermometer was at seventy-four, and the air felt to us hotter than we have felt it on the coast before. Many clouds of a thin scum lay floating upon the water, the same as we have seen before off Rio de Janeiro. Some few flying fish also. 1770, June 6 land made in barren rocky capes. One in particular, which we were abreast of in the morn, appeared much like Cape Roxant. At noon three fires upon it. Many cuttle-bones, some seaweed, and two or three sea-snakes were seen. In the even it fell quite calm, and I went out in the small boat and shot Nectris nugax, but saw nothing remarkable on the water. The weather most sultry hot in an open boat. 1770, June 7. Sailing between the main and islands, the main rose steep from the water, rocky and barren. Just about sunrise a shoal of fish about the size of, and much like flounders, but perfectly white, went by the ship. At noon the islands had mended their appearance, and people were seen upon them. The main is barren as ever, with several fires upon it, one vastly large. After dinner an appearance very much like coconut trees tempted us to hoist out a boat and go ashore, where we found our supposed coconut trees to be no more than bad cabbage trees. The country about them was very stony and barren, and it was almost dark when we got ashore. We made a shift, however, to gather fourteen or fifteen new plants, after which we repaired to our boats. But scarce were they put off from the shore, when an Indian came very near it, and shouted to us very loud. It was so dark that we could not see him. We, however, turned towards the shore by way of seeing what he wanted with us, but he, I suppose, ran away or hid himself immediately, for we could not get sight of him. 1770, June 8. 
still sailing between the main and islands. The former, rocky and high, looked rather less barren than usual, and by the number of fires seemed to be better peopled. In the morn we passed within one quarter of a mile of a small islet or rock, on which we saw with our glasses about thirty men, women and children, standing all together, and looking attentively at us. The first people we have seen show any signs of curiosity at the sight of the ship. 1770, June 9. Country much the same as it was. Hills, near the sea high. Looked at distance not unlike moors or heaths in England, but when you came nearer them were covered with small trees. Some few flats and valleys looked tolerably fertile. At noon a fire and some people were seen. After dinner came to an anchor and went ashore, but saw no people. The country was hilly and very stony, affording nothing but fresh water, at least that we found, except a few plants that we had not before met with. At night our people caught a few small fish with their hooks and lines. 1770, June 10. Just without us, as we lay at an anchor, was a small sandy island, laying upon a large coral shoal, much resembling the low islands to the eastward of us, but the first of the kind we had met with in this part of the South Sea. Early in the morn we weighed and sailed, as usual, with a fine breeze along shore, the country hilly and stony. At nightfall rocks and shoals were seen ahead, on which the ship was put upon a wind off shore. While we were at supper, she went over a bank of seven or eight fathom water, which she came upon very suddenly. This we concluded to be the tale of the shoals we had seen at sunset, and therefore went to bed in perfect security. But scarce were we warm in our beds, when we were called up with the alarming news of the ship being fast ashore upon a rock, which she in a few moments convinced us of by beating very violently against the rocks. Our situation became now greatly alarming. We had stood off shore three hours and a half with a pleasant breeze, so knew we could not be very near it. We were little less than certain that we were upon sunken coral rocks, the most dreadful of all others, on account of their sharp points and grinding quality, which cut through a ship's bottom almost immediately. The officers, however, behaved with inimitable coolness, void of all hurry and confusion. A boat was got out in which the master went, and after sounding round the ship, found that she had ran over a rock, and consequently had shoal water all around her. All this time she continued to beat very much, so that we could hardly keep our legs upon the quarter-deck. By the light of the moon, we could see her sheathing-boards, etc., floating thick round her. About twelve, her false keel came away. 1770, June 11. In the meantime, all kind of preparations were making for carrying out anchors. But by reason of the time it took to hoist our boats, etc., the tide ebbed so much that we found it impossible to attempt to get her off till next high water, if she would hold together so long. And we now found, to add to our misfortune, that we had got ashore nearly at the top of high water, and as night tides generally rise higher than day ones, we had little hopes of getting off even then. For our comfort, however, the ship, as the tide ebbed, settled to the rocks, and did not beat near so much as she had done. A rock, however, under her starboard bow, kept grating her bottom, making a noise very plainly to be heard in the four storerooms. This we doubted not, would make a hole in her bottom. We only hoped that it might not let in more water than we could clear with our pumps. In this situation day broke upon us, and showed us the land about eight leagues off, as we judged. Nearer to that was no island or place on which we could set foot. It, however, brought with it a decrease of wind, and soon after that a flat calm, the most fortunate circumstance that could possibly attend people in our circumstances. The tide we found had fallen two feet, and still continued to fall. Anchors were, however, got out and laid ready for heaving as soon as the tide should rise, but to our great surprise we could not observe it to rise in the least. Orders were now given for lightening the ship, which was began by starting our water and pumping it up. The ballast was then got up and thrown overboard, as well as six of our guns, all that we had upon deck. All this time the seamen worked with surprising cheerfulness and alacrity. No grumbling or growling was to be heard throughout the ship. No, not even an oath, though the ship, in general, was as well furnished with them as most in His Majesty's service. About one the water was fallen so low, that the pinnace touched ground as he lay under the ship's bows, ready to take in an anchor. After this the tide began to rise, and as it rose the ship worked violently upon the rocks, so that by two she began to make water, and increased very fast. At night the tide almost floated her, but she made water so fast that three pumps hard worked 
could but just keep her clear, and the fourth absolutely refused to deliver a drop of water. Now, in my own opinion, I entirely gave up the ship, and packing up what I thought I might save, prepared myself for the worst. The most critical part of our distress now approached. The ship was almost afloat, and everything ready to get her into deep water, but she leaked so fast that with all our pumps we could just keep her free. If, as was probable, she should make more water when hauled off, she must sink, and we well knew that our boats were not capable of carrying us all ashore, so that some, probably the most of us, must be drowned. A better fate, maybe, than those would have who should get ashore without arms to defend themselves from the Indians, or provide themselves with food, on a country where we had not the least reason to hope for subsistence, had they even every convenience to take with them, as nets, etc., so barren had we always found it. And had they even met with good usage from the natives, and food to support them, debarred from a hope of ever again seeing their native country, or conversing with any but the most uncivilized savages, perhaps in the world. The dreadful time now approached, and the anxiety in everybody's countenance was visible enough. The capstan and windlass were manned, and they began to heave. Fear of death now stared us in the face. Hopes we had none but of being able to keep the ship afloat till we could run her ashore on some part of the main, where out of her materials we might build a vessel large enough to carry us to the East Indies. At ten o'clock she floated, and was in a few minutes hauled into deep water, where to our great satisfaction she made no more water than she had done, which was indeed full as much as we could manage, though no one there was in the ship who willingly exerted his utmost strength. 1770, June 12. The people, who had been twenty-four hours at exceeding hard work, now began to flag. Myself, unused to labor, was much fatigued, and had laid down to take a little rest was awaked about twelve with the alarming news of the ship's having gained so much upon the pumps that she had four feet of water in her hold. Add to this that the wind blew off the land a regular land breeze, so that all hopes of running her ashore were totally cut off. This, however, acted upon every body like a charm. Rest was no more thought of, but the pumps went with unwearied vigor till the water was all out, which was done in a much shorter time than was expected and upon examination it was found that she never had half so much water in her as was thought, the carpenter having made a mistake in sounding the pumps. We now began again to have some hopes, and to talk of getting the ship into some harbor, as we could spare hands from the pumps to get up our anchors. One bower, however, we cut away, but got the other, and three small anchors far more valuable to us than the bowers, as we were obliged immediately to warp her to windward, that we might take advantage of the sea breeze to run in shore. One of our midshipmen now proposed an expedient, which no one else in the ship had seen practiced, though all had heard of it, by the name of fathering a ship, by the means of which he said he had come home from America in a ship which had made more water than we did. Nay, so sure was the master of that ship of his expedient, that he took her out of harbor knowing how much water she made, and trusting entirely to it. He was immediately set to work with four or five assistants to prepare his father, which he did thus. He took a low, scudding sail, and having mixed together a large quantity of oakum, chopped fine, and wool, he sticked it down upon the sail, as loosely as possible, in small bundles, each about as big as his fist. These were ranged in rows three or four inches from each other. This was to be sunk under the ship, and the theory of it was this— wherever the leak was, must be a great suction, which would probably catch hold of one or other of these lumps of oakum and wool, and drawing it in either partly or entirely, stop up the hole. While this work was going on, the water rather gained on those who were pumping, which made all hands impatient for the trial. In the afternoon the ship was got under way with a gentle breeze of wind, and stood in for the land. Soon after the father was finished, and applied, by fastening ropes to each corner, then sinking the sail under the ship, and with these ropes drawing it as far backwards as we could. In about one half an hour, to our great surprise, the ship was pumped dry, and upon letting the pump stand, she was found to make very little water, so much beyond our most sanguine expectations, had this singular expedient succeeded. At night came to an anchor, the father still keeping her almost clear, so that we were in an instant raised from almost despondency to the greatest hopes. We were now almost too sanguine, talking of nothing but getting her into some harbor, where we might lay her ashore and repair her, or if we could not find such a place, we little doubted, to the East Indies. During the whole time of this distress, I must say, for the credit of our people, 
that I believe every man exerted his utmost for the preservation of the ship, contrary to what I have universally heard to be the behaviour of seamen, who have commonly, as soon as a ship is in a desperate situation, begun to plunder and refuse all command. This was no doubt owing entirely to the cool and steady conduct of the officers, who during the whole time never gave an order which did not show them to be perfectly composed and unmoved by the circumstances, howsoever dreadful they might appear. 1770, June 13. One pump, and that not half worked, kept the ship clear all night. In the morn we weighed with a very fine breeze of wind, and steered along shore among innumerable shoals, the boats keeping ahead, and examining every appearance of a harbour which presented itself. Nothing, however, was met with, which would possibly suit our situation, bad as it was. So at night we came to an anchor. The pinnace, however, which had gone far ahead, was not returned, nor did she, till nine o'clock, when she reported that she had found just the place we wanted, in which the tide rose sufficiently, and there was every natural convenience that could be wished for, either laying the ship ashore, or heaving her down. This was too much to be believed by our most sanguine wishes. We, however, hoped that the place might do for us, if not so much as we had been told, yet something to better our situation, as yet but precarious, having nothing but a lock of wool between us and destruction. 1770, June 14. Very fresh sea breeze. A boat was sent ahead to show us the way into the harbour, but by some mistake of signals, we were obliged to come to an anchor again of the mouth of it, without going in, where it soon blew too fresh for us to weigh. We now began to consider our good fortune. Had it blown as fresh the day before yesterday, or before that, we could never have got off, but must inevitably have been dashed to pieces on the rocks. The captain and myself went ashore to view the harbour, and found it indeed beyond our most sanguine wishes. It was the mouth of a river, the entrance of which was to be sure narrow enough and shallow, but when once in, the ship might be moored afloat so near the shore that by a stage from her to it all her cargo might be got out and in again in a very short time in this same place she might be hove down with all ease but the beach gave signs of the tides rising in the springs six or seven feet which was more than enough to do our business without that trouble the meeting with so many natural advantages in a harbour so near us at the very time of our misfortune appeared almost providential we had not in the voyage before seen a place so well suited for our purpose as this was, and certainly had no right to expect the tides to rise so high here that it did not rise half so much at the place where we struck, only eight leagues from this place. We therefore returned on board in high spirits, and raised the spirits of our friends on board as much as our own by bringing them the welcome news of approaching security. It blew, however, too fresh to-night for us to attempt to weigh the anchor, I even think as fresh as it has ever done since we have been put upon the coast. 1770, June 15. Blew all day as fresh as it did yesterday. We thought much of our good fortune in having fair weather upon the rocks when upon the brink of such a gale. Our people were now, however, pretty well recovered from their fatigues, having had plenty of rest, as the ship, since she was fathered, had not made more water than one pump half worked will keep clear. At night we observed a fire ashore near where we were to lay, which made us hope that the necessary length of our stay would give us an opportunity of being acquainted with the Indians who made it. 1770, June 16. In the morn it was a little more moderate, and we attempted to weigh, but were soon obliged to veer away all that we had got, the wind freshening upon us so much. Fires were made upon the hills, and we saw four Indians through our glasses, who went away along shore, and going along, which they made two more fires for what purpose we could not guess. Tupaya, whose bad gums were very soon followed by livid spots on his legs, and every symptom of inveterate scurvy, notwithstanding acid bark, and every medicine our surgeon could give him, now became extremely ill. Mr. Green, the astronomer, was also in a very poor way, which made everybody in the cabin very desirous of getting ashore, and impatient at our tedious delays. 1770, June 17 weather a little less rough than it was. Weighed and brought the ship in, but in doing it ran her twice ashore by the narrowness of the channel. The second time she remained, till the tide lifted her off. In the meantime, Dr. Salander and myself began our plant gathering. In the evening the ship was moored within twenty feet of the shore, afloat, and before night much lumber was got out of her. 1770, June 18. 
A stage was built from the ship, which much facilitated our undertakings. Myself, walking in the country, saw old frames of Indian houses, and places where they had dressed shellfish, in the same manner as the islanders, but no signs that they had been at the place, for six months at least. The country in general was sandy between the hills, and barren, made walking very easy. Mosquitoes there were some, and but few, a good piece of fortune in a place where we were likely to remain some time. Tupaya, who had employed himself since we were here in angling, and had lived entirely on what he caught, was surprisingly recovered. Poor Mr. Green still very ill. Weather blowing hard with showers. Had we not got in yesterday, we certainly could not today. 1770, June 19. Went over the water today to spy the land, which there was sand hills. On them I saw some Indian houses, which seemed to have been inhabited since those on this side, though not very lately. There were vast flocks of pigeons and crows. Of the former, which were very beautiful, we shot several. The latter, exactly like those in England, were so shy that we could not come near them by any means. The inlet or river in which we lay ran very far into the country, keeping its course over flat land, overgrown with mangroves. The country inland was, however, sufficiently hilly. Evening, hard rain. 1770, June 20. Weather cleared up, so we began to gather and dry plants, of which we had hopes of as many as we could muster during our stay. Observed that in many parts of the inlet were large quantities of pumice stones, which lay a good way above the high water mark, probably carried there by freshes or extraordinary tides, as they certainly came from the sea. Before night the ship was lightened, and we observed with great pleasure that the springs which were now beginning to lift rose as high as we could wish. 1770, June 21 fine clear weather. Began today to lay plants in sand. By night the ship was quite clear, and in the night's tide, which we had constantly observed to be much higher than the days, we hauled her ashore. 1770, June 22. In the morn I saw her leak, which was very large. In the middle was a hole, large enough to have sunk a ship with twice our pumps. But here Providence had most visibly worked in our favor, for it was in great measure plugged up by a stone, which was as big as a man's fist. Round the edges of this stone had all the water come in, which had so near overcome us, and here we found the wool and oakum or fathering, which had relieved us in so unexpected a manner. The effects of the coral rock upon her bottom is difficult to describe, but more to believe. It had cut through her plank and deep into one of her timbers, smoothing the gashes still before it, so that the hole might easily be imagined to be cut with an axe. Myself employed all day in laying in plants. The people who were sent to the other side of the water in order to shoot pigeons saw an animal as large as a greyhound, of a mouse color, and very swift. They also saw many Indian houses and a brook of fresh water. 1770, June 23. The people who went over the river saw the animal again, and described him in much the same manner as yesterday. 1770, June 24. Gathering plants and hearing descriptions of the animal which is now seen by everybody. A seaman, who had been out in the woods brought home the description of an animal he had seen composed in so seamanlike a style that I cannot help mentioning it. It was, says he, about as large and much like a one-gallon keg, as black as the devil, and had two horns on its head. It went but slowly, but I dared not touch it. 1770, June 25. In gathering plants today, I myself had the good fortune to see the beast so much talked of, though but imperfectly. He was not only like a greyhound in size, and running, but had a long tail, as long as any greyhounds. What to liken him to I could not tell. Nothing certainly that I have seen at all resembles him. 1770, June 26. Since the ship has been hauled ashore, the water that has come into her has, of course, all gone backwards, and my plants, which were for safety, stowed in the bread-room, were this day found under water. Nobody had warned me of this danger, which had never once entered into my head. The mischief was, however, now done, so I set to work to remedy it to the best of my power. The day was scarce long enough to get them all shifted, etc. Many were saved, but some entirely lost and spoiled. 1770, June 27. Some of the gentlemen who had been out in the woods yesterday brought home the leaves of a plant, which I took to be Arum esculentum, the same, I believe, as is called Cocos in the West Indies. In consequence of this, I went to the place and found plenty. On trial, however, the roots were found to be too acrid to be eat. The leaves, however, when boiled, 
were little inferior to spinach. In the same place grew plenty of cabbage trees, a kind of wild plantain whose fruit was so full of stones that it was scarce eatable. Another fruit, about as large as a small golden pippin, but flatter, and of a deep purple color. These were gathered off from the tree, were very hard and disagreeable, but after being kept a few days became soft, and tasted much like indifferent damsons. 1770, June 28. Tupaya, by roasting his cocos very much in his oven, made them lose entirely their acridity. The roots were so small that we did not think them at all an object for the ship, so resolved to content ourselves with the greens, which are called in the West Indies Indian kale. I went with seamen to show them the place, and they gathered a large quantity. Saw one tree, and only one, notched in the same manner as those at Botany Bay. We have, ever since we have been here, observed the nests of a kind of ants, much like the white ants in the East Indies, but to us perfectly harmless. They were always pyramidical, from a few inches to six feet in height, and very much resembling stones, which I have seen in English druidical monuments. Today we met with a large number of them of all sizes, ranged in a small open place, which had a very pretty effect. Dr. Solander compared them to the rune stones on the plains of Uppsal in Sweden, myself to all the smaller druidical monuments I had seen. 1770, June 29. One of our midshipmen, an American, who was out a shooting today, saw a wolf, perfectly, he said, like those he had seen in America. He shot at it, but did not kill it. The seine was hauled today for the first time, and one hundred and fifty pound of fish caught in it. 1770, June 30. The second lieutenant saw two animals like dogs, but smaller. They ran like hares, and were of a straw color. Seine caught two hundred and thirteen pound of fish. End of section 39. June 1770. Section 40 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 40. July, 1770, Part 1. 1770, July 1. Being Sunday, all hands were ashore on liberty. Many animals were seen by them. The Indians had a fire about a league off up the river. Our second lieutenant found the husk of a coconut full of barnacles cast up on the beach. Probably it had come from some island to windward, from Terra del Espirito Santo possibly, as we are now in its latitude. The ship is now finished, and tomorrow being the highest spring tide, it was intended to haul her off. So we began to think how we should get out of this place, where so lately to get only in was our utmost ambition. We had observed in coming in innumerable shoals and sands all around us, so we went upon a high hill to see what passage to the sea might be open. When we came there the prospect was indeed melancholy, the sea everywhere full of innumerable shoals, some above and some under water, and no prospect of any straight passage out. To return as we came was impossible. The trade wind blew directly in our teeth. Most dangerous, then, our navigation must be amongst unknown dangers. How soon might we again be reduced to the misfortune we had so lately escaped? Escaped, indeed, we had not, till we were again in an open sea. 1770, July 2. A great dew, which is the first we have had, and a land breeze in the morning, the first likewise. The wild plant and trees, though their fruit does not serve for food, are to us a most material benefit. We made baskets of their stalks, a thing we learned of the islanders in which our plants, which would not otherwise keep home, remained fresh for two or three days. Indeed, in a hot climate it is hardly practicable to go on without such baskets, which we call by the island name of Papa Mia. Our plants dry better in paper books than in sand, with this precaution, that one person is entirely employed in attending them, who shifts them all once a day, exposes the choirs in which they are to the greatest heat of the sun, and at night covers them most carefully up, from any damps, always careful not to bring them out too soon in the morning, or leave them out too late in the evening. Tide rose not so high as was expected, so the ship would not come off. 1770 July 3. The pinnace, which had been sent out yesterday in search of a passage, returned today, having found a way by which she passed most of the shoals, that we could see, but not all. 
This passage was also to windward of us, so that we could only hope to get there by the assistance of a land breeze, of which we have had but one since we lay in the place, so this discovery added little comfort to our situation. He had in his return landed on a dry reef, where he found vast plenty of shellfish, so that the boat was completely loaded, chiefly with a large kind of cockles, shamagigas, one of which was more than two men could eat. Many indeed were larger. The coxswain of the boat, a little man, declared that he saw on the reef a dead shell of one so large that he got into it, and it fairly held him. At night the ship floated and was hauled off. An alligator was seen swimming alongside of her for some time. As I was crossing the harbour in my small boat, we saw many shoals of garfish leaping high out of the water, some of which leapt into the boat and were taken. 1770, July 4. The ship has been a good deal strained by laying so long, as she has done with her head aground and her stern afloat, so much so that she has sprung a plank between decks abreast of the main chains. At night, however, she was laid ashore again, in order, if possible, to examine if she had got any damage near that place. 1770, July 5. Went to the other side of the harbour and walked along a sandy beach, open to the trade wind. Here I found innumerable fruits, many of plants I had not seen in this country. Among them were some coconuts that had been opened, as Tupaya told us, by a kind of crab, called by the Dutch Burskrab, cancer latro, that feeds upon them. All these fruits were encrusted with sea productions, and many of them covered with barnacles, a sure sign they have come far by sea. And as the trade wind blows almost right on shore, they must have come from some other country, probably that discovered by Chiros, and called Terra del Espirito Santo, as the latitudes, according to his own account, agree pretty well. Tupaya, who parted from us, and walked away a-shooting, on his return told us that he had seen two people who were digging in the ground for some kind of roots. On seeing him they ran away with great precipitation. 1770, July 6. Set out today with the second lieutenant, resolved to go a good way upon the river, and see if the country inland differed from that near the shore. We went for about three leagues among mangroves, then we got into the country which differed very little from what we had seen. From hence we proceeded up the river, which contracted itself much, and lost most of its mangroves. The banks were steep and covered with trees of a beautiful verdure, particularly what is called in the West Indies mohoi, or bark tree, hibiscus tiliaceus. The land within was generally low, covered thick with long grass, and seemed to promise great fertility were these people to plant and improve it. In the course of the day, Tupaya saw a wolf, so at least I guess by his description, and we saw three of the animals of the country, but could not get one. Also a kind of bats, as large as a partridge, but these also we were not lucky enough to get. At night we took up our lodgings close to the banks of the river and made a fire, but the mosquitoes, whose peaceful dominions it seems we had invaded, spared no pains to molest us, as much as was in their power. They followed us into the very smoke, nay almost into the fire, which, hot as the climate was, we could better bear the heat of than their intolerable stings. Between the hardness of our beds, the heat of the fire, and the stings of these indefatigable insects, the night was not spent so agreeably, but that day was earnestly wished for by all of us. 1770, July 7. At last it came, and with its first dawn we set out in search of game. We walked many miles over the flats and saw four of the animals, two of which my greyhound fairly chased, but they beat him, owing to the length and thickness of the grass, which prevented him from running, while they at every bound leapt over the tops of it. We observed much to our surprise that instead of going upon all fours, this animal went only upon two legs, making vast bounds, just as the gerboa, mus jaculus, does. We returned about noon and pursued our course up the river, which soon contracted itself into a fresh-water brook, where, however, the tide rose pretty considerably. Towards evening it was so shallow, being almost low water, that we were obliged to get out of the boat and drag her. So finding a convenient place for sleeping in, we resolved to go no farther. Before our things were got up out of the boat, we observed a smoke about a furlong from us. We did not doubt at all that the natives, who we had so long had a curiosity to see well, were there, so three of us went immediately toward it, hoping that the smallness of our numbers would induce them not to be afraid of us. However, they were gone, probably upon having discovered us, before we saw them. The fire was an old tree of touchwood. Their houses were there, and branches of trees broken down, with which the children had been playing, not yet withered. Their footsteps also upon the sand, below the high tide mark, 
prove that they had very lately been there. Near their oven, in which victuals had been dressed since morn, were shells of a kind of clam and roots of a wild yam which had been cooked in it. Thus we were disappointed of the only good chance we had of seeing the people since we came here by their unaccountable timidity. A night soon coming on we repaired to our quarters, which was upon a broad sandbank under the shade of a bush, where we hoped the mosquitoes would not trouble us. Our beds of plantain leaves spread on the sand, as soft as a mattress, our cloaks for bedclothes and grass pillows, but above all the entire absence of mosquitoes made me, and I believe all of us, sleep almost without intermission. Had the Indians came, they would certainly have caught us all napping, but that was the least in our thoughts. The land about this place was not so fertile as lower down. The hills rose almost immediately from the river and were barren, stony, and sandy, much like those near the ship. The river near us abounded much in fish, who at sunset leapt about in the water, much as trouts do in Europe, but we had no kind of tackle to take them with. 1770 July 8. At daylight in the morn, the tide serving, we set out for the ship. In our passage down, met several flocks of whistling ducks, of which we shot some. We saw also an alligator about seven feet long come out of the mangroves and crawl into the water. By four o'clock we arrived at the ship, where we heard that the Indians had been near them, but not come to them. Yesterday they had made a fire about a mile and a half off, and this morning two had appeared on the beach, opposite to the ship. At night the pinnace, which had been sent in search of a passage to leeward, returned. She had been unsuccessful in her main errand. Shoals innumerable she had met with. Upon one of them was lucky enough to see a turtle, which was pursued and many more were seen, so many that three were taken, with only the boat hook. The promise of such plenty of good provisions made our situation appear much less dreadful. Were we obliged to wait here for another season of the year, when the winds might alter, we could do it without fear of wanting provisions. This thought alone put everybody in vast spirits. 1770 July 9 Myself went turtling, in hopes to half loaded our long boat, but by a most unaccountable conduct of the officer, not one turtle was taken. I, however, went ashore upon the reef, saw the large cockles, and gathered many shells and sea productions. At night returned with my small boat, leaving the large one upon the reef, who I was sure would catch no turtle. 1770 July 10 Four Indians appeared on the opposite shore. They had with them a canoe made of wood with an outrigger, in which two of them embarked and came toward the ship, but stopped at a distance of the long musket shot, talking much and very loud to us. We hallowed to them, and waving, made them all the signs we could to come nearer. By degrees they ventured almost insensibly nearer and nearer, till they were quite alongside, often holding up their lances as if to show us that if we used them ill they had weapons and would return our attack. Cloth, nails, paper, etc., etc., was given to them, all which they took and put into the canoe, without showing any least signs of satisfaction. At last a small fish was by accident thrown to them, on which they expressed the greatest joy imaginable, and instantly putting off from the ship made signs that they would bring over their comrades, which they very soon did, and all four landed near us, each carrying in his hand two lances, and his stick to throw them with. Tupaya went towards them. They stood all in a row in the attitude of throwing their lances. He made signs that they should lay them down and come forward without them. This they immediately did, and sat down with him upon the ground. We then came up to them and made them presents of beads, cloth, etc., which they took, and soon became very easy, only jealous if any one attempted to go between them and their arms. At dinner time we made signs to them to come with us and eat, but they refused. We left them, and they going into their canoe paddled back. 1770, July 11. Indians came over again today, two that were with us yesterday, and two new ones, who our old acquaintance introduced to us by their names, one of which was Yaparico. Though we did not yesterday observe it, they all had the septum or inner part of the nose bored through with a very large hole, in which one of them had stuck the bone of a bird, as thick as a man's finger, and four or five inches long an ornament no doubt, though to us it appeared rather an uncouth one. They brought with them a fish, which they gave us in return, I suppose, for the fish we had given them yesterday. Their stay was but short, for some of our gentlemen, being rather too curious in examining their canoe, they went directly to it, and pushing it off went away without saying a word. At night the boat which had been sent to the reef for turtle came home, 
and brought three. 1770, July 12. Indians came again today and ventured down to Tupaya's tent, where they were so well pleased with their reception that three stayed, while the fourth went with the canoe to fetch two new ones. They introduced their strangers, which they always made a point of doing, by name and had some fish given them. They received it with indifference, signed to our people to cook it for them, which was done, and they eat part and gave the rest to my bitch. They stayed the most part of the morning, but never ventured to go above twenty yards from their canoe. The ribbons, by which we had tied medals round their necks the first day we saw them, were covered with smoke. I suppose they lay much in the smoke to keep off the mosquitoes. They are very small people, or at least this tribe consisted of very small people. In general, about five feet six in height and very slender. One we measured five feet two, and another five feet nine. But he was far taller than any of his fellows. I do not know by what deception we were to a man of opinion when we saw them run on the sand, about one quarter of a mile from us, that they were taller and larger than we were. Their color was nearest to that of chocolate. Not that their skins were so dark, but the smoke and dirt with which they were all cased over, which I suppose served them instead of clothes, made them of that color. Their hair was straightened some and curled in others. They always wore it cropped close round their heads. It was of the same consistency with our hair, by no means woolly or curled, like that of Negroes. Their eyes were in many lively, and their teeth even and good. Of them they had complete sets, by no means wanting two of their foreteeth, as Dampier's New Hollanders did. They were all of them clean-limbed, active, and nimble. Clothes they had none, not the least rag. Those parts which nature willingly conceals, being exposed to view, completely uncovered. Yet when they stood still, they would often or almost always with their hand, or something they held in it, hide them in some measure at least, seemingly doing that as if by instinct. They painted themselves with white and red, the first in lines and bars on different parts of their bodies, the other in large patches. Their ornaments were few, necklaces prettily enough made of shells, bracelets, or round the upper parts of their arms, consisting of strings lapped round with other strings, as what we call gimp in England, a string no thicker than a peck thread tied round their bodies, which was sometimes made of human hair a piece of bark tied over their forehead, and the preposterous bone in their noses, which I have before mentioned, were all that we observed. One had indeed one of his ears bored, the hole being big enough to put a thumb through, but this was peculiar to that one man, and him I never saw wear in it any ornament. Their language was totally different from that of the islanders. It sounded more like English in its degree of harshness, though it could not be called harsh neither. They almost continually made use of the shirko, which we conceived to be a term of admiration, as they still used it whenever they saw anything new, also chur, tut, 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 which probably have the same signification. Their canoe was not above ten feet long and very narrow built, with an outrigger fitted much like those of the islands, only far inferior. They, in shallow waters, set her on with poles. In deep, paddled her with paddles about four feet long. She just carried four people, so that the six who visit us today were obliged to make two embarkations. Their lances were much like those we had seen in Botany Bay, only they were all of them single-pointed, and some pointed with the stings of stingrays, and bearded with two or three beards of the same, which made them indeed a terrible weapon. The board or stick with which they flung them was also made in a neater manner. After having stayed with us the greatest part of the morning, they went away as they came. While they stayed, two or more and a young woman made their appearance upon the beach. She was to the utmost that we could see with our glasses, as naked as the men. End of section 40, part 1 of July, 1770. Section 41 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 41. July, 1770, Part 2. 1770, July 13. Two Indians came in their canoe to the ship, stayed by her a very short time, and then went along shore striking fish. Our boat returned from the reef with one turtle and one large stingray. 1770, July 14. Our second lieutenant, who was a shooting today, had the good fortune to kill the animal that had so long been the subject of our speculations. To compare it to any European animal, would be impossible, as it has not the least resemblance of any one I have seen. Its forelegs are extremely short, 
and am no use to it in walking, its hind again as disproportionately long. With these it hops seven or eight feet at each hop, in the same manner as the jerboa, to which animal indeed it bears much resemblance except in size, this being in weight thirty-eight pounds, and the jerboa no larger than a common rat. 1770, July 15. The beast, which was killed yesterday, was today dressed for our dinners, and proved excellent meat. In the evening the boat returned from the reef, bringing four turtles, so we may now be able to swim in plenty. Our turtles are certainly far preferable to any I have eat in England, which must proceed from their being eat fresh from the sea, before they have either wasted away their fat, or by a natural food which is given them in the tubs, where they are kept, given themselves a fat of not so delicious a flavour, as it is in their wild state. Most of those we have caught have been green turtle, from two to three hundred pound weight. These, when killed, were always found to be full of turtle grass, a kind of conferva, I believe. Two only were loggerheads, which were but indifferent meat, in their stomachs were nothing but shells. 1770, July 16. As the ship was now nearly ready for her departure, Dr. Salander and myself employed ourselves in winding up our botanical bottoms, examining what we wanted, and making up our complement of specimens of as many species as possible. The boat brought three turtle again to-day, one of which was a male, which was easily to be distinguished from the female by the vast size of his tail, which was four times longer and thicker than hers. In every other respect, they were exactly alike. One of our people on board the ship, who has been a turtler in the West Indies, told me that they never sent male turtle home to England from thence, because they wasted in keeping much more than the females, which we found to be true. 1770, July 17. Tupaya, who was over the water by himself, saw three Indians, who gave him a kind of longish roots, about as thick as a man's fingers, and of a very good taste. On his return the captain, Dr. Solander and myself, went over in hopes to see them, and renew our connections. We met with four in a canoe, who soon after came ashore, and came to us without any signs of fear. After receiving the beads, etc., that we had given them, they went away. We attempted to follow them, hoping that they would lead us to their fellows, where we might have an opportunity of seeing their women. They, however, by signs, made us understand that they did not desire our company. 1770, July 18. Indians were over with us today, and seemed to have lost all fear of us, and became quite familiar. One of them, at our desire, threw his lance, which was about eight feet in length. It flew with a degree of swiftness and steadiness that really surprised me, never being above four feet from the ground and stuck deep in at the distance of fifty paces. After this they ventured on board the ship, and soon became our very good friends. So the captain and me left them to the care of those who stayed on board, and went to a high hill about six miles from the ship. Here we overlooked a great deal of sea to leeward, which afforded a melancholy prospect of the difficulties we were to encounter when we came out of our present harbour. In whichever direction we turned our eyes, shoals innumerable were to be seen, and no such thing as any passage to sea, but through the winding channels between them, dangerous to the last degree. 1770, July 19. Ten Indians visited us today, and brought with them a larger quantity of lances than they had ever done before. These they laid up in a tree, leaving a man and a boy to take care of them, and came on board the ship. They soon let us know their errand, which was by some means or other to get one of our turtle, of which we had eight or nine laying upon the decks. They first, by signs, asked for one, and on being refused, showed great marks of resentment. One who had asked me, on my refusal, stamping his foot, pushed me from him, with a countenance full of disdain, and applied to someone else. As, however, they met with no encouragement in this, they laid hold of a turtle, and hauled him forwards toward the side of the ship, where their canoe lay. It, however, was soon taken from them and replaced. They nevertheless repeated the experiment two or three times, and after meeting with so many repulses, all in an instant leapt into their canoe and went ashore, where I had got before them, just ready to set out plant gathering. They seized their arms in an instant, and taking fire from under a pitch kettle, which was boiling, they began to set fire to the grass, to windward of the few things we had left ashore, with surprising dexterity and quickness. The grass, which was four or five feet high, and as dry as stubble, burnt with vast fury. A tent of mine, which had been put up for Tupaya when he was sick, was the only thing of any consequence in the way of it, so I leapt into a boat to fetch some people from the ship, in order to save it, and quickly returning hauled it down to the beach, just time enough. The captain in the meantime followed the Indians to prevent their burning our linen, and the seine, 
which lay on the grass just where they were gone. He had no musket with him, so soon returned to fetch one, for no threats or signs would make them desist. Mine was ashore and another loaded with shot, so we ran as fast as possible towards them, and came just time enough to save the seine, by firing at an Indian who had already fired the grass in two places, just to windward of it. On the shot striking him, though he was full forty yards from the captain who fired, he dropped his fire, and ran nimbly to his comrades, who all ran off pretty fast. The captain then loaded his musket with a ball, and fired it into the mangroves abreast of where they ran, to show them that they were not yet out of our reach. They ran on, quickening their pace on hearing the ball, and we soon lost sight of them. We then returned to the Seine, where the people who were ashore had got the fire under. We now thought we were freed from these troublesome people, but we soon heard their voices returning, on which, anxious for some people who were washing that way, we ran towards them. On seeing us come up with our muskets, they again retired leisurely, after an old man had ventured quite to us, and said something which we could not understand. We followed for near a mile, then meeting with some rocks from whence we might observe their motions, we sat down, and they did so too about one hundred yards from us. The little old man now came forward to us, carrying in his hands a lance without a point. He halted several times, and as he stood, employed himself in collecting the moisture from under his armpit with his finger, which he every time drew through his mouth. We beckoned to him to come. He then spoke to the others, who all laid their lances against a tree, and leaving them came forwards, likewise, and soon came quite to us. They had with them, it seems, three strangers, who wanted to see the ship, but the man who was shot at and the boy were gone. So our troop now consisted of eleven. The strangers were presented to us by name, and we gave them such trinkets as we had about us. Then we all proceeded toward the ship, they making signs as they came along, that they would not set fire to the grass again, and we distributing musket balls among them, and by our signs explaining their effect. When they came abreast of the ship, they sat down, but could not be prevailed upon to come on board. So after a little time we left them to their contemplations. They stayed about two hours, and then departed. We had great reason to thank our good fortune that this accident happened so late in our stay. Not a week before this, our powder, which was put ashore when first we came in, had been taken on board, and that very morning only the store tent and that in which the sick had lived were got on board. I had little idea of the fury with which the grass burnt in this hot climate, nor of the difficulty of extinguishing it when once lighted. This accident will, however, be a sufficient warning for us if ever we should again pitch tents in such a climate, to burn everything round us before we begin. 1770, July 20. Yesterday evening the ship was hauled off from the shore ready for her departure. In the night, by some unlucky accident, she tailed ashore during the ebb, and as the tide settled brought such a strain upon her rudder as alarmed us all greatly. The tiller, which was in the most danger, beat hard under some strong sheep pens, which had been built in a platform over it. As the tide settled still more, it came to the point where either the tiller or the platform would break, for one must, which the platform fortunately did, and made us at once easy. No Indians came near us, but all the hills about us for many miles were on fire, and at night made the most beautiful appearance imaginable. The pinnace returned, which had been sent to leeward, in search of a passage. The officer in her had met with nothing but shoals, and not the least likelihood of a passage that way. No very comfortable situation. Our ship, it was true, was now repaired. Leaky she was from the strains she had got, but the water she made was trifling. We were ready to sail with a first fair wind, but where to go? To windward was impossible, to leeward was a labyrinth of shoals, so that how soon we might have the ship to repair again, or lose her quite, no one could tell. Encounter the difficulty, however we must, and since our bargain was a bad one, make the best of it. At night the yawl returned with one turtle in her. It had blown so much since she had been out, that she with difficulty took even that, for as all our turtle had been taken by chasing, moderate weather was absolutely necessary. 1770, July 21. No signs of the Indians today, nor indeed anything else worthy of note. 1770, July 22. The turtle which was killed this morn had an Indian turtle peg in it, which seemed to have laid there a long time. It was in the breast across the four fins, having entered at the soft part near the fins, but the wound it made in going in was entirely grown up. The peg itself was about eight inches in length, and as thick as a man's little finger. 
one of our people, who had been sent out to gather Indian kale, straying from his party, met with three Indians, two men and a boy. He came upon them as they sat down amongst some long grass, on a sudden, and before he was aware of it. At first he was much afraid, and offered them his knife, the only thing he had which he thought might be acceptable to them. They took it, and after handing it from one to another, returned it to him. They kept him about half an hour behaving most civilly to him, only satisfying their curiosity in examining his body, which done they made him signs that he might go away, which he did, very well pleased. They had hanging on a tree by them, he said, a quarter of the wild animal and a cockatoo, but how they had been clever enough to take these animals is almost beyond my conception, as they most of them are most shy, especially the cockatoos. 1770, July 23. In botanizing today on the other side of the river, we accidentally found the greatest part of the clothes which had been given to the Indians, left all in a heap together, doubtless as lumber not worth carriage. Maybe, had we looked farther, we should have found our other trinkets, for they seemed to set no value upon anything we had, except our turtle, which of all things we were the least able to spare them. 1770, July 24. The blowing weather which had hindered us from getting out several days, still lasted, not at all to our satisfaction, who had no one wish to remain longer in this place, which we had pretty well exhausted, even of its natural history. The doctor and me were obliged to go very far for anything new. Today we went several miles to a high hill, where, after sweating and broiling among the woods till night, we were obliged to return almost empty, but the most vexatious accident imaginable befell us likewise. Travelling in a deep valley, the sides of which were steep, almost as a wall, but covered with trees and plenty of brushwood, we found marking nuts, anacardium oriental, laying on the ground, and desirous as we were to find the tree on which they had grown, a thing that I believe no European botanist has seen, we were not with all our pains able to find it. So after cutting down four or five trees and spending much time, we were obliged to give over our hopes. 1770 July 25. The captain, who was up the river today found the canoe belonging to our friends the Indians, which it seems they had left tied to some mangroves within a mile of the ship. Themselves, we could see by their fires, were five or six miles off from us, directly inland. 1770, July 26. In botanizing today, I had the good fortune to take an animal of the opossum, Didelphus tribe. It was a female, and with it I took two young ones. It was not unlike that remarkable one which de Buffon had described by the name of Fallinger as an American animal. It was, however, not the same, for de Buffon is certainly wrong in asserting that this tribe is peculiar to America, and in all probability, as Pallas has said in his Zoologica, the Fallinger itself is a native of the East Indies, as my animal and that agree in the extraordinary conformation of their feet, in which particular they differ from all the others. 1770, July 27. This day was dedicated to hunting the wild animal. We saw several, and had the good fortune to kill a very large one, which weighed eighty-four pound. 1770, July 28. Botanizing with no kind of success. The plants were now entirely completed, and nothing new to be found, so that sailing is all we wish for, if the wind would but allow us. Dined today upon the animal, who eat but ill. He was, I suppose, too old. His fault, however, was an uncommon one, the total want of flavor, for he was certainly the most insipid meat I eat. 1770, July 29. Went out again in search of the animals. Our success today was not, however, quite so good as the last time. We saw a few and killed one, very small one, which weighed no more than eight and a half pound. My greyhound took him with ease, though the old ones were much too nimble for him. 1770, July 30. Ever since the ship was hauled off for sailing, we have had blowing weather till today, when it changed to little wind and rain, which gave us some hopes. In the evening, however, the wind returned to its old bias. 1770, July 31. Morning cloudy and boisterous enough, even clear, with less wind which supplied hopes, at least for tomorrow. End of section 41. Part 2. July 1770. Section 42 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks, Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. 
Section 42. August 1770. 1770, August 1. New Guinea Coast. During the night it blew as hard as ever. The day was rainy with less wind, but still not moderate enough for our undertakings. 1770, August 2. Moderate and very rainy. Great hopes that the rain is a presage of approaching moderate weather. 1770, August 3. In the morn our people were dubious about trying to get out, and I believe delayed it rather too long. At last, however, they began, and warped ahead, but desisted from their attempts after having ran the ship twice ashore. 1770, August 4. Fine calm morn. Began early and warped the ship out, after which we sailed right out, till we came to the turtle reef, where our turtlers took one turtle. Myself got some few shells, but saw many beautiful sea insects, etc. At night, our people who fished caught an abundance of sharks. 1770, August 5. The turtlers were again out upon the shoal and took one turtle. At two, we weighed, resolved to stand out as well as we could among the shoals, but before night were stopped by another shoal, which lay directly across our way. 1770, August 6. Blew so fresh that we could not move, but lay still all day, not without anxiety, lest the anchor should not hold. 1770, August 7. During last night the gale had freshened much, and in the morn we found that we had drove above a league. Fortunately no shoal had in that distance taken us up, but one was in sight astern, and the ship drove fast towards it. On this another anchor was let go and much cable varied out, but even this would not stop her. Our prospect was now more melancholy than ever. The shoal was plainly to be seen and the ship still driving gently down toward it, a sea running at the same time, which would make it impossible ever to get off, if we should be unfortunate enough to get on. Yards and topmasts were therefore got down, and everything done which could be thought of to make the ship snug, without any effect. She still drove, and the shoal we dreaded came nearer and nearer to us. The sheet anchor, our last resource, was now thought of and prepared. But fortunately for us, before we were drove to the making use of that expedient, the ship stopped and held fast, to our great joy. During the time of its blowing yesterday and today, we became certain that between us and the open sea was a ledge of rocks or reef, just the same as we had seen at the islands. No very agreeable discovery, for should that at any time join in with the mainland, we must wait for another season, when different winds from the present ones prevailed, in which case we must infallibly be short of provisions, or, if the turtle should fail us, salt provisions without bread was all we had to trust to. 1770, August 8. The night, dark as pitch, passed over not without much anxiety. Whether our anchors held or not we could not tell, and maybe might, when we least thought of it, be upon the very brink of destruction. Daylight, however, relieved us, showed us that the anchors had held, and also brought us rather more moderate weather, so that towards evening we ventured to get up yards and topmasts. 1770, August 9. Night and morning still more moderate, so that one anchor was got up, and we had great hopes of sailing on the next morn. 1770, August 10. Fine weather, so the anchor was got up and we sailed down to Leward, convinced that we could not get out the way we had tried before, and hoping there might be a passage that way. In these hopes, we were much encouraged by the sight of some high islands, where we hoped the shoals would end. By twelve we were among these, and fancied that the Grand or Outer Reef ended on one of them, so were all in high spirits. But about dinner-time the people at the masthead saw, as they thought, land all around us, on which we immediately came to an anchor, resolved to go ashore, and from the hills examine whether it was so or not. The point we were upon was sandy and very barren, so it afforded very few plants, or anything else worth our observation. The sand itself, indeed, with which the whole country in a manner was covered, was infinitely fine and white, but till a glass house was built here, that would turn to no account. We had the satisfaction, however, to see that what was taken for land round us proved only a number of islands. To one very high one, about five leagues from the land, the captain resolved to go in the boat to-morrow, in order to see whether the Grand Reef had really left us or not. 1770, August 11. As proposed yesterday, the captain went to-day to the island, which proved five leagues off from the ship. I went with him. In going out we passed over two very large shoals, on which we saw plenty of turtle, but we had too much wind to strike any. 
the island itself was high. We ascended the hill, and when we were at the top saw plainly the Grand Reef, still extending itself parallel with the shore, at about the distance of three leagues from us, and eight from the main. Through it were several channels, exactly similar to those we had seen in the islands. Through one of these we determined to go, which seemed most easy. To ascertain the practicability of it, we resolved to stay upon the island all night, and at daybreak in the morn send the boat out to sound one of them, which was accordingly done. We slept under the shade of a bush that grew on the beach, very comfortably. 1770, August 12. Great part of yesterday and all this morn, till the boat returned, I employed in searching the island. On it I found some few plants which I had not seen before. The island itself was small and barren. On it was, however, one small tract of woodland, which abounded very much with large lizards, some of which I took distant as this isle was from the main the indians had been here in their poor embarkations sure sign that some part of the year must have very settled fine weather we saw seven or eight frames of their huts and vast piles of shells the fish of which had i suppose been their food all the houses were built upon the tops of eminences exposed entirely to the southeast contrary to those of the main which are commonly placed under the shelter of some bushes or hillside to break off the wind the officer who went in the boat returned with an account that the sea broke vastly high upon the reef, and the swell was so great in the opening that he could not go into it to sound. This was sufficient to assure us of a safe passage out. So we got into the boat to return to the ship in high spirits, thinking our danger now at an end, as we had a passage open for us to the main sea. In our return we went ashore upon a low island, where we shot many birds. On it was an eagle's nest, the young ones of which we killed, and another built on the ground by i know not what bird of a most enormous magnitude it was in circumference twenty-six feet and in height two feet eight built of sticks the only bird i have seen in this country capable of building such a nest seems to be the pelican the indians have been here likewise and lived upon turtle as we could plainly see by the heaps of calipashes which were piled up in several parts of the island our master who had been sent to leeward to examine that passage went ashore upon a low island where he slept. Here he saw vast plenty of turtle shells, and so great plenty had the Indians had, when there, that they had hung up the fins with the meat left on them in the trees, where the sun had dried them so well that our seamen eat them heartily. He saw also two spots clear of grass, which had lately been dug up. They were about seven feet long and shaped like a grave, for which indeed he took them. 1770, August 13 ships stood out for the opening we had seen in the reef and about two o'clock past it it was about one half a mile wide as soon as the ship was well without it we had no ground within one hundred fathom of line so we came in an instant quite easy being once more in the main ocean and consequently freed from all our fears of shoals etc seventeen seventy august fourteen for the first time these three months we were this day out of sight of land to our no small satisfaction that very ocean which had formerly been looked upon with terror by, maybe, all of us, was now the asylum we had long wished for, and at last found. Satisfaction was clearly painted in every man's face. The day was fine and the trade wind brisk, before which we steered to the northward. The well-grown waves which followed the ship, sure sign of no land being in our neighborhood, were contemplated with the greatest satisfaction. Notwithstanding, we plainly felt the effect of the blows they gave to our crazy ship, increasing her leaks considerably, so that she now made nine inches water every hour. This, however, was looked upon as a light evil, in comparison to those we had so lately made our escape from. 1770, August 15. Fine weather and moderate trade. The captain fearful of going too far from the land, lest we should miss an opportunity of examining whether or not the passage, which is laid down in some charts, between New Holland and New Guinea, really existed or not steered the ship west, right in for the land. About twelve o'clock it was seen from the masthead, and about one the reef laying without it, in just the same manner as when we left it. He stood on, however, resolving to stand off at night, after having taken a nearer view, but just at nightfall found himself in a manner embayed in the reef, so that it was a moot point whether or not he could weather it on either tack. We stood, however, to the northward, and at dark it was concluded that she would go clear of everything we could see. The night, however, was not the most agreeable. 
All the dangers we had escaped were little in comparison of being thrown upon this reef, if that should be our lot. A reef such as this one, as I now speak of, is a thing scarcely known in Europe, or indeed anywhere but in these seas. It is a wall of coral rock, rising almost perpendicularly out of the unfathomable ocean, always overflown at high water, commonly seven or eight feet, and generally bare at low water. The large waves of the vast ocean, meeting with so sudden a resistance, make here a most terrible surf, breaking mountain high, especially when, as in our case, the general trade wind blows directly upon it. 1770, August 16. At three o'clock this morning it dropped calm on a sudden, which did not at all better our situation. We judged ourselves not more than four or five leagues from the reef, maybe much less, and the swell of the sea which drove right in upon it carried the ship toward it fast. We tried the lead often in hopes to find ground that we might anchor, but in vain. Before five, the roaring of the surf was plainly heard, and as day broke, the vast foaming billows were plainly enough to be seen, scarce a mile from us, and towards which we found the ship carried by the waves surprisingly fast, so that by six o'clock we were within a cable's length of them, driving on as fast as ever, and still no ground with one hundred fathoms of line. Every method had been taken since we first saw our danger, to get the boats out, in hopes that they might tow us off, but it was not yet accomplished. The pinnace had had a plank stripped off her for repair, and the longboat under the booms was lashed and fastened so well, from our supposed security, that she was not yet got out. Two large oars or sweeps were got out at the stern ports, to pull the ship's head round the other way, in hopes that they might delay till the boats were out. All this while we were approaching, and came, I believe, before this could be effected, within forty yards of the breaker. The same sea that washed the side of the ship rose in a breaker enormously high, the very next time it did rise. So between us and it was only a dismal valley the breadth of one wave. Even now the lead was hove three or four times, lengthened together, but no ground could be felt with above one hundred and fifty fathom. Now is our case truly desperate. No man, I believe, but who gave himself entirely over, a speedy death, was all we had to hope for, and that from the vastness of the breakers, which must quickly dash the ship all to pieces, was scarcely to be doubted. Other hopes we had none. The boats were in the ship, and must be dashed in pieces with her, and the nearest dry land was eight or ten leagues distant. We did not, however, cease our endeavours to get out the long boat, which was by this time almost accomplished. At this critical juncture, at this, I must say, terrible moment, when all assistance seemed too little to save even our miserable lives, a small ear of wind sprang up, so small that at any other time in a calm we should not have observed it. We, however, plainly saw that it instantly checked our progress. Every sail was therefore put in a proper direction to catch it, and we just observed the ship to move in a slanting direction, off from the breakers. This at least gave us time, and redoubling our efforts we at last got out the longboat, and manning her, sent her ahead. The ship still moved a little off, but in less than ten minutes our little breeze died away, into as flat a calm as ever. Now was our anxiety again renewed. Innumerable small pieces of paper, etc., were thrown over the ship's side, to find whether the boats really moved her ahead or not, and so little did she move that it remained almost every other time a matter of dispute. Our friendly little breeze now visited us again, and lasted as long as before, thrusting us possibly one hundred yards farther from the breakers. We were still, however, in the very jaws of destruction. A small opening had been seen in the reef about a furlong from us. Its breadth was scarce the length of the ship. Into this, however, it was resolved to push her if possible. Within was no surf, therefore we might save our lives. The doubt was only whether we could get the ship so far. Our little breeze, however, a third time visited us, and pushed us almost there. The fear of death is bitter. The prospect we now had before us of saving our lives, though at the expense of everything we had, made my heart set much lighter on its throne, and I suppose there were none but what felt the same sensations. At length we arrived off the mouth of the wished-for opening, and found to our surprise what had, with a little breeze, been the real cause of our escape, a thing that we had not before dreamt of. The tide of flood it was that had hurried us so unaccountably fast toward the reef, in the near neighbourhood of which we arrived, just at high water. Consequently, it ceasing to drive us any farther, gave us the opportunity we had of getting off. Now, however, 
the tide of ebb made strong and gushed out of our little opening like a mill stream so that it was impossible to get in of this stream however we took the advantage as much as possible and it carried us out near a quarter of a mile from the reef we well knew that we were to take all the advantage possible of the ebb so continued towing with all our might and with all our boats the pinnace now being repaired till we had gotten offing of one and a half or two miles by this time the tide began to turn and our suspense began again as we had gained so little while the ebb was in our favour we had some reason to imagine that the flood would hurry us back upon the reef in spite of our utmost endeavours it was still as calm as ever so no likelihood of any wind to-day indeed head wind sprung up we could only have searched for another opening for we were so embayed by the reef that with the general trade wind it was impossible to get out another opening was however seen ahead and the first lieutenant went away in the small boat to examine it in the meantime we struggled hard with the flood sometimes gaining a little then holding only our own and at other times losing a little so that our situation was almost as bad as ever as the flood had not yet come into its strength at two, however, the lieutenant arrived with news that the opening was very narrow. In it was good anchorage and a passage quite in, free from shoals. The ship's head was immediately put toward it, and with the tide she towed fast, so that by three we entered and were hurried in by a stream almost like a mill-race, which kept us from even a fear of the sides, though it was not above one quarter of a mile in breadth. By four we came to an anchor, happy once more to encounter those shoals which but two days before we thought ourselves supremely happy to have escaped from how little do most men know what is for their real advantage two days ago our utmost wishes were crowned by getting without the reef and to-day we were again made happy by getting within it seventeen seventy august seventeen as we were now safe at an anchor it was resolved to send the boats upon the nearest shoal to search for shellfish, turtle, or whatever else they could get. They accordingly went, and Dr. Solander and myself accompanied them in my small boat. In our way we met with two water snakes, one five, the other six feet long. We took them both. They much resembled land snakes, only their tails were flattened sideways, I suppose for the convenience of swimming, and were not venomous. The shoal we went upon was the very reef we had so near been lost upon yesterday now no longer terrible to us it afforded little provision for the ship no turtle only three hundred pound of great cockles some were however of an immense size we had in the way of curiosity much better success meeting with many curious fish and mollusca besides corals of many species all alive among which was the tubipora musica i have often lamented that we had not time to make proper observations upon this curious tribe of animals but we were so entirely taken up with the more conspicuous links of the chain of creation, as fish, plants, birds, etc., etc., that it was impossible. 1770, August 18. Weighed and stood along shore with a gentle breeze. The main still seven or eight leagues from us. In the even many shoals were ahead. We were, however, fortunate enough to find our way through them, and at night anchored under an island. The tide here ran immensely strong, which we looked upon as a good omen, so strong a stream must in all probability have an outlet by which we could get out either on the south or north side of new guinea the smoothness of the water however plainly indicated that the reef continued between us and the ocean seventeen seventy august nineteen weighed anchor and steered as yesterday with a fresh trade wind all morn were much entangled with shoals but so much do great dangers swallow up lesser ones that these once so much dreaded shoals were now looked at with much less concern than formerly at noon we passed along a large shoal on which the boats which were ahead saw many turtle but it blew too fresh to catch them we were now tolerably near the main which appeared low and barren and often interspersed with large patches of the very white sand spoke of before on a small island which we passed very near to were five natives two of whom carried their lances in their hands they came down upon a point and looked at the ship for a little while and then retired seventeen seventy august twenty steering along shore as usual among many shoals loving up some and bearing away others we were now pretty well experienced in their appearances so as seldom to be deceived and easily to know asunder a bottom coloured by white sand from a coral rock the former of which though generally in twelve or fourteen fathom water 
some time ago gave us much trouble. The reef was still supposed to be without us from the smoothness of our water. The mainland appeared very low and sandy, and had many fires upon it, more than we had usually observed. We passed during the day many low sandy islands, every one of which stood upon a large shoal. We have constantly found the best passage to lie near the main, and the farther from that you go near the reef the more numerous are the shoals. In the evening we observed the shoals to decrease in number, but we still were in smooth water. 1770, August 21. Running along shore with charming moderate weather, as indeed we have had ever since our second entering the reef. We observed both last night and this morn that the main looked very narrow, so we began to look out for the passage we expected to find between New Holland and New Guinea. At noon one was seen very narrow, but appeared to widen. We resolved to try it, so stood in. In passing through, for it was not more than a mile in length, before it widened very much, we saw ten Indians standing on a hill. Nine were armed with lances, as we had been used to see them. The tenth had a bow and arrows. Two also had large ornaments of mother-of-pearl shell hung round their necks. After the ship had passed by, three followed her, one of whom was the bowman. We soon came abreast, from whence we concluded we might not have a much better view than from our masthead. So the anchor was dropped and we prepared ourselves to go ashore to examine whether the place we stood into was a bay or a passage. For as we sailed right before the trade wind, we might find difficulty in getting out, should it prove to be the former. The three Indians placed themselves upon the beach opposite to us, as if resolved either to oppose or assist our landing. When, however, we came about musket shot from them, they all walked leisurely away. The hill we were upon was by much the most barren we had been upon. It, however, gave us the satisfaction of seeing a strait, at least as far as we could see, without any obstruction. In the even a strong tide made us almost certain. 1770, August 22. In the morn, three or four women appeared upon the beach gathering shellfish. We looked with our glasses, and to us they appeared as they always did more naked than our mother Eve. The ebb ran out so strong that we could not wait till near noon. We had the wind variable from north to west, the first time since we got the trade. Before we had proceeded far, we met with a shoal, which made us come to an anchor. 1770, August 23. In the morn calm. At nine, however, a small breeze sprang up on which we weighed, and sailed through a channel which had been found during the calm. At noon, we were abreast of an island which was white with a dung of birds. As we had little wind, the ship was brought to. We went ashore upon it and shot boobies till our ammunition was quite expended. I myself botanized and found some plants which I had not seen before. After we came on board, the winds were variable, and soon after calm and very hot. Water still continued very shoal, but the swell, which ran larger than any we had met with within the reef, gave us great hope. 1770, August 24. Swell continued and in the morn the best bower cable was broke in weighing by it. The whole day was spent in fruitless attempts to recover the anchor, though there was no more than eight fathom water. 1770, August 25. This morn, by the first sweep, the anchor was recovered, and we soon got under sail and lost sight of land, with only nine fathom water. At dinner met shoals, which made us anchor again. In the eve, however, found a passage out, and sailed clear enough of them. 1770, August 26 fine weather, and clear fresh trade, stood to the west and deepened our water from thirteen to twenty-seven. At night many Egberts coming from the west. 1770, August 27. Lay two all last night. In the morn fresh trade and fine clear weather made us hope that our difficulties were drawing to a period. It was now resolved to haul up to the northward, in order to make the coast of New Guinea, in order to assure ourselves that we had really got clear of the South Sea which was accordingly done. At dinner time we were alarmed afresh by the usual report of a shoal just ahead. It proved, however, to be no more than a bank or regular layer of a brownish color, extending itself upon the sea, which indeed had very much the appearance of a shoal while at a distance. It was formed by innumerable small atoms, each scarce one half a line in length, yet when looked at in the microscope, consisting of thirty or forty tubes, each hollow, and divided through the whole length into many cells by small partitions like the tubes of Confervus, to which of the three kingdoms of nature they belong I am totally ignorant. I only guess that they are of a vegetable nature, because on burning them I could perceive 
no animal smell. We have before this, during this voyage, seen them several times on the coast of Brazil, and that of New Holland, but never that I recollect at any considerable distance from the land. In the evening a small bird of the naughty, sterna kind, hovered much about the ship, and at night settled on the rigging where he was taken, and proved exactly the same bird as Dampier has described, and given a rude figure of, under the name of, a naughty from New Holland. See his Voyages, Volume 3, page 98, Tab of Birds, Figure 5. 1770, August 28. Still standing to the northward, the water shoaling regularly. Vast quantities of the little substances mentioned yesterday, floating upon the water in large lines, a mile or more long, and fifty or one hundred yards wide, all swimming either immediately upon the surface of the water, or not many inches under it. The seamen, who are now convinced that it was not, as they had thought, the spawn of fish, began to call it sea sawdust, a name certainly not ill-adapted to its appearance. One of them, a Portuguese, who came on board the ship at Rio de Janeiro, told me that at San Salvador, on the coast of Brazil, where the Portuguese have a whale fishery, he had often seen vast quantities of it taken out of the stomachs of whales, or grampuses, there taken. In the afternoon the soundings became most irregular, starting sometimes at once from eighteen to seven fathoms. At four the land was seen from the masthead, but at sunset was not seen from the deck. During the night we stood off and on, far from satisfied with our soundings. 1770, August 29. During the whole night our soundings were as irregular as they had been in the even, but never less than seven and never so shoal for any time. In the morn the land was seen from the deck, which was uncommonly low, but covered very thick with wood. At eight it was not more than two leagues from us, but the water had gradually shoaled since more into five fathom, and was at this time as muddy as the river Thames so it was thought not prudent to go any nearer at present, and accordingly we stood along shore, seeing fires here and there, large groves of coconut trees, in the neighborhood of which we supposed the Indian villages to be situated. In the eve, though we kept the same distance from the land, we got into less than four fathom, and we got upon a wind. We were very long before we could deepen it. The bank, however, which was soft mud, proved inimitably regular. 1770, August 30, in the morn, Though the ship was in less than seven fathom water, the land was but just seen from the deck. We sailed along shore, however, in about that depth, the bank as regular as usual. In the even a large fire was seen ashore. At night of a sudden, went away to the northward. We now judged ourselves to be about the place called in the drafts, Falche Cup, and supposed this to be it. Both yesterday and today vast quantities of the sea sawdust was seen. Some of our people observed that on passing through a bed of it much larger than common, they smelt an uncommon stink, which they supposed to proceed from it. 1770, August 31. Five and one-half fathom, and the land not seen, even from the masthead. The regularity of the bank, which was soft mud, made us very little regard the shoalness of the water, which was still as muddy as the Thames at Gravesend. At night we anchored in four and one-half fathom, the land being then, but just seen from the deck. End of section 42, August 1770. Section 43 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 43. Some account of that part of New Holland called New South Wales. Part 1. This section follows directly on from diary entry for 26 August 1770. The journal continues again on September 1, 1770. Having now, I believe, fairly passed through between New Holland and New Guinea, and having an open sea to the westward, so that we tomorrow intend to steer more to the northward, in order to make the south coast of New Guinea, it seems high time to take leave of New Holland, which I shall do by summing up together the few observations I have been able to make on the country and people. I much wished indeed to have had better opportunities of seeing and observing the people, as they differ so much from the account that Dampier, the only man I know of who has seen them besides us, has given of them. He indeed saw them on a part of the coast very distant from where we were, and consequently the people might be different, but I should rather conclude them to be the same 
chiefly from having observed an universal conformity in such of their customs as came under my observation in the several places we landed upon during the run of hundreds of leagues along the coast dampier in general seems to be a faithful relator but in the voyage in which he touched on the coast of new holland he was in a ship of pirates possibly himself not a little tainted by their idle examples he might have kept no written journal of anything more than the navigation of the ship and when upon coming home he was solicited to publish an account of his voyage have referred to his memory for many particulars relating to people etc these indians when covered with their filth which i believe they never wash off are if not coal black very near it as negroes then he might well esteem them and add the woolly hair and want of two four teeth in consequence of the similitude in complexion between these and the natives of africa but from whatever cause it may arise certain it is that dampier either was mistaken very much in his account or else that he saw a very different race of people from those we have seen for the whole length of the coast which we sailed along there was a sameness to be observed in the face of the country very uncommon barren it may justly be called in a very high degree that at least that we saw the soil in general is sandy and very light on it grows grass tall enough but thin set and trees of a tolerable size never however near together in general forty fifty or sixty feet asunder this and spots sometimes very large of loose sand constitutes the general face of the country as you sail along it and indeed of the greatest part even after you have penetrated inland as far as our situation would allow us to do the banks of bays are generally clothed with thick mangroves sometimes for a mile or more in breadth the soil under these is rank mud always overflowed every spring tide inland you sometimes meet upon a bog upon which the grass grows rank and thick so that no doubt the soil is sufficiently fertile the valleys also between the hills where runs of water come down are thick clothed with underwood but they are generally very steep and narrow so that upon the whole the fertile soil bears no kind of proportion to that which seems by nature doomed to everlasting barrenness water is here a scarce article or at least was so when we were there which i believe to have been in the very high of the dry season some places we were in where we saw not a drop and at the two places where we filled for the ship's use it was done from pools not brooks this drought is probably owing to the dryness of a soil almost entirely composed of sand in which high hills are scarce that there is plenty however in the rainy season is sufficiently evinced by the channels we saw cut even in rocks down the sides of inconsiderable hills these were in general dry or if any of them contained water it was such as ran in the woody valleys and these seldom carried water above halfway down the hill some indeed we saw that formed brooks and ran quite down to the sea but these were scarce and in general brackish a good way up from the beach a soil so barren and at the same time entirely void of the helps derived from cultivation could not be supposed to yield much towards the support of man we had been so long at sea with but a scanty supply of fresh provisions that we had long used to eat everything we could lay our hands upon fish flesh or vegetable which only was not poisonous yet we could but now and then procure a dish of bad greens for our table and never but in the place where the ship was careened met with a sufficient quantity to supply the ship there indeed palm cabbage and what is called in the west indies indian kale were in tolerable plenty as was also a sort of purslane the other plants we eat were a kind of beans very bad a kind of parsley and a plant something resembling spinach which two last grew only to the southward i shall give their botanical names as i believe some of them were never eat by europeans before first indian kale aramesculentum red-flowered purslane sesuvium portulacastrum beans lysini speciosa parsley apium spinach tetragonia cornuta fruits we had fewer still to the south was one something resembling a heart cherry only the stone was soft eugenia which had nothing but a light acid to recommend it to the northward again a kind of figs growing from the stalk of a tree very indifferent ficus caudiciflora a fruit we called plums like them in colour but flat like a little cheese and another much like a damson both in appearance and taste both these last however were so full of a large stone that eating them was but an unprofitable business wild plantains we had also but so full of seeds that they had little or no pulp for the article of timber there is certainly no want of trees of more than middling size 
and some in the valleys very large, but all of a very hard nature. Our carpenters who cut them down for firewood complained much that their tools were damaged by them. Some trees there were also to the northward, whose soft bark, which easily peels off, is in the East Indies applied to the use of caulking ships in lieu of oakum. Palms here were of three different sorts. The first, which grew plentifully to the southward, had leaves pleated like a fan. The cabbage of these was small, but exquisitely sweet, and the nuts which it bore in great abundance a very good food for hogs. The second was very much like the real cabbage tree of the West Indies, bearing large pinnated leaves, like those of a coconut. These, too, yielded cabbage, if not so sweet, as the other sort, yet the quantity made apple amends. The third, which as well as the second was found only in the northern parts, was low, seldom ten feet in height, with small pinnated leaves, resembling those of some kinds of fern. Cabbage it had none, but generally bore a plentiful crop of nuts, about the size of a large chestnut, and rounder. By the hulls of these, which we found plentifully near the Indian fires, we were assured that these people eat them and some of our gentlemen tried to do the same, but were deterred from a second experiment by a hearty fit of vomiting and purging, which was the consequence of the first. The hogs, however, who were still shorter of provision than we were, eat them heartily, and we concluded their constitution stronger than ours, till after about a week they were all taken extremely ill of indigestions. Two died, and the rest were saved with difficulty. Other useful plants we saw none, except perhaps two might be found so, which yield resin in abundance. The one, a tree tolerably large with narrow leaves, not unlike a willow, which was very plentiful in every place into which we went. This yielded a blood-red resin, or rather gum resin, very nearly resembling sanguis draconis. Indeed, as sanguis draconis is the produce of several different plants, this may perhaps be one of the sorts. This I should suppose to be the gum mentioned by Dampier in his voyage round the world, and by him compared with sanguis draconis as possibly also that which Tasman saw upon Demon's Land, where he says he saw the gum of trees, and gum lack of the ground. See his voyage in a collection published at London in 1694, page 133. The other was a small plant with long, narrow, grassy leaves and a spike of flowers, resembling much that kind of bulrush, which is called in England cat's tail. This yielded a resin of a bright yellow color perfectly resembling gamboge, only that it did not stain. It had a sweet smell, but what its properties are the chemists may be able to determine. Of plants, in general, the country afforded a far larger variety than its barren appearance seemed to promise. Many of these have no doubt properties which might be useful, but for physical and economical purposes, which we were not able to investigate, could we have understood the Indians, or made them by any means our friends, we might perchance have learned some of these, for though their manner of life, but one degree removed from brutes, does not seem to promise much, yet they had a knowledge of plants, as we plainly could perceive, by their having names for them. Thus much for plants. I have been rather particular in mentioning those which we eat, hoping that such a remembrance might be of use to some or other, into whose hands these papers may fall. For quadrupeds, birds, fish, etc., I shall say no more than that we had some time ago learned to eat every identical species which came in our way, a hawk or a crow, was to us as delicate and perhaps a better relished meal than a partridge or pheasant to those who have plenty of dainties. We wanted nothing to recommend any food, but it's not being salt. That alone was sufficient to make it a delicacy. Shags, seagulls, and all that tribe of sea fowl, which are reckoned bad from their trainy or fishy taste, were to us an agreeable food. We did not at all taste their rankness which no doubt has been and possibly will again be highly nauseous to us whenever we have plenty of beef and mutton, etc. Quadrupeds we saw few, and were able to catch few of them that we did see. The largest was called by the natives kangaroo. It is different from any European, and indeed any animal, I have heard or read of, except the jerboa of Egypt, which is not larger than a rat, when this is as large as a middling lamb. The largest we shot weighed eighty-four pounds. It may, however, be easily known from all other animals, by the singular property of running, or rather hopping, upon only its hinder legs, carrying its fore bent close to its breast. In this manner, however, it hops so fast, that in the rocky bed ground where it is commonly found, it easily beat my greyhound, 
who, though he was fairly started at several, killed only one, and that quite a young one. Another was called by the natives Jaquo. It is about the size and something like a polecat, of a light spotted brown, with white on the back and white under the belly. The third was of the opossum kind, and much resembling that, called by de Buffon, Fellinger. Of these two last, I took only one individual of each. Bats here were many. One small we took, which was much like, if not identically the same, as that described by de Buffon, under the name of Fer de Cheval. Another sort was as large or larger than a partridge, but of this species we were not fortunate enough to take one. We supposed it, however, to be either the roupette or rougette of the same author. Besides these, wolves were, I believe, seen by several of our people, and some other animals described, but from the unintelligible style of the describers, I could not even determine whether they were such as I myself had seen, or of different kinds. Of these descriptions I shall insert one, as it is not unentertaining. A seaman, who had been out on duty on his return, declared that he had seen an animal about the size of, and much like, a one-gallon keg. It was, says he, as black as the devil, and had wings. Indeed, I took it for the devil, or I might easily have catched it, for it crawled very slowly through the grass. After taking some pains, I found out that the animal he had seen was no other than the large bat. Birds there were several species of, sea-fowl, gulls, shags, solent geese, or gannets of two sorts, boobies, etc., and pelicans of an enormous size. But these last though we saw many thousands of them were so shy that we never got one of them, as were the cranes also of which we saw several very large and some beautiful species. In the rivers were ducks, who flew in large flocks, but were very hard to come at, and on the beach were curlews of several sorts, some very like our English ones, and many small beach birds. The land birds were crows, very like if not quite the same as our English ones, parrots and parakeets most beautiful, white and black cockatoos, pigeons, beautiful doves, bustards, and many others which did not at all resemble those of Europe. Most of these were extremely shy, so that it was with difficulty that we shot any of them. A crow in England, though in general sufficiently wary, is, I must say, a fool to a New Holland crow, and the same may be said of almost, if not all the birds in the country. The only ones we ever got in any plenty was pigeons, of which we met large flocks, of which the men, who were sent out on purpose, would sometimes kill ten or twelve a day. They were a beautiful bird, crested differently from any other pigeon I have seen. What can be the reason of this extraordinary shyness in the birds is difficult to say, unless perhaps the Indians are very clever in deceiving them, which we have very little reason to suppose, as we never saw any instrument with them but their lances, with which a bird could be killed or taken, and these must be very improper tools for the purpose." Yet one of our people saw a white cockatoo in their possession, which very bird we looked upon to be one of the wariest of them all. Of insects, here were but few sorts, and among them only the ants were troublesome to us. Mosquitoes, indeed, were in some places tolerably plentiful, but it was our good fortune never to stay any time in such places, and where we did to meet with very few. The ants, however, made ample amends for the want of them, two sorts in particular, one, green as a leaf and living upon trees, where he built his nest, in size between that of a man's head and his fist, by bending the leaves together and gluing them with a whitish papery substance, which held them together firmly. In doing this, their management was most curious. They bend down leaves broader than a man's hand, and place them in such a direction as they choose, in doing of which a much larger force is necessary than these animals seem capable of. Many thousands, indeed, are employed in the joint work. I have seen them holding down such a leaf, as many as could stand by one another, each drawing down with all his might, while others within are employed to fasten the glue. How they had bent it down I had not an opportunity of seeing, but that it was held down by a main strength I easily proved by disturbing a part of them, on which the leaf bursting from the rest returned to its natural situation and I had an opportunity to try with my finger the strength that these little animals must have used to get it down. But industrious as they are, their courage, if possible, excels their industry. If we accidentally shook the branches on which such nests were hung, thousands would immediately throw themselves down, 
many of which falling upon us made us sensible of their stings and revengeful dispositions, especially if, as was often the case, they got possession of our necks and hair. Their stings were by some esteemed not much less painful than those of a bee. The pain, however, lasted only a few seconds. Another sort there were, quite black, whose manner of living was most extraordinary. They inhabited the inside of the branches of one sort of tree, the pith of which they hollowed out almost quite to the ends of the branches. Nevertheless, the tree flourished, as well to all appearance, as if no such accident had happened to it. When first we found the tree, we, of course, gathered the branches, and were surprised to find our hands instantly covered with legions of these small animals, who stung most intolerably. Experience, however, taught us to be more careful for the future. Rumphius mentions a similar instance to this in his Herbarium Aboanense, volume 2, page 257. His tree, however, does not at all resemble ours. A third sort nested in the inside of the root of a plant, which grew on the bark of trees in the same manner as mistletoe. The root was as large as a large turnip, and often much larger. When cut, the inside showed innumerable winding passages, in which these animals lived. The plant itself throve to all appearance not a bit the worse for its numerous inhabitants. Several hundreds have I seen, and never one but what was inhabited, though some were so young as to not be much larger than a hazelnut. The ants themselves were very small, not above half as large as our red ants in England. They stung indeed, but so little that it was scarce to be felt. The chief inconvenience in handling the roots came from the infinite number. Myriads would come in an instant, out of many holes, and running over the hand tickle so as to be scarcely endurable. Rumphius has an account of this very bulb and its ants, in the sixth volume, page 120, where he describes also another sort of ants, of which are black. The fourth sort were perfectly harmless, at least they proved so to us, though they resembled most minutely the white ants of the East Indies, the most mischievous insect I believe known in the world. Their architecture was, however, far superior to that of any other species. They had two kinds of houses, one suspended on the branches of trees, the other standing upright on the ground. The first sort were generally three or four times as large as a man's head. They were built of a brittle substance, seemingly made of small parts of vegetables kneaded together with some glutinous matter, probably afforded by themselves. On breaking this outer crust, innumerable cells appeared full of individuals in winding directions, communicating with each other as well as with diverse doors which led from the nest. From each of these went a passage, arched over, leading to different parts of the tree, and generally one large one to the ground. This I am inclined to believe communicated with the other kind of house, for as the animals inhabiting both were precisely the same, I see no reason why they should be supposed, contrary to every instance that I know in nature, to build two different kinds of houses, unless according to the conveniences of season, prey, etc., they inhabit both equally." This other kind of house which I now speak of was very often built near the foot of a tree, the bark of which tree always had upon it their covered ways, though but seldom the first kind of house. It was formed like an irregularly sided cone, and sometimes was more than six feet high, and near as much in diameter. The smaller ones were generally flat-sided, and resembled very much the old stones which are seen in many parts of England, and supposed to be remains of druidical worship. The outside coat of these was two inches thick at least, of hard, well-tampered clay, under which were their cells. To these no doors were to be seen. All their passages were underground, where probably they were carried on, till the root of some tree presented itself, up which they ascended, and so up the trunk and branches, by the covered way before mentioned. These, I should suppose, to be the houses to which they retire in the winter season, as they are undoubtedly able to defend them from any rain that can fall, while the others, though generally built under the shelter of some overhanging branch, must be but ill-proof to a heavy rain from the thinness of their covering. Thus much for the ants, an industrious race who in all countries have for that reason been admired by man, though probably in no country more admirable than in this. The few observations I have wrote down of them are chiefly from conjecture, and therefore are not at all to be depended upon, was any man, however, to be settled here, who had time and inclination to observe their economy, 
I am convinced it would far exceed that of any insects we know, not excepting our much admired bees. End of section 43. Part 1 of some account of that part of New Holland called New South Wales. Section 44 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 44. Some account of that part of New Holland called New South Wales. Part 2. The sea, however, made some amends for the bareness of the land. Fish, though not so plentiful as they generally are in higher latitudes, were far from scarce. Where we had an opportunity of hauling the seine, we generally caught from fifty to two hundred pound of fish in a tide. Their sorts were various, none, I think, but mullets known in Europe. In general, however, they were sufficiently palatable, and some very delicate food. The stingrays, indeed, which were caught on the southern part of the coast, were very coarse, but little else was caught, so we were obliged to comfort ourselves with the comforts of plenty, and enjoy more pleasure in satiety than in eating. To the northward again, when we came to be entangled within the great reef, within which we sailed to our knowledge many leagues, and we knew not how many more, perplexed every moment with shoals, was a plenty of turtle hardly to be credited. Every shoal swarmed with them. The weather, indeed, was generally so boisterous that our boats could not row after them so fast as they could swim, so that we got but few, but they were excellent, and so large that a single turtle always served the ship. Had we been there either at the time of laying, or the more moderate season, we doubtless might have taken any quantity. Besides this, all the shoals that were dry at half ebb afforded plenty of fish that were left dry in small hollows of the rocks, and a profusion of large shellfish, chamagigas, such as Dampier describes, volume 3, page 191. The large ones of this kind had ten or fifteen pound of meat in them. It was indeed rather strong, but I believe a very wholesome food, and well relished by the people in general. On different parts of the coast were also found oysters, which were said to be very well tasted. The shells also of well-sized lobsters and crabs were seen, but these it was never our fortune to catch. Upon the whole, New Holland, though in every respect the most barren country I have seen, is not so bad but that between the productions of sea and land, a company of people, who should have the misfortune of being shipwrecked upon it, might support themselves, even by the resources that we have seen. Undoubtedly, a longer stay in visiting different parts would discover many more. This immense tract of land, the largest known, which does not bear the name of a continent, as it is considerably larger than all Europe, is thinly inhabited, even to admiration, at least that part of it that we saw. We never but once saw so many as thirty Indians together, and that was a family. Men, women, and children assembled upon a rock to see the ship pass by. At Stingray's Bay, where they evidently came down to fight us several times, they could never muster above fourteen or fifteen fighting men. Indeed, in other places, they generally ran away from us, from whence it might be concluded that there were greater numbers than we saw, but their houses and sheds in the woods, which we never failed to find, convinced us of the smallness of their parties. We saw, indeed, only the sea coast. What the immense tract of inland country may produce is to us totally unknown. We may have the liberty to conjecture, however, that they are totally uninhabited. The sea has, I believe, been universally found to be the chief source of supplies to Indians, ignorant of the arts of cultivation. The wild produce of the land alone seems scarce able to support them at all seasons. At least, I do not remember to have read of any inland nation who did not cultivate the ground more or less. Even the North Americans, who were so well versed in hunting, sowed their maize. But should a people live inland who supported themselves by cultivation, these inhabitants of the sea-coast must certainly have learnt to imitate them, in some degree at least, otherwise their reason must be supposed to hold a rank little superior to that of monkeys. Whatever may be the reason of this want of people is difficult to guess, unless perhaps the barrenness of the soil and scarcity of fresh water. But why mankind should not increase here as fast as in other places, unless their small tribes have frequent wars, in which many are destroyed? They were generally furnished with plenty of weapons, whose points of the stings of stingrays seemed intended against nothing 
but their own species, from whence such an inference might easily be drawn. That their customs were nearly the same throughout the whole length of the coast, along which we sailed, I should think very probable, though we had connections with them only at one place, yet we saw them either with our eyes or glasses many times, and at Stingray's Bay had some experience of their manners. Their colour, arms, method of using them, were the same as we afterwards had a nearer view of. They likewise in the same manner went naked, and painted themselves. Their houses were the same. They notched large trees in the same manner, and even the bags they carried their furniture in were of exactly the same manufacture. Something between netting and knitting, which I have nowhere else seen in the immediate places. Our glasses might deceive us in many things, but their colour and want of clothes we certainly did see, and wherever we came ashore the houses and sheds, places where they had dressed victuals with heated stones, and trees, not for the convenience of climbing them, sufficiently evinced them to be the same people. The tribe with which we had connections consisted of twenty-one people, twelve men, seven women, a boy, and a girl. So many at least we saw, and there might be more, especially women, who we did not see. The men were remarkably short and slender-built in proportion. The tallest we measured was five feet nine, the shortest five two. Their medium height seemed to be about five feet six, as the tall man appeared more disproportioned in size from his fellows than the short one. What their absolute color is, is difficult to say. They were so completely covered with dirt, which seemed to have stuck to their hides from the day of their birth, without their once having attempted to remove it. I tried indeed by spitting upon my finger and rubbing, but altered the color very little, which as nearly as might be, resembled that of chocolate. The beards of several were bushy and thick. Their hair, which as well as their beards, was black. They wore cropped close round their ears. In some it was lank as a European's, in others a little crisped, as is common in the South Sea Islands, but in none of them at all resembled the wool of Negroes. They had also all their four teeth, in which two things they differed chiefly from those seen by Dampier, supposing him not to be mistaken. As for color, they would undoubtedly be called blacks, by any one not used to consider attentively the colors of different nations. Myself should never have thought of such distinctions, had I not seen the effect of sun and wind upon the natives of the South Sea Islands, where many of the better sort of people who keep themselves close at home are nearly as white as Europeans, while the poorer sort, obliged in their business of fishing, etc., to expose their naked bodies to all the inclemencies of the climate, have some among them but little lighter than the New Hollanders. They were all to a man lean and clean-limbed, and seemed to be very light and active. Their countenances were not without some expression, though I cannot charge them with much. Their voices in general shrill and effeminate. Of clothes they had not the least part, but naked as ever our general father was before his fall. They seemed no more conscious of their nakedness than if they had not been the children of parents who eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Whether this want of what most nations look upon as absolutely necessary proceeds from idleness or want of invention is difficult to say. In the article of ornaments, however, useless as they are, neither has the one hindered them from contriving nor the other from making them. Of these, the chief, and that on which they seemed to set the greatest value, is a bone, about five or six inches in length, and thick as a man's finger, which they thrust into a hole bored through that part which divides the nostrils, so that it sticks across their face, making in the eyes of Europeans a most ludicrous appearance, though no doubt they esteemed this as an addition to their beauty which they purchased with hourly inconvenience. For when the spoon was in its place, as our seamen termed it, their spritsail yard was rigged across, it completely stopped up both nostrils, so that they spoke in the nose in a manner one should think scarcely intelligible. Besides these extraordinary bones, they had necklaces made of shells, neatly enough cut and strung together, bracelets also, if one may call by that name, four or five rings of small cord wore round the upper part of the arm also a belt or string tied round the waist, about as thick as worsted wool, which last was frequently made of either human hair or that of the beast called by them kangaroo. Besides these, they paint themselves with the colors of red and white. The red they commonly lay on in broad patches on their shoulders or breasts, the white in stripes, some of which were narrow and confined to small parts of their body. Others were broad and carried with some degree of taste across their bodies, round their arms, legs, etc., they also lay it on in circles round their eyes, and in patches, in different parts of their faces. The red they used seemed to be red ochre, 
but what the white was we could not find out. It was heavy and close-grained, almost as white lead, and had a saponaceous feel. Possibly it might be a kind of steatites. We lamented not being able to procure a bit to examine. These people seemed to have no idea of traffic, nor could we teach them. Indeed, it seemed that we had no one thing on which they set a value equal to induce them to part with the smallest trifle, except one fish which weighed about one half a pound, that they brought as a kind of token of peace. No one in the ship, I believe, procured from them the smallest article. They readily received the things we gave them, but never would understand our signs when asked for returns. This, however, must not be forgot, that whatever opportunities they had, they never once attempted to take anything in a clandestine manner. Whatever they wanted, they openly asked for, and in almost all cases, bore the refusal, if they met with one, with much indifference. Except turtles. Dirty as these people are, they seem to be entirely free from lice, a circumstance rarely observed among the most cleanly Indians, and which here is the more remarkable, as their hair was generally matted and filthy enough. In all of them, indeed, it was very thin and seemed as if seldom disturbed with the combing, even of their fingers much less to have any oil or grease put into it. Nor did the custom of oiling their bodies, so common among most uncivilized nations, seem to have the least footing here. On their bodies we observed very few marks of cutaneous disorders, as scurf, scars of sores, etc. Their spare thin bodies indicated temperance in eating, the consequence either of necessity or inclination, equally productive of health, particularly in this respect. On the fleshy parts of their arms and thighs, and some of their sides were large scars in regular lines, which by their breadth and the convexity with which they held showed plainly that they had been made by cuts of some blunt instrument, a shell perhaps, or the edge of a broken stone. These, as far as we could understand by the signs they made use of, were the marks of their lamentations for the deceased, in honor of whose memory, or to show the excess of their grief, they had in this manner wept for in blood. For food, they seem to depend very much, though not entirely, upon the sea. Fish of all kinds, turtle, and even crabs, they strike with their lances very dexterously. These are generally bearded with broad beards, and their points smeared over with a kind of hard resin, which makes them pierce a hard body far easier than they would do without it. In the southernmost parts, these fish spears had four prongs, and besides the resin, were pointed with a sharp bone of a fish. To the northward again, their spears had only one point, yet both, I believe, struck fish with equal dexterity. For the northern ones I can witness, who several times saw them through a glass, throw their spear from ten to twenty yards, and generally succeed. To the southward again, the plenty of fish bones we saw near their fires prove them to be no indifferent artists. For striking of turtle, they use a peg of wood well bearded, and about a foot long. This fastens into a socket of a staff of light wood, as thick as a man's wrist, and eight or nine feet long, besides which they are tied together by a loose line of three or four fathoms in length. The use of this must undoubtedly be that when the turtle is struck the staff flies off from the peg and serves for a float to show them where the turtle is, as well as assists to tire him till they can with their canoes overtake and haul him in. Then they throw this dart with great force, we had occasion to observe, while we lay in Endeavour's River, where a turtle which we killed had one of them entirely buried in its body, just across its breast. It seemed to have entered at the soft place where the forelimbs work, but not the least outward mark of the wound remained. Besides these things, we saw near their fireplaces plentiful remains of lobsters, shellfish of all kinds, and to the southward the skins of those sea animals, which from their property of spouting out water, when touched, are commonly called sea squirts. These last, howsoever disgustful, they may seem to an European palate, we found to contain under a coat as tough as leather a substance like the guts of a shellfish, in taste, though not equal to an oyster, yet by no means to be despised by a man who is hungry. Of land animals they probably eat every kind that they can kill, which probably does not amount to any large number, every species here being shy and cautious to a high degree. The only vegetables we saw them use were yams of two sorts, the one long and like a finger, the other round and covered with stringy roots. Both sorts very small but sweet. They were so scarce where we were that we never could find the plants that produced them, 
though we often saw the places where they had been dug up by the Indians very newly. It is very probable that the dry season, which was at its height when we were there, had destroyed the leaves of the plants, so that we had no guides, while the Indians, knowing well the stalks, might find them easily. Whether they knew or ever made use of cocos, I cannot tell. The immense sharpness of every part of this vegetable, before it is dressed, makes it probable that any people who have not learned the uses of it from others may remain forever ignorant of them. Near their fires were great abundance of the shells of a kind of fruit resembling a pineapple very much in appearance, though in taste disagreeable enough. It is common to all the East Indies and called by the Dutch their pineapple bowmen, pandanus, as also those of the fruit of a low palm called by the Dutch moes kriege de calipus, cycus circinalis, which they certainly eat, though they are not so unwholesome as some of our people who, though forewarned, depending upon their example, eat one or two of, or violently affected by them both upwards and downwards, and our hogs, whose constitutions we thought might be as strong as those of the Indians, literally died after having eaten them. It is probable, however, that these people have some method of preparing them, by which their poisonous quality is destroyed, as the inhabitants of the East Indian islands are said to do by boiling them, and steeping them twenty-four hours in water, then drying them and using them to thicken broth, from whence it should seem that the poisonous quality lays entirely in the juices, as it does in the roots of the manihoka, or cassava, of the West Indies, and that when thoroughly cleared of them the pulp remaining may be a wholesome and nutritious food. Their victuals they generally dress by broiling or toasting them upon the coals, so we judged by the remains we saw. They knew, however, the method of baking or stewing with hot stones, and sometimes practiced it, as we now and then saw the pits and burned stones, which had been made use of for that purpose. We observed that some, though but few, held constantly in their mouths the leaves of an herb, which they chewed as a European does tobacco, or an East Indian betel. What sort of plant it was we had not an opportunity of learning, as we never saw anything but the chaws, which they took from their mouths to show us. It might be of the betel kind, and so far as we could judge from the fragments, was so. But whatever it was, it was used without any addition, and seemed to have no kind of effect upon either their teeth or lips of those who used it. End of section 44. End of part 2. Of some account of that part of New Holland, called New South Wales. Section 45. Of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768, to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 45. Some account of that part of New Holland, called New South Wales. Part 3. Naked as these people are when abroad, they are scarce at all better defended from the injuries of the weather when at home, if that name can with propriety be given to their houses as I believe they never make any stay in them, but wandering like the Arabs from place to place, set them up whenever they meet with one, where sufficient supplies of food are to be met with, and as soon as these are exhausted, remove to another, leaving the houses behind, which are framed with less art, or rather less industry, than any habitations of human beings, probably that the world can show. At Stingray's Bay, where they were the best, each was capable of containing within it four or five people, but not one of all these could in any direction extend himself his whole length. For height, he might just set upright, but if inclined to sleep must coil himself in some crooked position, as the dimensions were in no direction long enough to hold him otherwise. They were built in the form of an oven of pliable rods, about as thick as a man's finger, the ends of which were stuck into the ground, and the hole covered with palm leaves and broad pieces of bark. The door was a pretty large hole at one end, opposite to which by the ashes there seemed to be a fire, kept pretty constantly to the northward. Again, where the warmth of the climate made the houses less necessary, they were in proportion still more slight. A house there was nothing but a hollow shelter, about three or four feet deep, built like the former, and like them covered with bark. One side of this was entirely open, which was always that which was sheltered from the course of the prevailing wind, and opposite to this door was always a heap of ashes the remains of a fire, probably more necessary to defend them from mosquitoes than cold. In these it is probable 
that they only sought to defend their heads and the upper part of their bodies from the draught of air, trusting their feet to the care of the fire. And so small they were that even in this manner not above three or four people could possibly crowd into one of them. But small as the trouble of erecting such houses must be, they did not always do it. We saw many places in the woods where they had slept with no other shelter than a few bushes and grass a foot or two high to shade them from the wind. This probably is their custom while they travel from place to place and sleep upon the road in situations where they do not mean to make any stay. The only furniture belonging to these houses that we saw at least was oblong vessels of bark made by the simple contrivance of tying up the two ends of a longish piece with a withe which not being cut off serves for a handle. These we imagined serve for the purpose of water buckets to fetch water from the springs which may sometimes be distant. We have reason to suppose that when they travel, these are carried by the women from place to place. Indeed, the few opportunities we had of seeing the women, they were generally employed in some laborious occupation, as fetching wood, gathering shellfish, etc. The men again may be constantly carry their arms in their hands, three or four lances in one, and the machine with which they throw them in the other. These serve them in the double capacity of defending them from their enemies, and striking any animal or fish that they may meet with. Besides these, each has a small bag, about the size of a moderate cabbage net, which hangs loose upon the back, fastened to a small string which passes over the crown of his head. This seems to contain all their worldly treasures. Each man, hardly more than might be contained, in the crown of a hat, a lump or two of paint, some fish hooks and lines, shells to make them, points of darts and resin, and their usual ornaments were the general contents. Thus live these, I had almost said, happy people, content with little, nay, almost nothing, far enough removed from the anxieties attending upon riches, or even the possession of what we Europeans call common necessaries. Anxieties intended may be by providence to counterbalance the pleasure arising from the possession of wished-for attainments, consequently increasing with increasing wealth, and in some measure keeping up the balance of happiness, between the rich and the poor, from them appear how small are the real wants of human nature, which we Europeans have increased to an excess, which would certainly appear incredible to these people, could they be told it. Nor shall we cease to increase them, as long as luxuries can be invented, and riches found for the purchase of them, and how soon these luxuries degenerate into necessaries, may be sufficiently evinced by the universal use of strong liquors, tobacco, spices, tea, etc., etc. In this instance, again, providence seems to act the part of a leveller, doing much toward putting all ranks into an equal state of wants, and consequently of real poverty. The great and magnificent want as much and may be more than the middling. They again in proportion more than the inferior, each rank still looking higher than his station, but confining itself to a certain point, above which it knows not how to wish, not knowing at least perfectly what is there enjoyed. Tools among them we saw almost none. Indeed, having no arts which require any, it is not to be expected that they should have many. A stone made sharp at the edge, and a wooden mallet, were the only ones we saw that had been formed by art. The use of these we supposed to be in making the notches in the bark of high trees, by which they climb them for purposes unknown to us, and for cutting and perhaps driving wedges to take off the bark, which they must have in large pieces for making canoes, shields, and water buckets, and also for covering their houses. Besides these, they use shells and corals to scrape the points of their darts, and polish them with the leaves of a kind of wild fig, ficus regulo, which bites upon wood almost as keenly as our European shave grass used by the joiners. Their fish hooks are made of shell, very neatly and some exceedingly small. Their lines are also well twisted, and they have them from the size of a half-inch rope to almost the fineness of a hair made of some vegetable. Of netting, they seem to be quite ignorant, but make their bags. The only thing of the kind we saw among them, by laying the threads loop within loop, something in the way of knitting, only very coarse and open, in the very same manner as I have seen ladies make purses in England. That they had no sharp instruments among them, we ventured to guess from the circumstance of an old man, who came to us one day with a beard rather larger than his fellows. The next day he came again, his beard was then almost cropped close to his chin, and upon examination 
we found the ends of the hairs all burnt, so that he had certainly singed it off. Their manner of hunting and taking wild animals we had no opportunity of seeing. We only guessed that the notches which they had everywhere cut in the bark of large trees, which certainly served to make climbing more easy to them, might be intended for the ascending these trees in order either to watch for any animal who unwarily passed under them, they might pierce with their darts, or for the taking of birds who at night might roost in them. We guessed also that the fires, which we saw so frequently as we passed along shore, extending over a large tract of country, and by which we could constantly trace the passage of the Indians, who went from us in Endeavour's River up into the country, were intended in some way or other for the taking of the animal called by them kangaroo, which we found to be so much afraid of fire that we could hardly force it with our dogs to go over places newly burnt. They get fire very expeditiously, with two pieces of stick, very readily and nimbly. The one must be round and eight or nine inches long, and both it and the other should be dry and soft. The round one they sharpen a little at one end, and pressing it upon the other, turn it round with the palms of their hands, just as Europeans do a chocolate mill, often shifting their hands up and running them down quick to make the pressure as hard as possible. In this manner they will get fire in less than two minutes, and when once possessed of the smallest spark, increase it in a manner truly wonderful. We often admire to see a man run along shore who seemed to carry no one thing in his hand, and yet, as he ran along, just stooping down every fifty or one hundred yards, smoke and fire were seen among the driftwood and dirt at that place almost the instant he had left it. This we afterwards found was done chiefly by the infinite readiness with which every kind of rubbish, sticks, withered leaves or grass, already almost dried to tinder, by the heat of the sun and the dryness of the season, would take fire. He took, for instance, when he set off a small bit of fire, and wrapping it up in dry grass, ran on. This soon blazed. Then he laid it down on the most convenient place for his purpose that he could find, and taking up a small part of it, wrapped that in part of the dry rubbish in which he had laid it, in this manner proceeding as long as he thought proper. Their weapons, offensive at least, were precisely the same wherever we saw them, except that at the very last view we had of the country, we saw through our glasses a man who carried a bow and arrows. In this we might, but I believe we were not mistaken. They consisted of only one species, a pike or lance, from eight to fourteen feet in length. This they threw short distances with their hands, and for longer, forty or more yards, with an instrument made for the purpose. The upper part of these lances were made either of cane or the stalk of a plant, something resembling a bulrush, which was very straight and light. The point again was made of very heavy and hard wood, the whole artfully balanced for throwing, though very clumsily made in two, three, or four joints, at each of which the parts were let into each other, and besides being tied round, the joint was smeared over very thick with their resin, which made it larger and more clumsy than any other part. The points were of several sorts. Those which we concluded to be intended against men were indeed most cruel weapons. They were all single-pointed, either with the stings of stingrays, a large one of which served for the point, and three or four smaller tied the contrary way made barbs, or simply of wood made very sharp, and smeared thick over with resin, into which was stuck many broken bits of sharp shells, so that if such a weapon pierced a man, it was many to one that it could not be drawn out, without leaving several of those unwelcome guests in his flesh, certain to make the wound ten times more difficult to cure than it otherwise would be. The others, which we supposed to be used merely for striking birds, fish, etc., had generally simple points of wood, or if they were barbed, it was only with one splinter of wood. The instrument with which they threw them was a plain piece of stick, or piece of wood, two and a half or three feet in length, at one end of which was a small knob or hook, and near the other a kind of cross-piece to hinder it from slipping out of their hands. With this contrivance, simple as it is, and ill-fitted for the purpose, they threw the lances forty or more yards, with a swiftness and steadiness truly surprising. The knob being hooked into a small dent, made in the top of the lance, they held it over their shoulder, and shaking it an instant as balancing, threw it with the greatest ease imaginable. The neatest of these throwing sticks that we saw was made of a hard reddish wood, polished and shining. Their sides were flat, and about two inches in breadth, and the handle, or part to keep it from dropping out of the hand, covered with thin layers of polished bone, very white. 
These I believe to be the things which many of our people were deceived by imagining them to be wooden swords, clubs, etc., according to the direction in which they happened to see them. Defensive weapons we saw only in Stingray's Bay, and there only a single instance. A man who attempted to oppose our landing came down to the beach with a shield of an oblong shape, about three feet long and one and one-half broad, made of the bark of a tree. This he left behind when he ran away, and we found, upon taking it up, that it plainly had been pierced through with a single pointed lance near the center. That such shields were frequently used in that neighborhood, we had, however, sufficient proof, often seeing upon trees the places from whence they had been cut, and sometimes the shields themselves cut out, but not yet taken off from the tree, the edges of the bark only being a little raised with wedges, which shows that these people certainly know how much thicker and stronger bark becomes by being suffered to remain upon the tree some time after it is cut round. That they are a very pusillanimous people, we had reason to suppose from every part of their conduct, in every place where we were, except Stingray's Bay, and there only the instance of the two people who opposed the landing of our two boats full of men for near a quarter of an hour, and were not to be drove away till several times wounded with small shot, which we were obliged to do, as at that time we suspected their lances to be poisoned from the quantity of gum which was about their points. But upon every other occasion, both there and everywhere else, they behaved alike, shunning us and giving up any part of the country which we landed upon at once. And that they used stratagems in war we learned by the instance in Stingray's Bay, where our surgeon with another man, walking in the woods, met eight Indians. They stood still, but directed another man who was up in a tree, how and when he should throw a lance at them, which he did, and on its not taking effect, they all ran away as fast as possible. Their canoes were the only things in which we saw a manifest difference between the southern and northern people. Those in the southward were little better contrived or executed than their houses. A piece of bark, tied together in plates at the ends, and kept extended in the middle by small bows of wood, was the whole embarkation, which carried one or two, nay, we once saw three people, who moved it along in shallow water by setting with long poles, and in deeper by paddling with paddles about eighteen inches long, one of which they held in each hand. In the middle of these canoes was generally a small fire, upon a heap of seaweed. For what purpose intended we did not learn, except perhaps to give the fishermen an opportunity of eating fish in perfection, by broiling at the moment it is taken. To the northward, again, their canoes, though exceedingly bad, were far superior to these. They were small, but regularly hollowed out of the trunk of a tree, and fitted with an outrigger to prevent them from oversetting. In these they had paddles, large enough to require both hands to work them. Of this sort, we had an opportunity of examining only one of them, which might be about ten or eleven feet long, but was immensely narrow. The sides of the tree were left in their natural state, untouched by tools, but each end they had cut off from the under part and left part of the upper side overhanging. The inside was also not ill-hollowed and the sides tolerably thin. What burthen it was capable of carrying we had many times an opportunity to see. Three people, or at most four, or as many as dare venture in it, and if any more wanted to come over the river, which in that place was about a half a mile broad, one of these would carry back the canoe and fetch them. This was the only piece of workmanship which I saw among the New Hollanders that seemed to require tools. How they had hollowed her out or cut the ends, I cannot guess, but upon the whole the work was not ill done. Indian patients might do a great deal with shells, etc., without the use of stone axes, which if they had had, they would probably have used to form her outside as well as inside. That such a canoe takes them up much time and trouble in the making may be concluded from our seeing so few, and still more from the moral certainty that we have that the tribe which visited us, and consisted to our knowledge of twenty-one people, and maybe of several more, had only one such belonging to them. How tedious must it be for these people to be ferried over the river a mile or two wide by threes and fours at a time, how well, therefore, worth the pains for them to stock themselves better with boats, if they could do it. I am inclined to believe that besides these canoes, the northern people know and make use of the bark one of the south, and that, from having seen one of the small paddles left by them upon a small island where they had been fishing for turtle, it lay upon a heap of turtle shells and bones, trophies of the good living they had had when there, and with it lay a broken staff of a turtle peg and a rotten line 
tools which had been worn out, I suppose, in the service of catching them. We had great reason to believe that at some season of the year the weather is much more moderate than we found it, otherwise the Indians never could have ventured in any canoes that we saw half so far from the mainland as islands were, on which we saw evident marks of their having been, such as decayed houses, fires, the before-mentioned turtle bones, etc. Maybe, if this more moderate time, they may make and use such canoes, and when the blustering season comes on, may convert the bark of which they were made to the purposes of covering houses, making water buckets, etc., etc., well knowing that when the next season returns, they will not want a supply of bark to rebuild their vessels. Another reason we have to imagine that such a moderate season exists, and that the winds are then upon the eastern board, as we found them, is that whatever Indian houses or sleeping places we saw on these islands were built upon the summits of small hills, if there were any, or if not, in places where no bushes or wood could intercept the course of the wind, and their shelter was always turned to the eastward. On the main again, their houses were universally built in valleys, or under the shelter of trees, which might defend them from the very winds which in the islands they exposed themselves to. Of their language I can say very little. Our acquaintance with them was of so short a duration that none of us attempted to use a single word of it to them. Consequently, the list of words I have given could be got no other manner than by signs, inquiring of them what in their language signified such a thing, a method obnoxious to many mistakes. For instance, a man holds in his hand a stone, and asks the name of it. The Indian may return him for answer either the real name of a stone, one of the properties of it, as hardness, roughness, smoothness, etc., one of its uses, or the name peculiar to some particular species of stone, which name the inquirer immediately sets down as that of a stone. To avoid, however, as much as possible this inconvenience, myself, and two or three more got from them as many words as we could, and having noted down those which we thought, from circumstances, we were not mistaken in, we compared our lists. Those in which all the lists agreed, or rather, were contradicted by none, we thought ourselves morally certain not to be mistaken in. Of these my list chiefly consists, some only being added that were in only one list, such as from the ease with which signs might be contrived to ask them, were thought little less certain than the others. Wajiji, the head. Morgi, the hair, Melcia, the ears, Yembi, the lips, Banju, the nose, Anjar, the tongue, Walar, the beard, Dambu, the neck, Kayo, the nipples, Tulpur, the navel, Mangal, the hands, Koman, the thighs, Pongo, the knees, Edamal, the feet, Nioror, the heel, Chumal, the sole, Tongarn, the ankle, Mi Anang, fire, Walba, a stone, Yowal, sand, Gurkha, a rope, Bama, a man, Poinja, a male turtle, Mami Ingo, a female, Maragan, a canoe, Palenyo, to paddle, Takai, set down, Mi Erbarar, smooth, Garambi, blood, Yoku, wood, Tapul, bone and nose, Charngala, a bag, Koki, the nails, Galan, the sun, Chur, Churko, Yerka, Tut, 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 Tut. Expressions may be of admiration, which they continually used while in company with us. They very often used the article G, which seems to answer to our English A, as G Gurkha, a rope. End of section 45. Part 3. Of some account of that part of New Holland called New South Wales. Section 46 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771 By Joseph Banks This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan Section 46 September, 1770 1770, September 1 Distant as the land was, a very fragrant smell came off from it really in the morn, with the little breeze which blew right off shore. It resembled much the smell of blue Benjamin. As the sun gathered power, it died away, and was no longer smelt. All the latter part of the day, we had calms or light winds round all the compass, the weather at the same time being most intolerably hot. 1770, September 2. Fresh breeze again at east. In the morn, the sweet smell of yesterday was observed, 
though in a much smaller degree. In the even it was almost calm, and again intensely hot. 1770, September 3. After having sailed all night along shore with a brisk breeze, we found ourselves in the morn not far from it. It appeared as it had done whenever we had seen it before, uncommonly flat and low, not having so much as a slope in any part, the whole one grove of trees, very thick and pleasant to all appearance. This was the sixth day we had now coasted along, still upon the same bank of mud, which by its shoalness prevented our approaches near enough to make going ashore convenient. This delay and the loss of so many days fair wind, when we well knew the southeast monsoon was nearly at an end, was irksome to us all. It was therefore resolved to run the ship in as near at the shore as possible, and then send off the pinnace, which might go ashore while the ship plied off and on, and learn whether the produce of the country or the usage she might meet with from the inhabitants would be such as might induce us to search farther. We accordingly stood right in shore, and at half-past eight had less than three fathom water five or six miles from the shore. The captain, Dr. Salander, and myself, with the boat's crew and my servants, consisting in all of twelve men well armed, went in her, and rowed directly toward the shore, but could not get nearer than about two hundred yards, on account of the shallowness of the water. We quickly, however, got out of the boat and waded ashore, leaving two in her to take care of her. We had no sooner landed than we saw the prints of naked feet upon the mud below high water mark, which convinced us that the Indians were not far off, though we had seen yet no signs of any. The nature of the country made it necessary for us to be very much upon our guard. The close, thick wood, came down to within less than one hundred yards of the water, and therefore so near might the Indians come without our seeing them, and should they by numbers overpower us, a retreat to the boat was impossible, as she was so far from the shore. We proceeded therefore with much caution, looking carefully about us, myself and the doctor, looking for plants at the edge of the wood, and the rest walking along the beach. In about two hundred yards from our landing, we came to a grove of coconut trees, of a very small growth, but well hung with fruit, standing upon the banks of a small brook of brackish water. Near them was a small shed, hardly half covered with coconut leaves, in and about which were infinite coconut shells, some quite fresh. We stayed under these trees some time, admiring and wishing for the fruit, but as none of us could climb, it was impossible to get even one, so we even left them and proceeded in search of anything else which might occur. We soon found plantains and a single breadfruit tree, but neither of these had any fruit on them. So we proceeded, and had got about a quarter of a mile from the boat, when on a sudden three Indians rushed out of the woods with a hideous shout, about one hundred yards beyond us, and running towards us. The foremost threw something out of his hand, which flew on one side of him, and burned exactly like gunpowder. The other two immediately threw two darts at us, on which we fired. The most of our guns were loaded with small shot, which at the distance they were from us I suppose they hardly felt for they moved not at all, but immediately threw a third dart, on which we loaded and fired again. Our balls, I suppose, this time, fell near them, but none of them were materially hurt, as they ran away with great alacrity. From this specimen of the people we immediately concluded that nothing was to be got here but by force, which would of course be attended with destruction to many of these poor people, whose territories we had certainly no right to invade, either as discoverers or people in real want of provisions. We therefore resolved to go in our boat and leave entirely this coast to some aftercomer who might have either time or better opportunities to gain the friendship of its inhabitants. Before we had got abreast of her, however, we saw the two people in her make signals to us that more Indians were coming along shore, and before we had got into the water, we saw them come round a point, about five hundred yards from us. They had met, probably, the three who first attacked us, for on seeing us they halted, and seemed to wait till the main body should come up, nor did they come nearer us all the while we waited to her. They continued, however, with their fire to defy us, and shouted very loud. When we were embarked and afloat, we rowed towards them, and fired some muskets over their heads into the trees, on which they walked gradually off, continuing to throw abundance of their fires, whatever they might be designed for. We guessed their numbers to be about one hundred. After we had looked at them and their behavior, as long as we chose, we returned to the ship, where our friends had suffered much anxiety for our sakes, imagining the fires thrown by the Indians were real muskets, so much did they resemble the fire and smoke made by the firing of one. 
The place where we landed we judged to be near Cabo de la Colta de Santa Bonaventura, as it is called in the French charts, about nine or ten leagues to the southward of Cure Weir. We were not ashore upon the whole more than two hours, so cannot be expected to have made many observations. The soil had all the appearance of the highest fertility, but was covered with a prodigious quantity of trees, which seemed to thrive luxuriantly. Notwithstanding this, the coconut trees bore very small fruit, and the plantains did not seem very thriving. The only breadfruit tree that we saw, however, was very large and healthy. There was very little variety of plants. We saw only twenty-three species, every one of which was known to us, except perhaps the first and second may prove upon comparison to be different from many of the species of Cyperus we have still undetermined from New Holland. Had we had axes to cut down the trees, or could we have ventured into the woods, we should doubtless have found more, but we had only an opportunity of examining the beach and edge of the wood. I am of opinion, however, that the country does not abound in variety of species, as I have been in no one before, where I could not, on a good soil, have gathered more by far, with the same time and opportunity. Here follows the list. Cyperus, dot, dot, dot. Eugenia butonica, misker. Comerlina communis, lin. Vitex trifolia, lin. Convolvulus brasiliensis, lin. Hibiscus tiliaceus, lin. Solanum nigrum, lin. Lysini speciosa, misker. Morinda citrifolia, lin. Dolichos giganteus, misker. Catea taca, misker. Abrus precatorius, lin. Lobelia plumierii, lin. Hediserum umbellatum, lin. Arum macroisum, lin. Cetodium altili, misker. Qua lacrima jobi, lin. Casuarina equisetifolia, misker. Willandina bonducella, lin. Massa paradisiaca, lin. Cocos nucifera, lin. The people, as well as we could judge, were nearly of the same color as the New Hollanders, some though rather lighter. They were certainly stark naked. Their arms that they made use of against us were very light, ill-made darts of bamboo cane, pointed with hard wood, in which were many barbs. They may be shot them with bows, but I am of opinion that they threw them with a stick, something in the manner of the New Hollanders. They came beyond us about sixty yards, but not in a point-blank direction. Besides these, many among them, maybe a fifth part of the whole, had in their hands a short piece of stick, maybe a hollow cane, which they swung sideways from them, and immediately fire flew from it, perfectly resembling the flash and smoke of a musket, and of no longer duration. For what purpose this was done is far above my guessing. They had with them several dogs who ran after them, in the same manner as ours do in Europe. The house or shed that we saw was very mean and poor. It consisted of four stakes, drove into the ground, two being longer than the other two. Over these were laid coconut leaves loose, and not half enough to cover it. By the cutting of these stakes, as well as of the arrows or darts, which they threw at us, we concluded that they had no iron among them. As soon as ever the boat was hoisted in, we made sail, and steered away from this land, to the no small satisfaction of, I believe, three-fourths of our company. The sick being well, and the melancholy looked gay. The greatest part of them were now pretty far gone with the longing for home, which the physicians have gone so far as to esteem a disease under the name of nostalgia. Indeed, I can find hardly anybody in the ship clear of its effects but the captain, Dr. Sullender, and myself. Indeed, we three have pretty constant employment for our minds, which I believe to be the best, if not the only remedy for it. 1770, September 4. Brisk trade and fine weather. The altered countenances of our common people were still more perceivable than they were yesterday. Two-thirds allowance had, I believe, made the chief difference with them, for our provisions were now so much wasted by keeping that that allowance was little more than was necessary to keep life and soul together. 1770, September 5. During last night a low island was seen, and in the morn another, of a flat appearance but tolerably high. We supposed that these might be the Arrow Islands, as the latitude agreed very well, but if they were these isles, must be far nearer the coast of New Guinea than any of our drafts place them. Many very large blubbers, medusas, were seen, also eggbirds, bonitos, and one turtle. In the eve we deepened our water to fifty fathom, and saw then some small mother carries chickens, Procellaria frigata, about us, 
which we always have looked upon as a mark of being a good distance from the land. We saw also a man of war bird, many nectrices and gannets. Towards night a booby settled on our rigging and was caught, the first we have met with in the voyage. 1770, September 6. Pleasant trade. Our water deepened to 180 fathom. A tropic bird and two black and white gannets seen about the ship. At noon, a large high island was in sight, possibly Timor land, though if so, the charts have laid it down much too far to the southward. The supposition of its being so made us think of Timor, which had been visited by our countryman Dampier. This, though, made home recur to my mind stronger than it had done throughout the whole voyage. The distance I now conceived to be nothing very great. 1770, September 7. Trade as brisk and pleasant as ever. Infinite flying fish about the ship. Some nectrices and man-of-war birds. Many gannets also seen. At night, two boobies were caught. 1770, September 8. Much less wind today. Many gannets and boobies were seen. At night, two of the latter were taken. 1770, September 9. Light breezes and almost calm. Myself, in my small boat, a shooting killed three dozen of boobies and gannets. The last proved to be the Pelicanus piscator of Linnaeus. At night, a strong appearance of very high land was observed to the westward, which caused many different opinions. The seamen, however, in general, insisted on its being clouds, an opinion which its unusual height above the horizon, considered with respect to the faintness with which it appeared, seemed much to favor. 1770, September 10, quite calm. The appearance of land to the west was again seen, and most of the seamen, by it convinced that it really was such. Some, however, still held to their former opinion. Many dolphins were about the ship, and one shark was caught at sunset. The land appeared again in exactly the same place, which at last convinced our most sturdy unbelievers. 1770, September 11. By daybreak in the morn another shark was caught. The two together, weighing 126 pound, were served to the ship's company, and every man in her, I may venture to affirm, from the captain to the swabber, dined heartily upon it. Many smokes ashore. 1770, September 12. As soon as the light was pretty clear, the land again appeared, five or six leagues off. By seven the wind came to west, so we stood in for it. It was very high, rising in gradual slopes from the hills, which were in great measure covered with thick woods. Among them, however, we could distinguish bare spots of a large extent, which at least looked as if cleared by art. Many fires were also seen on all parts of the hills, some very high up. At nightfall, we were within one and one-half miles of the beach, just abreast of a little inlet. The country seemed to answer very well the description which Dampier has given of Timor, the land close to the beach being covered with high spiring trees, which he likens to pines, casuarina, behind which was great appearance of saltwater creeks and many mangroves. In parts, however, were many coconut trees close down to the beach. The flat land seemed to reach in some places two or three miles before the rise of the first hill. We saw no appearance of plantations or houses near the sea, but the land looked most fertile, and from the many fires we had seen in different parts, we could not help having a good opinion of its population. 1770, September 13. With the wind as foul as ever, we continued to ply along shore not gaining much, and being too far off to see anything but large fires, of which were several ashore. Our croakers began now to talk of the westerly monsoon, and say that they had sometime thought that the unusual briskness of the trade wind, for some days before we fell in with this island, was a sure prognostic of it. 1770, September 14. Our westerly wind still continued, and we plied with our usual success. Infinite albacores and bonitos were about the ship attended, as they always are when near land, by some species of sterna. These were Dampier's New Holland noddies, which flew in large flocks hovering over the shoals of fish. Many man-of-war birds also attended, and entertained us by very frequently stooping at albacores so large that twenty times their strength could not have lifted them, had they been dexterous enough to seize them, which they never once effected. 1770, September 15. Wind came fair today, and left our melancholy ones to search for some new occasion of sorrow. There was much less of it than we could have wished, and yet enough to alter the appearance of the country very sensibly. 
The island was now hilly, though not near so high as it had been. The hills in general came quite down to the sea, and where they did not, instead of flats and mangrovey land, were immense groves of coconut trees. About a mile up from the beach began the plantations and houses, almost innumerable, standing under the shade of large groves of palms, appearing like fan palm, barassus. The plantations, which were in general enclosed with some kind of fence, reached almost to the tops of the hills, but near the beach were no certain marks of habitation seen. But what surprised us most was that, notwithstanding all these indisputable marks of populous country, we saw neither people nor any kind of cattle stirring all day, though our glasses were almost continually employed. 1770, September 16. Trade rather fresher than yesterday. Soon after breakfast, the small island of Rota was in sight, and soon after the opening appeared plain, which at last convinced our old unbelievers that the island we had so long been off was really Timor. Soon after dinner we passed the straits. The island of Rota was not mountainous or high like Timor, but consisted of hills and vales. On the east end of it, some of our people saw houses, but I did not. The north side had frequent sandy beaches, near which grew some few of the fan palm, but the greatest part was covered with a kind of brushy trees, which had few or no leaves upon them. The opening between Timor and the island called by Dampier, Anabao, we plainly saw which appeared narrow, and about itself looked much like Timor, only was rather less high. We saw on it no signs of cultivation, but as it was misty and we were well on the other side of the straits, which we judged to be five leagues over, we saw it but very indifferently. Off the western end of it was a small low sandy island covered with trees. Before night, however, we had left all behind us. About ten o'clock a phenomenon appeared in the heavens, in many things, resembling the aurora borealis, but differing materially in others. It consisted of a dull reddish light, reaching in height about twenty degrees above the horizon. Its extent was very different at different times, but never less than eight or ten points of the compass. Through and out of this passed rays of a brighter colored light, tending directly upwards. These appeared and vanished nearly in the same time, as those of the aurora borealis, but were entirely without the trembling or vibratory motion observed in that phenomenon. The body of it bore from the ship south-south-east. It lasted as bright as ever till near twelve, when I went down to sleep, but how much longer I cannot tell. 1770, September 17. In the morn an island in sight, very imperfectly, if it all laid down in the charts. By ten we were very near the east end of it, it was not high, but composed of gently sloping hills and vales, almost entirely cleared, and covered with innumerable palm trees. Near the beach were many houses, but no people were seen stirring. Soon after we passed the northeast point, and saw on the beach a large flock of sheep, but still no people. The north side of the isle appeared scarce at all cultivated, but like that of Rota, covered with thick brushwood, almost or quite destitute of leaves. Among these, as we passed along, we saw numerous flocks of sheep, but no houses or plantations. At last, one was discovered in a grove of coconut trees, and it was resolved to send a boat in order to attempt a commerce with people who seemed so well able to supply our many necessities. The ship plied off and on, and a lieutenant went. Before he returned, we saw on the hills two men on horseback, who seemed to ride as for their amusement, often looking at the ship a circumstance which made us at once conclude that there were Europeans among the islanders by whom we should be received at least more politely than we were used to by uncivilized Indians. After a very short stay he returned, bringing word that he had seen Indians, in all respects as color dress, etc., much resembling the Malays, that they very civilly invited him ashore and conversed with him by signs, but neither party could understand the other. They were totally unarmed except for knives, which they wore in their girdles, and had with them a jackass, a sure sign that Europeans had been among them. In plying off and on, we had had no ground, though very near a coral shoal, which ran off from the island, so had no hopes of anchorage here. It was therefore resolved that we should go to the lee side of the island, in hopes there to find a bank. In the meantime, however, the boat, with some truck, should go ashore at the coconut grove in hopes to purchasing some trifle refreshments for the sick, in case we should be disappointed. It accordingly put off, and Dr. Solander went in it. 
Before it reached the shore we saw two new horsemen, one of whom had on a complete European dress, blue coat, white waistcoat, and laced hat. These, as the boat lay ashore, seemed to take little notice of her, but only sauntered about looking much at the ship. Many more horsemen, however, and still more footmen gathered round our people, who were ashore, and we had the satisfaction of seeing several coconuts brought into the boat, a sure sign that peace and plenty reigned ashore. After a stay of about an hour and a half, the boat made a signal of having had intelligence of a harbour to the leeward, and we in consequence bore away for it. The boat, following soon, came on board and told us that the people had behaved in an uncommonly civil manner, that they had seen some of their principal people, who were dressed in fine linen and had chains of gold round their necks, that they had not been able to trade, the owner of the coconut trees not being there, but had got about two dozen of coconuts, given as a present by these principal people, who accepted of linen in return, and made them plainly understand by drawing a map upon the sand, that on the lee side of the island was a bay, in which we might anchor, near a town, and buy sheep, hogs, fruit, fowls, etc. They talked much of the Portuguese, and of Larntuca on the Isle of Endi, from which circumstance it was probable that the Portuguese were somewhere on the island, though none of the natives could speak more than a word or two of the language, and the more so, as one of the Indians, in speaking of the town, made a sign of something we could see there, which would show us that we were right, by crossing his fingers, which a Portuguese, who was in the boat, immediately interpreted into a cross, a supposition that appeared very probable, that just before they put off, the man in a European dress came toward them, but the officer in the boat, not having his commission about him, thought proper to put off immediately, without staying to speak to him, or know what country man he was. We sailed along shore, and after having passed a point of land, found a bay sheltered from the trade wind, in which we soon discovered a large Indian town or village, on which we stood in hoisting a jack on the foretop mast head. Soon after, to our no small surprise, Dutch colors were hoisted in town, and three guns fired. We, however, proceeded, and just at dark got soundings, and anchored about one and one-half miles from the shore. 1770, September 18. In the moor in the boat, with the second lieutenant, went ashore, and was received by a guard of twenty or thirty Indians armed with muskets, who conducted him to the town about a mile in the country, marching without any order or regularity, and carrying away with them Dutch colors, which had been hoisted upon the beach opposite to where the ship lay. Here he was introduced to the Raja, or Indian king, who he told by a Portuguese interpreter that we were an English man-of-war, who had been long at sea, and had many sick on board, for whom we wanted to purchase such refreshments as the island afforded. He answered that he was willing to supply us with everything we should want, but being in alliance with the Dutch East Indian Company, he was not allowed to trade with any other people without their consent, which, however, he would immediately apply for, to a Dutchman belonging to that company, who was the only white man residing upon the island. A letter was accordingly dispatched immediately, and after some hours waiting answered by the man in person, who assured him with many civilities that we were at liberty to buy of the natives whatever we pleased. He expressed a desire of coming on board, as well as the king, and several of his attendants, provided, however, that some of our people might stay on shore, on which two were left, and about two they arrived. Our dinners were ready, and they readily agreed to dine with us. At setting down, however, the king excused himself, saying that he did not imagine that we, who were white men, would suffer him who was black to set down in our company. A compliment, however, removed his scruples, and he and his prime minister sat down and eat sparingly. During all dinner we received many professions of friendship from both the king and the European, who was a native of Saxony by the name of Johann Christopher Lange. Mutton was our fare. The king expressed a desire of having an English sheep. We had one left, which was presented to him. An English dog was then asked for, and my greyhound presented to him. Mynheer Lange then hinted that a spying glass would be acceptable, and was immediately presented with one. We were told that the island abounded in buffaloes, sheep, hogs, and fowls, all which should the next day be drove down to the beach, and we might buy any quantity of them. This agreeable intelligence put us all into high spirits, and the liquor went about full as much as either Mynheer Lange or the Indians could bear, who, however, expressed a desire of going away before they were quite drunk. They were received upon deck, as they had been when they came on board, by the Marines under arms. 
the king expressed a desire of seeing them exercise, which accordingly they did, and fired three rounds, much to his majesty's satisfaction, who expressed great surprise particularly at their so speedily cocking their guns, which he expressed by striking a stick upon the side of the ship, saying that all the locks made but one click. Dr. Solander and myself went ashore in the boat with them. As soon as we put off, they saluted the ship with three cheers, which the ship answered with five guns. We landed, and walked up to the town, which consisted of a good many houses, some tolerably large, each being a roof of thatch covering a boarded floor, supported by pillars three or four feet from the ground. Before we had been long there, it began to grow dark, and we returned on board, having only just tasted their palm wine, which had a very sweet taste, and suited all our palates very well, giving us at the same time hopes that it might be serviceable to our sick, as being the fresh and unfermented juice of the tree, it promised antiscorbutic virtues. 1770, September 19. Savu reached. In the morn we went ashore and proceeded immediately to the house of assembly, a large house which we had yesterday mistaken for the king's palace. This, as well as two or three more in the town, or negri as the Indians called it, had been built by the Dutch East Indian Company. They are distinguished from the rest by two pieces of wood, one at each end of the ridge of the house, resembling cow's horns. Undoubtedly the thing designed by the Indian, who on the 17th made a sign of the mark, by which we were to know the town by crossing his fingers, which our Catholic Portuguese interpreted into a cross, from whence chiefly we were assured that the settlement was originally Portuguese. In this house of assembly we met Mynheer Lange and the Raja Amadojo Lomijara, attended by many of the principal people. We told them that we had in the boat an assortment of what few goods we had to truck with, and desired leave to bring them ashore, which was immediately granted, and orders given accordingly. We then attempted to settle the price of buffaloes, sheep, hogs, etc., which were to be paid in money. But here Mynheer Lange left us, and told us that we must settle that with the natives, who would bring down large quantities to the beach. By this time the morning was pretty far advanced, and we, resolving not to go on board and eat salt meat, when such a profusion of fresh was continually talked of, petitioned his majesty that we might have liberty to purchase a small hog, some rice, etc., and employ his subjects to cook them for our dinner. He answered that if we could eat victuals dressed by his subjects, which he could hardly suppose, he would do himself the honour of entertaining us. We expressed our gratitude and sent immediately on board for liquors. About five o'clock dinner was ready, consisting of thirty-six dishes, or rather baskets, containing alternately rice and boiled pork, and three earthenware bowls of soup, or rather the broth, in which the pork had been boiled. These were ranged on the floor, and mats laid round them, for us to set upon. We were now conducted by turns to a hole in the floor, near which stood a man, with a basket of water in his hand. Here we washed our hands, and then ranged ourselves in order, round the victuals, waiting for the king to sit down. We were told, however, that the custom of the country was that the entertainer never sits down to meet with his guests. However, if we suspected the victuals to be poisoned, he would willingly do it. We suspected nothing, and therefore desired that all things might go as usual. All then sitting down, we eat with good appetites, the Prime Minister and Mynheer Lange partaking with us. Our wine passed briskly about, the Raja alone refusing to drink with us, saying that it was wrong for the master of the feast to be in liquor. The pork was excellent, the rice as good, the broth not bad. The spoons only, which were made of leaves, were so small that few of us had patience to eat it. Everyone, however, made a hearty dinner, and as soon as we had done, removed, as the custom it seemed was, to let the servants and seamen take our places. These could not dispatch all, but when the women came to take away, they forced them to take away with them all the pork that was left. Before dinner, Mynheer Lange had mentioned to us a letter which he had in the morning received from the governor of Timor. The particulars of it were now discussed. It acquainted him that a ship had been seen off that island and had steered from thence towards that which we were now upon. In case such ship was to touch there in any distress, she was to be supplied with what she wanted, but was not to be allowed to make any stay more than was necessary, and was particularly required not to take any large presents to the interior people, or to leave any with the principal ones to be distributed among them after he was gone. This, we were told, did not at all extend to the beads or other small pieces of cloth 
which we gave the natives in return for their small civilities, as bringing us palm wine, etc. Some of our gentlemen were of opinion that the whole of this letter was an imposition, but whether it was or not I shall not take upon myself to determine. In the evening we had intelligence from our trading place that no buffaloes or hogs had been brought down, a few sheep only, which were taken away before our people who had sent for money could procure it. Some few fowls, however, were brought, in a large quantity of a kind of syrup, made from the juice of the palm tree, which, though infinitely superior to molasses or treacle, sold at a very small price. We complained to Mynheer Lange. He said that as we had not ourselves been down upon the beach, the natives were afraid to take money of any one else, lest it should be false. On this the captain went immediately down, but could see no cattle. While he was gone, Mr. Lange complained that our people had yet offered no gold for anything. This, he said, the islanders were displeased at, who had expected to have gold for their stock. End of section 46 September 1770, Part 1section forty seven of the endeavour journal of sir joseph banks journal from twenty five august seventeen sixty eight to twelve july seventeen seventy one by joseph banks this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan section forty seven seventeen seventy september twenty accounts of savu and islands near savu in the morning early the captain went ashore himself to purchase buffaloes he was shown two one of which they valued at five guineas the other a musket he offered three guineas for the one and sent for a musket to give for the other the money was flatly refused and before the musket could be brought off dr sullender who had been up at the town in order to speak to mr lange returned followed by eighty-six spearmen and twenty musketeers sent by the king to tell us that this day and no more would be allowed us to trade after which we must be gone. This was the message that Dr. Solander had from the Raja, by Mr. Lange's interpretation. But a Portuguese Indian, who came from Timor, probably next in command to Mr. Lange, carried it farther, telling us that we might stay ashore till night if we pleased, but none of the natives would any more be allowed to trade with us, after which he began to drive away those who had brought hens, syrup, etc. To remedy this, an old sword, which lay in the boat was given to the prime minister, as I have called him, Manu Jami, who in an instant restored order and severely chid the officer of the guard, an old Portuguese Indian, for having gone beyond their orders. Trade now was as brisk as ever. Fowls and syrup were bought cheap, and in vast plenty. But now we will see what treatment Dr. Solander met with in the town. In the morn, when he'd arrived there, it was a long time before he could find the Raja. At last, however, he did, and received many civilities from him. Mr. Lange was, however, not to be found, so no conversation could pass, for want of an interpreter. After some time a number of men came, and taking their arms ranged themselves in the yard. The Raja then appeared cross, but showed nothing but civility to the doctor. One of our servants, who was trading now, came into the yard, having a garter tied over his shoulder, for which he asked a cock. The Raja went to him and asked him for it. He, ignorant of his quality, refused unless he had a cock, on which he was ordered to be turned out of the yard, as were all our people, but the doctor, who still was in the assembly house totally ignorant of what was going on. The Raja, however, now told him that Mr. Lange was at such a house, a hint to be gone, but which was not taken as such, for the doctor wanted nothing so much as to see Mr. Lange, and consequently went directly to him. Mr. Lange returned to the Raja's with him, and told him that the people were almost in rebellion on account of the Raja's permitting us to trade with goods instead of money, and that this day was positively the last on which we could be allowed to do so, that he was much offended also at the servant who had refused the garter. These stories were too ridiculous to be taken much notice of, therefore he still stayed in hopes of learning something more. The guards were ordered to exercise, which they did clumsily enough with their spears. The doctor, pleased with the sight, desired he might see the exercise of their sabres also, you had better not desire it, said the Dutchman. The people are very much enraged. Now the doctor found Mr. Lange's intention, which was to frighten him and us. It, however, had no part of the designed effect. We were too well convinced that both king and people desired nothing so much as to trade with us, to regard these political menaces. The doctor, however, set out for the beach, in order to tell us who were there, 
the state of the case, and with him came this formidable troop, who behaved as before mentioned. The state of the case appeared now plain. Mr. Longa was to have a share of what the buffaloes were sold for, and that share was to be paid in money. The captain, therefore, though sore against his will, resolved to pay five guineas apiece for one or two buffaloes, and tried to buy the rest for muskets. Accordingly, no sooner had he hinted his mind to the Portuguese Indian than a buffalo was brought down, but a very small one, and five guineas given for it. Two or more larger followed immediately, for one of which a musket, and the other five guineas was given. There is now no more occasion for money. Two large herds of buffaloes were brought down, and we picked them, just as we chose, for a musket apiece. We bought nine, as many we thought as would last us to Batavia, especially as we had little or no victuals, but so ill were we provided with cords, the three of the nine broke from us. Two of these the Indians recovered, but a third got quite off, though our people assisted by the Indians followed him three hours. In the evening Mr. Longa came down to the beach, softened by the money which no doubt he had received. He who was in the morn as sour as verjuice was now all sweetness and softness. The doctor who spoke German but little was loth to mention to him any of the transactions of the morning. He, however, took frequent occasions of letting us know that if we pleased, we might come ashore the next day. Our business was, however, quite done, so, to fulfill a promise we had made, he was presented with a small keg of beer, and we took our leave, as good friends as possible. The refreshments we got consisted of eight buffaloes, thirty dozen of fowls, six sheep, three hawks, some few but very few limes and coconuts, a little garlic, a good many eggs, above half of which were rotten, an immense quantity of syrup, which was bought for trifles, several hundred gallons at least, upon the whole more than livestock enough to carry us to Batavia, and syrup for futurity. I have been very diffuse and particular in mentioning every trifling circumstance which occurred in this transaction, as this may perhaps be the only opportunity I shall ever have of visiting an island of great consequence to the Dutch, and scarce known to any other Europeans even by name. I can find it in only one of the drafts, and that an old one printed by Mountain Page, the Lord knows when, which has it by the name of Sue, but confounds it with Sandal Bosch, which is laid down very wrong. Rumphius mentioned an island by the name of Sao, and says it is that which is called by the Dutch Sandal Bosch, but no chart that I have seen lays either that, Timor, or Rata, or indeed any island that we have seen hereabouts in anything near its right place. While we were here, an accident happened, by the imprudence of Mr. Parkinson, my draughtsman, which might alone have altered our intended, and first promised reception very much. Indeed, I am of opinion that it did. He, desirous of knowing whether or not this island produced spices, carried ashore with him nutmeg, cloves, etc., and questioned the inhabitants about them, without the least precaution, so that it immediately came to Mr. Longa's ears. He complained to the doctor that our people were too inquisitive, particularly, he says, in regard to spices, concerning which they can have no reason to wish for any information, unless you are wished to come, for very different purposes than those you pretend. The doctor, not well versed in the German language in which they conversed, immediately conceived that Mr. L. meant only the questions which he himself had asked concerning the cinnamon, nor did we ever know the contrary till the day after we had left the place, when Mr. Parkinson boasted of the knowledge he had got of these people, certainly having a knowledge of the spices, as they had in language names for them. I shall now proceed to give such an account of the island as I could get together during our stay, which short as it was was so taken up with procuring refreshments, in which occupation every one was obliged to exert himself, that very little, I confess, is from my own observation. Almost everything is gathered from the conversation of Mr. Longa, who at first and last was very free and open, and I am inclined to believe did not deceive us in what he told us, how much soever he might conceal except perhaps in the strength and warlike disposition of the islanders, which account seems to contradict itself, as one can hardly imagine those people to be of a warlike disposition, who have continued in peacetime out of mind. As for the other islands in this neighborhood, his information alone was all we had to go upon. I would not, however, neglect to set it down, though in general it was of little more consequence than to confirm the policy of the Dutch in confining their spices to particular isles, which being full of them cannot furnish themselves with provisions. The little island of Savu, which trifling as it appears to me to be of no consequence to the Dutch East India Company, 
is situate in latitude and longitude from the meridian of Greenwich. Its length and breadth are nearly the same, viz. about six German or twenty-four English miles. The whole is divided into five principalities. Negrias, as they are called by the Indians, La Ai, Siba, Regua, Timo, and Masara, each governed by its respective Raja or king. It has three harbors all good. The best is Timo, situate somewhere round the southeast point of the isle. The next, Siba, where we anchored, situate round the northwest point. The third we learnt neither the name or situation of, only guess it to be somewhere on the south side. Off the west end of the island is another called Pulo, with some additional name which in the hurry of business was forgot, and never asked for again. The appearance of the island, especially on the windward side where we first made it, was allowed by us all to equal in beauty if not excel anything we had seen, even parched up as it was by drought, which Mr. Longa informed us had continued for seven months without a drop of rain intervening, the last rainy season having entirely failed them. Verdure, indeed, there was at this time no sign as of. But the gentle sloping of the hills, which were cleared quite to the top, and planted in every part with thick groves of the fan-palm, besides woods almost of coconut trees and aricas, which grew near the seaside, filled the eye so completely that it hardly looked for or missed the verdure of the earth, a circumstance seldom seen in any perfection so near the line. How beautiful it must appear, when covered with its springing crop of maize, millet, indigo, etc., which covers almost every foot of ground in the civilized parts of the island, imagination can hardly conceive. The verdure of Europe, set of the stately pillars of India, palms, I mean, especially the fan palm, which for straightness and proportion, both of the stem to itself and the head of the stem, far excels all the palms that I have seen, requires a poetical imagination to describe, and mind not unacquainted with such sights, to conceive. The productions of this island are buffaloes, sheep, hogs, fowls, horses, asses, maize, guinea corn rice, calavances, limes, oranges, mangoes, plantains, watermelons, tamarinds, sweet sops, anona squamosa, bolimbi, everhoa bolimbi, besides coconuts and fan palm, which last is in sufficient quantities should all other crops fail to support the whole island, people, stock, and all, who have been at times obliged to live upon its sugar syrup and wine for some months. We saw also a small quantity of European garden herbs as celery, marjoram, fennel, and garlic, and one single sugar cane. Besides these necessaries, it has for the supply of luxury betel and areca, tobacco, cotton, indigo, and a little cinnamon, only planted for curiosity, said Mr. Lange. Indeed, I almost doubt whether or not it was genuine cinnamon, as the Dutch have always been so careful not to trust any spices out of their proper islands. Besides these were possibly many other things, which we had not an opportunity of seeing, and Mr. Longa forgot or did not choose to inform us. All their produce is in amazing abundance, so we judged at least from the plantations we saw, though this year every crop had failed for want of rain. Most of them are well known to European ones. I shall, however, spend a little ink in describing such as are not, or as differ at all in appearance from those commonly known. The buffaloes, of which they have good store, differ from our cattle in Europe, in their ears, which are considerably larger. Their skins, which are almost without hair, and their horns, which instead of bending forwards as ours do, bend directly backwards, and also in their total want of dewlaps. We saw of these some as big as well-sized European oxen, and some there must be larger. So at least I was led to believe by a pair of horns, which I measured, they were from tip to tip three feet, nine and one half, across their widest diameter four feet, one and one half, the whole sweep of their semicircle in front, seven feet, six and one half. One caution is, however, exceedingly necessary in buying these beasts, which is that one of them, of any given size, does not weigh above half as much as an ox of the same size in England. By this, we who were ignorant of the fact were very much deceived. Those which we guessed four hundred pound the larger sort that were bought, not weighing above 250, and the smaller, which we guessed at 250, not above 160. This vast difference proceeded first from total want of fat, of which there was not the least sign, but more especially from the thinness of the flanks and thin pieces which were literally nothing but skin and bone. Their flesh notwithstanding this was not bad. It was well tasted and full of gravy, not that I can put it upon a footing with the leanest beef in England, yet I should suppose it better than a lean ox would be in this burnt-up climate. 
Mr. Langer told us that when the Portuguese first came to this island, there were horses upon it, opinion from which I confess I rather apostatize, but to waive the dispute, horses are now very plentiful. They are small, generally eleven or twelve hands high, but very brisk and nimble, especially in pacing, which is their common step. The inhabitants seem to be tolerable horsemen, riding always without a saddle and generally with only a halter instead of a bridle. This is not, however, the only benefit that these islanders receive from them, for they use them as food and prefer their flesh to that of buffaloes and every other sort but swine's flesh, which holds the highest rank in their opinion. Their sheep are of that kind which I have seen in England under the name of Bengal sheep. They differ from ours in having hair instead of wool, in their ears being large and flapped down under their horns, almost straight, and in their noses which are much more arched than those of our European sheep. These sheep are, I believe, very frequently called cabritos, from their resemblance to goats, which, though I cannot say appeared to me at all striking, yet had such an effect upon the whole ship's company, officers and seamen, that not one would believe them to be sheep, till they heard their voices, which are precisely the same as those of European ones. Their flesh was like the buffalo's, lean and void of flavor, to me the worst mutton I have ever eat. Their fowls are chiefly of the game breed and large, but the eggs the smallest I have ever seen. Besides these animals, here are vast plenty of dogs, some cats and rats, and a few pigeons. I saw three or four pair. Nor are any of these animals exempted from furnishing their part towards the support of polyphagous man, except the rats, which alone they do not eat. Fish appear to us to be scarce. Indeed, it was but little valued by these islanders, none but the very inferior people ever eating it, and these only at the times when their duty or business required them to be down upon the sea beach. In this case, every man was furnished with a light casting net, which was girt round him and served for a part of his dress. With this he took any small fish that might happen to come into his way. Turtles are scarce. They are esteemed a good food, but are taken only seldom. Of the vegetables, most are well known. The sweet salt is a pleasant fruit, well known to the West Indians. Bolimbi alone is not mentioned by any voyage writer I have met with. It is a small oval fruit, thickest in the middle, and tapering a little to each end, three or four inches in length, and scarcely so large as a man's finger. The outside is covered with a very thin skin of a light green color, and in the inside are a few seeds disposed in the form of a star. Its flavor is light but very clean and pleasant acid. It cannot be eaten raw, but is said to be excellent in pickles. We stewed it and made sour sauce to our stews and bouilli, which was very grateful to the taste, and no doubt possessed no small share of antiscorbutic virtues. But what seems to be the genuine natural production of the island, and which they have in the greatest abundance, and take the most care of, is the fan palm, or toddy tree, Borassus flabellifera. Large groves of these trees are to be seen in all parts of the island, under which other crops as maize, indigo, etc. are planted, so that in reality they take up no more room, though they yield the treble advantage of fruit, liquor, and sugar, all but especially the last two in great profusion besides which the leaf serves to thatch their houses and to make baskets, umbrellas, or rather conical bonnets, cups, tobacco pipes, etc., etc. The fruit, which is least esteemed, is also the least plenty. It is a nut, about as big as a child's head, covered like a coconut with a fibrous coat, under which are three kernels, which must be eaten before they are ripe, otherwise they become too hard to chew. In their proper state they resemble a good deal in taste the kernel of an unripe coconut, and like them, probably afford but a washy nutriment. The excellence of the palm wine or toddy, which is drawn from this tree, however, makes ample amends for the poorness of the fruit. This is got by cutting the buds, which are to produce flowers, soon after their appearance, and tying under them a small basket made of the leaves of the same tree, into which the liquor drips, and must be collected by people who climb the trees for that purpose every morning and evening. This is the common drink of every one upon the island, and a very pleasant one, it was so to us, even at first, only rather too sweet. Its antiscorbutic virtues, as the fresh, unfermented juice of a tree, cannot be doubted. Notwithstanding that this liquor is the common drink of both rich and poor, who in the morning and evening drink nothing else, a much larger quantity is drawn off daily than is sufficient for that use. Of this they make a syrup, and a coarse sugar, both of which are far more agreeable to the taste than they appear to the sight. 
The liquor is called in the language of the island Dua or Duak, the syrup and sugar by one and the same name, Gula. It is exactly the same as the Jagara sugar on the continent of India, and prepared by only boiling down the liquor in earthenware pots till it is sufficiently thick. In appearance, it exactly resembles molasses or treacle, only it is considerably thicker. In taste, however, it much excels it, having instead of the abominable twang which treacle leaves in the mouth, only a little burnt taste, which was very agreeable to our palates. The sugar is of a reddish brown, but more clear tasted than any cane sugar I have tasted, which was not refined, resembling mostly brown sugar candy. The syrup seemed to be very wholesome, for though many of our people eat enormous quantities of it, it hurt nobody, only gently opening the body, and not as we feared, bringing on fluxes. Firewood is very scarce here. To remedy, therefore, that inconvenience as much as possible, they make use of a contrivance which is not unknown in Europe, though seldom practiced, but in camps. It is a burrow or pipe dug in the ground as long as convenient, generally about two yards and opened at each end. The one opening of this into which they put the fire is large, the other, which serves only to cause a draught, is much smaller. Immediately over this pipe, circular holes are dug, which reach quite down into it. In these, the earthen pots are set, about three to such a fire, which are large in the middle and taper towards the bottom, by which means the fire acts upon the large part of their surface. It is really marvellous to see with how small a quantity of fire they will keep these pots boiling, each of which contains eight or ten gallons. A palm leaf or dry stalk now and then is sufficient. Indeed, it seemed in the part of the island at least where we were that the palms alone supplied sufficient fuel, not only for boiling the sugar but for dressing all their victuals beside, all which are cooked by this contrivance. How many parts of England are there where this contrivance would be of material assistance to not only the poor but the better sort of people who daily complain of the dearness of fuel, a charge which this contrivance alone would doubtless diminish at least a third? But it is well known how averse the good people of England, especially of those degrees that may be supposed to be not above want, are to adopt any new custom which savours of parsimony. I have been told that this very method was proposed in the Gentleman's Magazine many years ago, but if not the book on board. Frazier, in his voyage to the South Sea, describes a contrivance of the Peruvian Indians upon much the same principles. Planche, 31, page 273 but his drawing and plan are difficult to understand, if not actually very faulty, and his description is nothing. The drawing may serve, however, to give an idea to a man who has never seen a thing of the kind. The syrup or gula which they make in this manner is so nourishing that Mr. Longa told us it alone fed and fattened their hogs, dogs, and fowls, and that even the men themselves could, and had sometimes, lived upon it alone for a long time, when by bad seasons or their destructive feasts which I shall mention by and by, they have been deprived of all other nourishment. We saw some of the swine upon this island, whose uncommon fatness surprised us, which very beasts we saw one evening served with their suppers, consisting of nothing but the outside husks of rice, and this syrup dissolved in water. And this, they told us, was their constant and only food. How far it may be found consonant to truth that sugar alone should have such nourishing qualities, I shall leave to others to determine. I have only accounts not experienced to favor that opinion. End of section 47. September 1770, Part 2. Accounts of Savu and Islands near Savu. Section 48 of the Endeavor Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 48. September 1770, Part 3. Accounts of Savu and Islands near Savu. Continued. The people of this island are rather under than over the middling size. The women especially, most of whom are remarkably short and generally squat built. Their color is well tinged with brown, in all ranks and conditions nearly the same in which particular they differ much from the inhabitants of the South Sea Isles, where the better sort of people are universally almost whiter than their inferiors. The men are rather well made, and seem to be active and nimble. Among them we observed a greater variety of features than usual. 
The women, on the other hand, are, as I said before, generally low and clumsy, are far from handsome, and have a kind of sameness of features among them, which might well account for the chastity of the men, for which virtue this island is said to be remarkable. The hair of both sexes is universally black and lank. The men wear it long and fastened upon the tops of their heads with a comb. The women have theirs also long, and tied behind into a kind of club, not very becoming. Both men and women dress in a kind of blue and white, clouded cotton cloth, which they manufacture themselves. Of this, two pieces, about two yards long, each, serve for a dress. One of these is worn round the middle. This the men wear pretty tight, it covering no lower than their backsides, but above making a kind of loose belt, in which they carry their knives, etc., and often many other things, so that it serves entirely the purpose of pockets. The other piece is tucked into this girdle, and reaching over the shoulders passes down to the girdle on the other side, so that by opening or folding it they can cover more or less of their bodies as they please. The arms, legs, and feet of both sexes are constantly bare, as are the heads of the women, which is their chief distinction by which, at once, they are known from the men, who always wear something wrapped round theirs, which, though small, is generally of the finest material they can procure. Many we saw had them of silk handkerchiefs, which seemed to be much in fashion. The distinction of the women's dress, except only the head, consists merely in the manner of wearing their cloths, which are of the same materials and in the same quantity as the men's. Their waist cloths reach down below their knees, and their body cloths are tied under their arms and over their breasts, keeping up the strictest decency. Both sexes eradicate the hair from under their armpits, custom in these hot climates almost essential to cleanliness. The men also pluck out their beards, for which purpose the better sort carry always a pair of silver pincers hanging round their necks. Some, however, wear a little hair on their upper lips, but that they never suffer to grow long. Ornaments they had many. Some of the better sort wore gold chains round their necks, but these were chiefly made of plaited wire of little value. Others had rings, which by their appearance seemed to have been worn out some generations ago. One had a silver-headed cane, on the top of which was engraved, so that it had probably been a present from the East India Company. Besides these, they wore beads, the men, chiefly of distinction, round their necks, in the form of a solitaire. Others had them round their wrists, etc. But the women had the largest quantity, which they wore round their waists, in the form of a girdle, serving to keep up their waistcloths. Both sexes have their ears bored universally, but we never saw any ornaments in them. Indeed, we never saw any one man dressed the whole time we were there in anything more than his ordinary cloths. Some boys, of twelve or fourteen years of age, were also circles of thick brass wire, which passed screw fashion three or four times round their arms above the elbow, and some men wore rings of ivory, convex, two inches in breadth, and above an inch in thickness, in the same manner above the joint of the elbow. These, we were told, were the sons of Rajas, who alone had the privilege of wearing these cumbersome badges of high birth. Almost all the men had their names traced upon their arms in indelible characters of black. The women had a square ornament of flourished lines, on the inner part of each arm, just under the bend of the elbow. On inquiring into the antiquity of this custom, so consonant with that of tattooing in the South Sea Islands, Mr. Long had told us that it was among these people, long before the Europeans came here, but was less used in this than in most islands in the neighborhood, in some of which the people used to mark circles round their necks, breasts, etc., both sexes are continually employed in chewing betel and arec, the consequence of which is that their teeth, as long as they have any, are dyed of that filthy black color which constantly attends the rottenness of a tooth. For it appears to me that from their first use of this custom, which they begin very young, their teeth are affected and continue by gradual degrees to waste away till they are quite worn to the stumps, which seems to happen before old age." I have seen men in appearance between twenty and thirty, whose four teeth were almost entirely gone, no two being of the same length or the same thickness, but every one eat into unevennesses as iron is by rust. This loss of the teeth is attributed by all whose writings upon the subject I have read to the tough and stringy coat of the areca nut, but in my opinion is much easier accounted for by the well-known corrosive quality of the lime, which is a necessary ingredient in every mouthful and that, too, in no insignificant quantity. This opinion seems to me to be almost put out of dispute by the manner in which their teeth are destroyed. 
they are not loosened or drawn out, as they should be by the too frequent labour of chewing tough substances, but melt away and decay, as metals in strong acids. The stumps always remaining firmly adhering to the jaws, just level with the gums. Possibly the ill effects which sugar is believed by us Europeans to have upon the teeth may proceed from the same cause, as it is well known that refined or loaf sugar contains in it a large quantity of lime. To add flavor, I suppose, to the betel and arec, some use with it a small quantity of tobacco, adding the nauseous smell of that herb to the not less disagreeable look of the other, as if they were resolved to make their mouths disgustful to the sense of smelling as well as that of sight. They also smoke, rolling up a small quantity of tobacco in one end of a tube made of a palm leaf about as thick as a quill and six inches long. Of this, not above one inch is filled with tobacco, so that the quantity is very small. To make amends for which the women especially often swallow the smoke, which no doubt increases its effects in no small degree. Their houses are all built upon one and the same plan, differing only in size according to the rank and riches of the proprietors, some being three or four hundred feet in length, and others not twenty. They consist of a well-boarded floor raised upon the posts, three or four feet from the ground. Over this is raised a roof, shelving like ours in Europe, and supported by pillars of its own independent of the floor. The eaves of this reach within two feet of the floor, but overhang it as much. This open serves to let in air and light, and makes them very cool and agreeable. The space within is generally divided into two by a partition which takes off one third. From this partition forward reaches a loft, shut up close on all sides, and raised about six feet from the ground, which occupies the centre third of the house. Besides this are sometimes one or two small rooms taken off to the sides of the house. The uses of these different apartments we did not learn, only were told that the loft was appropriated to the women. The shortness of our stay and few opportunities we had of going among these people gave us no opportunities of seeing what arts or manufactures they might have among them. That they spin, weave, and dye their cloth, we however made a shift to learn, for though we never saw them practice any of these arts, yet the instruments of them accidentally fell in our way. First, a machine for clearing cotton of its seeds, which was made in miniature, much upon the same principles as ours in Europe. It consisted of two cylinders, about as thick as a man's thumb, the one of which was turned round by a plain winch handle, and that turned the other round by an endless worm at their extremities. The hole was not above seven inches high, and about twice as long. How it answered I know not, but know that it had been much worked, and that there were many pieces of cotton hanging on different parts of it, which alone induced me to believe it a real machine. Otherwise, from its slightness, I should have taken it for no more than a Dutch toy of the best sort. Their spinning gear I also once saw. It consisted of a bobbin, on which a small quantity of thread was wound, and a kind of distaff filled with cotton, from whence I conjecture that they spin by hand, as our women in Europe did before wheels were introduced, and I am told still do in some parts of Europe, where that improvement is not received. Their loom I also saw. It had this merit in preference to ours, that the web was not stretched on a frame, but only extended by a piece of wood at each end, round one end of which the cloth was rolled, as the threads were round the other. I had not an opportunity of seeing it used, so cannot at all describe it, only can say that it appeared very simple, much more so than ours, and that the shuttle was as long as the breadth of the web, which was about one half a yard. In all probability from this circumstance, and the unsteadiness of a web fixed to do nothing, the work must go on very slow. That they dyed their cloth be first guessed by the indigo which we saw in their plantations, which guess was afterwards confirmed by Mr. Lange. We likewise saw them dye women's girdles of a dirty reddish color. Their cloth itself was universally dyed in the yarn with blue, which being unevenly and irregularly done, gave the cloth a clouding or waving of color not unelegant even in our eyes. One chirurgical operation of theirs Mr. Lange mentioned to us with great praises, which indeed appears sensible. It is a method of curing wounds, which they do by first washing the wound in water, in which tamarinds have been steeped, then plugging it up with a pledget made of the fat of fresh pork. In this manner the wound is thoroughly cleansed, and the pledget renewed every day. He told us that by this means they had, a very little while ago, cured a man in three weeks of a wound of a lance, which had pierced his arm and half through his body. 
this is the only part of either their medical or chirurgical art which came to our knowledge indeed they did not seem to outward appearance to have much occasion for either but on the contrary appeared healthful and did not show any scars of old sores or any scurviness upon their bodies a tendency to disease some indeed were pitted with the smallpox which mr longa told us had been now and then among them in which case all who were seized by the distemper were carried to lonely places far from habitations where they were left to the influence of their distemper meat only being daily reached to them by the assistance of a long pole how the policy of their villages is carried on i cannot say but must allow that they excelled in the articles of cleanliness both in their houses and without in one thing particularly which is their ordure they were certainly very clever for during our stay of three days not one among us that i could find out saw the least signs of it notwithstanding the populousness of the country a circumstance which i believe few of the most polished cities in europe can boast of their religion according to the account of mr longa is a most absurd kind of paganism every man choosing his own god and also his mode of worshipping him in which hardly any two agree notwithstanding this their morals are most excellent mr longa declaring to us that he did not believe that during his residence of ten years upon the island a theft had been committed polygamy is by no means permitted each man being allowed no more than one wife to whom he is to adhere during life even the rajah himself has no more in favour of their chastity he also said that he did not believe that a dutchman had ever received a favour from a woman of this island the dutch boast that they make many converts to christianity six hundred say mr l in the township of siva where we are what sort of christians they are i cannot say as they have neither clergyman nor church among them the company have however certainly been at the expense of printing versions of the new testament catechism etc etc in this and several other languages and actually keep a dutch indian or half-bred dutchman whose name is frederick cray in their service who is paid by them for instructing the youth of this island in reading writing and the principles of the christian religion dr solander was at his house and saw not only the testaments and catechisms before mentioned but also the copy-books of scholars about fifty in number many of whom wrote a very fair and good hand the island is divided into five principalities each of which has its respective raja or king what his power may be we had not an opportunity of learning in outward appearance he had little respect showed him but every kind of business which was done seemed to centre in him and his chief counsellor so that in reality he seemed to be more regarded in essentials than showy useless ceremonies the reigning rajah while we were there was called madocho lomijara he was about the age of thirty-five the fattest man we saw upon the whole island and the only one also upon whose body grew any quantity of hair a circumstance very unusual among indians he appeared to be of a dull heavy disposition and i believe was governed almost entirely by a very sensible old man called manu jami who was beloved by the whole principality both these were distinguished from the rest of the natives by their dress which was always a nightgown generally of coarse chintz once indeed the rajah received us in form of one of black princess stuff which i suppose may be looked upon as more grave and proper to inspire respect if any differences arise between the people they are settled by the rajah and his counsellors without the least delay or appeal and says mr l always with the strictest justice so excellent is the disposition of these people that if any dispute arises between any two of them they never if it is of consequence more than barely mention it to each other never allowing themselves to reason upon it lest heat should beget ill blood but refer it immediately to this court after the raja we could hear of no ranks of people but landowners respectable according to their quantity of land more or less and slaves the property of the former over whom however they have no other power than that of selling them for what they will fetch when convenient no man being able to punish his slave without the concurrence and approbation of the raja of these slaves some men have five hundred others only two or three what was their price in general we did not learn only heard by accident that a very fat hog was of the value of a slave and often sold and bought at that price when any great man stirs out he is constantly attended by two or more of these slaves one of whom carries a sword or hanger 
whose hilt is commonly of silver and ornamented with large tassels of horsehair. The other carries a bag which contains beetle, areca, lime, tobacco, etc. In these attendants, all their idea of show and grandeur seems to be centred, for the Raja himself had on no occasion which we saw any more. The pride of descent, particularly of being sprung from a family which has for many generations been respected, is by no means unknown here. Even the living in a house, which has been for generations well attended, is no small honour. In consequence of this, it is that few articles, either of use or luxury, bear so high a price as those stones, which by having been very much set upon by men, have contracted a bright polish on their uneven surfaces. Those who can purchase such stones, or who have them by inheritance from their ancestors, place them round their houses where they serve as benches for their dependents, I suppose, to polish still higher and higher. Every Raja during his lifetime sets up in his capital town or Nigri a large stone which serves futurity as a testimony of his reign. In the Nigri Siba, where we lay, were thirteen such stones. Besides many fragments, the seeming remains of those which had been devoured by time. Many of these were very large, even so much so that it would be difficult to conceive how the strength of man alone, unassisted by engines, had been able to transport them to the top of a hill where they now stand. Were there not in Europe so many far grander instances of perseverance, as well as strength of our forefathers? These stones serve for a very peculiar use. Upon the death of a Raja, a general feast is proclaimed throughout his dominions, and in consequence all his subjects meet about these stones. Every living creature that can be caught is now killed, and the feast lasts a longer or shorter number of weeks or months, according to the stock of provisions the kingdom happens to be furnished with at the time, the stones serving for tables on which the whole, buffaloes, etc., are served up. After this madness is over, the whole kingdom is obliged to fast, and live upon syrup and water till the next crop, nor are they able to eat any flesh meat till some years after when the few animals that escaped the general slaughter were preserved by policy or acquired from the neighboring kingdoms have sufficiently increased their species the five kingdoms said mr Longa, of which this island consists have been for time immemorial not only at peace but in strict alliance with each other notwithstanding which they are of a warlike disposition constant friends but implacable enemies and have always courageously defended themselves against foreign invaders. They are able to raise, on a very short notice, 7,300 men, armed with muskets, lances, spears, and targets. Of these, the different kingdoms bear their different proportions. La Ai, 2,600, Siba, 2,000, Regiua, 1,500, Timo, 800, and Masara, 400. Besides the arms before mentioned, every man, is furnished with a large chopping knife, like a straightened wood bill, but much heavier, which must be a terrible weapon if these people should have spirit enough to come to close quarters. Mr. L., upon another occasion, took an opportunity of telling us that they heave their lances with surprising dexterity, being able, at the distance of sixty feet, to strike a man's heart and pierce him through. How far these dreadful accounts of their martial prowess might be true, I dare not take upon myself to determine." All I shall say is that during our stay we saw no signs either of a warlike disposition or such formidable arms. Spears and targets, indeed, there were in the Dutch house, about one hundred, the greatest part of which spears served to arm the people who came down to intimidate us. But so little did these doughty heroes think of fighting, or indeed keeping up appearances, that instead of a target each was furnished with a cock, some tobacco, or something of that kind, which he took this opportunity of bringing down to sell. Their spears seemed all to have been brought to them by Europeans, the refuse of old armories, no two being anything near the same length, the whole varying in that particular from six feet to sixteen. As for their lances, not one of us saw one of them. Their muskets, though clean on the outside, were honeycombed with rust on the inside. Few or none of their cartridge boxes had either powder or ball in them, and, to complete, all the swivels and patereros in the Dutch house were all laying out of their carriages, and the one great gun, which lay before it on a heap of stones, was not only more honeycombed with rust than any piece of artillery I have ever seen, but had the touch-hole turned downwards, probably to conceal its size, which might not be, in all probability, much less than the bore of the gun itself. 
the dutch however use these islanders as auxiliaries in their wars against the inhabitants of timor where they do good service their lives at all events not being near so valuable as those of dutchmen this island has been settled by the portuguese almost from their first coming into these seas when the dutch first came here they were however very soon wormed out by the machinations of these artful newcomers who content with that did not attempt to settle themselves in the island but only sent sloops occasionally to trade with the natives by whom they were often cut off as often i suppose as they cheated them in too great a proportion this however and the probably increasing value of the island at last tempted them to try some other way of securing it and running less risks which took place about ten years ago when a treaty of alliance was signed between the five rajas and the dutch company in consequence of which the company is yearly to furnish each of these kings with a certain quantity of fine linen and silk cutlery ware etc in short all species of goods which he wants all which is delivered in the form of a present accompanied with a certain cask of rack which the rajah and his principal people never cease to drink as long as a drop of it remains in return for this each rajah agrees that neither he nor his subjects shall trade with any person except the company unless they had the permission of their resident that they should yearly supply a certain quantity of rice maize and calavances so many sloop loads the maize and calavances are sent off to timor in sloops which are kept on the island for that purpose each navigated by ten indians the rice is taken away by a ship which at the time of that harvest comes to the island annually bringing the company's presents and anchoring by turns in each of the three bays in consequence of this treaty mr Longa, a portuguese indian who seemed to be his second and a dutch indian who serves for schoolmaster are permitted to live among them mr Longa himself is attended by fifty slaves on horseback attended by whom he once every two months makes the tour of the island visiting all the rajas exhorting those to plant who seem idle and observing where the crops are got in which he immediately sends sloops for navigated by these same slaves so that the crop proceeds immediately from the ground to the dutch storehouses at timor in these excursions he always carries certain bottles of rack which he finds of great use in opening the hearts of the rajas with whom he is to deal but notwithstanding the boasted honesty of these people it requires his utmost diligence to keep it from his slaves who notwithstanding all his care often ease him of the greater part of it during the ten years that he has resided on this island no european but himself has ever been here except at the time of the arrival of the dutch ship which had sailed about two months before we came here he is indeed distinguishable from the indians only by his colour like them he sets upon the ground and chews his beetle etc he has been for some years married to an indian woman of the island of timor who keeps his house in the indian fashion and he excused himself to us for not asking us to his house telling us that he was not able to entertain us any other way than the rest of the indians whom we saw he speaks neither german his native language nor dutch without frequent hesitations and mistakes on the contrary the indian language seems to flow from him with the utmost facility as i forgot to mention their language in its proper place i shall take this opportunity to write down the few observations i had an opportunity of making during our short stay the genius of it seems much to resemble that of the south sea isles in several instances words are exactly the same and the numbers are undoubtedly derived from the same source i give here a list of words momuni a man mobuni a woman katu the head rokatu the hair mata the eyes rona mata the eyelashes sivanga the nose karavanga the cheeks wodilu the ears vayo the tongue la coco the neck lusu the breasts Kabususu, the nipples, Dulo, the belly, Aso, the navel, Rangoritu, the beak, Ika, a fish, Unju, a turtle, Niu, coconut, Boakori, fan palm, Kalela, a reka, Kanana, beetle, Au, lime, Maandu, a fish hook, Tata, tattoo, Lodo, the sun, Wuru, the moon, Ida, sea, the sea, I lay water, I fine, mate to die, tabuji to sleep, tatitu to rise, tuga the thighs, rutu 
the knees, baibo, the legs, danciala, the feet, kisuya yila, the toes, kamaku, the arms, ulaba, the hand, kabaon, a buffalo, jara, a horse, vavi, a hog, dumba, a sheep, kasavu, a goat, naka, a dog, mayu, a cat, manu, a fowl, karo, the tail, one, use, two, lua, three, tulu, four, upa, five, lume, six, una, seven, pedu, eight, aru, nine, sau, ten, singuru, eleven, singuru, use, etc., twenty, laoan, guru, etc., one hundred, sing asu, etc., one thousand, set upa, etc., ten thousand, selakusa, etc., one hundred thousand, serata, etc., one million, serebu, etc. In the course of conversation, Mr. Longa gave us little accounts of the neighboring islands. These I shall set down, just as they come to me merely upon his authority. First, then, beginning with a small island to the westward of Savu, called Pulo. This, said he, produces nothing of consequence, except areca nuts, of which the Dutch annually receive two sloop-loads, in return for their presents to the islanders. Timor is the chief island in these parts, belonging to the Dutch, all the others in the neighborhood being subject to it, so far as that the residents on them go there once a year to pass their accounts. It is now in nearly the same state as it was in Dampier's time. The Dutch have their fort of Concordia, where are storehouses, which, according to Mr. L.'s account, would have supplied our ship with every article we could have got at Batavia, even salt provisions and arrack. The Dutch are, however, very frequently at war with the natives, even of Copang, their next neighbors, in which case themselves are obliged to send to the neighboring isles for provisions. The Portuguese still possess their towns of La Fao and Cecial on the north side of the island. About two years ago, a French ship was wrecked upon the east coast of Timor. She lay some days upon the shoal, when a sudden gale of wind, coming on, broke her up at once and drowned most of the crew, among whom was the captain. Those who got ashore, among whom was one of the lieutenants, made the best of their way towards Concordia, where they arrived in four days, having left several of their party upon the road. Their number was then above eighty, who were supplied with every necessary and had assistance given them in order to go back to the wreck and fish up what they could. This they did, and recovered all their bullion, which was in chests, and several of their guns, which were large. Their companions, which were left upon the road, were all missing. The Indians, it was supposed, had either by force or persuasion kept them among them, they being very desirous of having Europeans among them to instruct them in the art of war. After a stay of two months at Concordia, their company was diminished more than half, by sicknesses, chiefly in consequence of the great fatigues they had endured on those days when they got ashore and travelled to that place. These were then furnished with a small ship, in which they sailed for Europe. We inquired much for the island of Anabau, or Anamabau, mentioned by Dampier. He assured us that he knew of no island of that name anywhere in these seas. I since have observed that it is laid down in several charts by the name of Salam, which is probably the real name of it. Rota is upon much the same footing as Savu. A Dutchman resides upon it to manage the natives. Its produce is also much like that of Savu. It has also some sugar, which was formerly made only by bruising the canes and boiling the juice to a syrup, as they do the palm wine. Lately, however, they have made great improvements in that manufactory. There are three islands of the name of Solor, laying to the eastward of Endi, or Flores. These islands are flat and low, abounding with vast plenty of provisions and stock. They are also managed in the same manner as Savu. On the middlemost of them is a good harbour. The other two are without shelter. Endi is still in the hands of the Portuguese, who have a town and good harbour called Lartuca on the northeast corner of it. The old harbour of Endi, situate on the south side of it, is not near so good, and therefore now entirely neglected. The inhabitants of each of these different islands speak different languages, and the chief policy of the Dutch is to prevent them from learning each other's language, as by this means they keep each to their respective island, preventing them from entering into traffic with each other, 
or learning from mutual intercourse to plant such things as would be of greater value to themselves than their present produce though at the same time less beneficial to the dutch east indian company and at the same time secure to themselves alone the benefit of supplying all their necessities at their own rates no doubt not very moderate this may possibly sufficiently account for the expense they must have been at in printing prayer-books catechises etc at their expense and teaching them to each island in his own language rather than in dutch which in all probability they might have as easily done but at the risk of dutch becoming the common language of these islands and consequently the natives by its means gaining an intercourse with each other end of section forty eight september seventeen seventy part three Accounts of Savu and Islands near Savu continued. Section 49 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan Section 49 September 1770, Part 4. 1770, September 21. Notwithstanding our friend, Mr. Lange, invited us very kindly last night to come ashore again in the morn, and we saw diverse jars of syrup and sheep, etc., waiting for us upon the beach, a sure sign that the Rajah's prohibition was not intended to prejudice trade in the least. We who had now got plenty of all the refreshments which the isle afforded thought it most prudent to weigh and sail directly for Batavia, all our fears of westerly wind being dissipated by Mr. Longa's assuring us that the easterly monsoon would prevail for two months longer. Accordingly we did so, and soon passed by the small island, laying to the west about a league from Savu. Its name has been unluckily forgot, Pula Samiri, or something like it may be. On the evening a small island was in sight to the southward, trade rather slack. One of the buffaloes, who was killed, weighed only 166 pound, which was a great drawback on our expectations, who thought that even that, though the least of our stock, would not weigh less than 300 pound. 1770, September 22. Still, but little wind. Many very large albacores were leaping about the ship at night. Some boobies, but none were fools enough to settle on the rigging. 1770, September 23. Weather, boobies, and albacores, much as yesterday. These light winds, which would have been almost intolerable to empty stomachs, sat pretty easily on our full ones. 1770, September 24. Breeze freshening by very gradual degrees, together with a long swell heaving in from the southward. Sure sign that there was now no more land to interrupt us in that direction. Was an agreeable subject of conversation. Infinite flying fish and boobies. Some gannets seen. 1770, September 25. Trade, fish, gannets, boobies, in conversation, much as yesterday. 1770, September 26. Trade, rather slacker than it had been. Eat today a buttock of buffalo, which has been four days in salt. It eats so well and had so thoroughly taken salt, that it was resolved to salt meat for the ship's company, when our biggest buffaloes, who would weigh above three hundred pound, were killed. 1770, September 27. Trade fresher and more to the south men of war birds gannets and black shear waters in abundance seventeen seventy september twenty eight squally in the night with rain and fine fresh trade shoved us on merrily our beef experiment was this day tried and succeeded but scurvily the meat which had been killed on the twenty sixth was not salted till cold it hardly stunk the outside which had been in absolute contact with the salt was quite good but under that which formed a crust of various thickness the meat was in a wonderful manner corrupted. It looked well, but every fiber was destroyed, and dissolved so that the whole was a paste, of the consistency of soft putty, yet this hardly stunk. Some gannets and man-of-war birds were about the ship. 1770, September 29. Fresh trade. More gannets and man-of-war birds than usual were seen, and one tropic bird, which seemed to be of a brownish or buff color, but stayed a very short time about the ship. 1770, September 30. Two more buff-colored tropic birds were about the ship in the morn, in company with a white one, which was at least one-third larger than they were. From thence I am inclined to think that they may be the paillon of Brison, 
volume six page four hundred and eighty nine and really a distinct species besides these many birds were about the ship man of war boobies gannets etc who all flew nearer the ship and showed less fear of her than usual in the eve many very small whitish birds were seen which flew in flocks we had all this day stood indirectly for the land yet night came and though many had seen capes and headlands in the air yet no real land was seen which made us rather uneasy as we had great reason to suppose that we had overshot the mouth of the straits no very agreeable idea we had made fifteen degrees thirty minutes of longitude from the south end of timor and thought ourselves quite safe as la neptune oriental makes the difference to be eighteen degrees forty minutes yet when we recollect that our countryman dampier makes only fourteen degrees we had reason to be uneasy so at sunset we clapped close upon a wind in order to make the best of our bargain howsoever it may turn out end of section forty nine end of september seventeen seventy part four section fifty of the endeavour journal of sir joseph banks journal from twenty five august seventeen sixty eight to twelve july seventeen seventy one by joseph banks this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 50. October 1770. 1770. October 1. Thunder and lightning with heavy rain all night. About twelve land was seen by the flashes, which in the morn proved to be Java Head and Princess Island. At noon we had a good observation and found that Prince's Island was laid down in La Neptune Orientale, seven or eight miles too far to the northward, and in the English East India pilot or quarter wagoner, twenty-one or twenty-two, which extraordinary difference in the latter seems owing to some mistake in his particular draft of the straits, all parts of which are laid down fourteen minutes at least different from the rest of his drafts, as well as his own sailing directions. The breeze was fresh and tolerably favourable, so that at night we had passed Crocata, and stood on by very clear moonlight, though the clouds above the horizon threatened, and it lightened a good deal. 1770, October 2. Several lights were seen abreast of the ship, the greatest part of the night, which in the morn proved to be made by fishermen in small canoes. At daylight we were abreast of the fourth point, and stood forward with but little wind having sent a boat ashore for grass for the buffaloes who during their stay on board had not had more victuals than any one of them could eat in a day, and that the remainder of some bad hay, which the goat had dunged upon time immemorial almost. Before noon she returned bringing some with her, which the Indians had not only given to our people, but even assisted them to cut. She also brought a few plantains and coconuts, but they were bought excessive deer. The country looked from this ship hilly and very pleasant, though almost one continued wood, Bantam Hill seemed very high land. As we proceeded on, we opened two large ships, laying at anchor behind Anger Point. Soon after this it dropped calm, and we came to an anchor and sent a boat on board the ship for news. They were Dutch East India men, one bound for Cochin, on the coast of Coromandel, the other for Ceylon. Their captains received our officer very politely, and told him some European news, as that the government in England were in the utmost disorder the people crying up and down the streets down with King George, King Wilkes forever, that the Americans had refused to pay taxes of any kind, in consequence of which was a large force being sent there, both of sea and land forces, that the party of Polanders, who had been forced into the late election by the Russians interfering, had asked assistance of the Grand Seigneur, who had granted it, in consequence of which the Russians had sent twenty sail of the line and a large army by land, to besiege Constantinople, etc., etc., etc. In relation to our present circumstances, they told us that our passage to Batavia was likely to be very tedious, as we should have a strong current constantly against us, and at this time of the year calms and light breezes were the only weather we had to expect. They said also that near where they lay was a Dutch packet boat, whose business was to go on board all ships coming through the straits, to inquire of them their news, and carry or send with it letters, etc., to Batavia, with the utmost dispatch, which business, they said, her skipper was obliged to do, even for foreigners, if they required it. This skipper, he said, 
if we wanted refreshments, would furnish us with fowls, turtle, etc., at a very cheap rate. At seven a light breeze springing up we weighed and came to sail. At night some lightning was seen. 1770, October 3. Sailed all night. In the morn were past the Cape. At eight it fell calm, and we were obliged to come to an anchor by reason of the strong current which ran to the westward. The Dutch packet, which we had been told of yesterday and proved to be a sloop of no inconsiderable size, had been standing after us all morn and still continued, gaining, however, but little, till a foul wind sprung up on which she bore away. Our buffaloes had so entirely lost their stomachs by their long fast that they eat scarce anything. However, lest they should take to eating again, a boat was sent ashore for grass, which returned with some and a few plantains and unripe pawpaws, which when boiled eat nearly as well as turnips, only sweeter. At night, an Indian proa came on board, bringing the master of the sloop before mentioned. He brought with him two books, in one of which he desired that any of our officers would write down the name of the ship, commander's name, where we came from and where bound, with any particulars we chose relating to ourselves, that might be for the information of any of our friends who might come after us which we saw that some ships, especially Portuguese, had done. This book, he told us, was kept merely for the information of those who might come through these straits. In the other, which was a fair book, he entered the names of the ships and commanders, which only were returned to the governor and the council of the Indies. On our writing down Europe as the place we had come from, he said very well, anything you please, but this is merely for the information of your friends. In the proa were some small turtle, many fowls and ducks, also parrots, parakeets, rice birds, and monkeys, some few of which we bought at the rate of a dollar for a small turtle, the same at first for ten, afterwards for fifteen large fowls, two monkeys, or a whole cage of paddy birds. 1770, October 4. Lightning in the night. In the morn calms and light breezes not sufficient to stem the current, which was very strong. To make our situation as tantalizing as possible, innumerable proas were sailing about us in all directions. A boat was sent ashore for grass, and landed at an Indian town, where by hard bargaining some coconuts were bought, at about three halfpence apiece, and rice in the straw, at about five farthings a gallon. Neither here nor in any other place where we have had connections with them would they take any money but Spanish dollars. Large quantities of that floating substance, which I have often mentioned before under the name of sea sawdust, had been seen ever since we came into the straits, and more particularly today. Among it were many leaves, fruits, old stalks of plant and trees, plants of Pistia stratiotes, and such like trash, from whence we almost concluded that it came out of some river. At noon, by a good observation, we found Pulo Pasang, off which we lay at an anchor, to be laid down five miles too far to the northward, in La Neptune Oriental. In the evening light breezes, so that we got a little ahead. 1770, October 5. Early in the morn, a proa came on board, bringing a Dutchman, who said that his post was much like that of him who was on board on the third. He presented a printed paper of which he had copies in English, French, and Dutch, regularly signed in the name of the governor and council of the Indies by their secretary. These he desired we would give written answers, to which he told us would be sent express to Batavia, where they would arrive to-morrow at noon. He had in the boat turtle and eggs, of which latter he sold a few for somewhat less than a penny apiece, and then went away. The day was spent as usual in getting up and letting down the anchor. At night, however, we were very near Bantam Point. 1770, October 6. Sailed all night. In the morn, were almost up with an island called Pulo Babi, or Pulo Toanda, but were so far without it that it was thought best to go the outer passage. The land breeze, however, left us, as usual, about o'clock, and we came to an anchor, and spent the whole day without any sea breeze sufficient to stem the current, which was very strong, and ran constantly to the westward. We have observed it to be very various, since we came into the straits, sometimes running with much greater violence than at others, but setting almost, if not continually, to the westward. Once only it was thought to have turned to the eastward for a few hours, but that was never made sufficiently clear. This violence would sometimes alter very considerably, several times in an hour. At night observed fire upon Pulo Toanda. 1770, October 7. 
got the land breeze in the night as usual, and sailed with it till morn, when we were almost up with Wapping Isle, called by the Malays Pulo Tidong, where we anchored and lay still. The current was pretty strong, and brought with it plenty of sea sawdust, among which were even here some leaves and other productions of the land, also many cuttlefish bones, Portuguese men-of-war, and other recrements of the sea. In the afternoon we had a faint sea breeze which ran us very near the length of the third island, and then left us, so that the current took hold of the ship unawares, and had almost set her ashore on a small ledge of rocks, on which was not water enough for a small boat, which we sent to examine them. After we were at an anchor in the night, we observed lights upon some of the islands called Bedro or Les Mille Iles, some of which lay much nearer to Pulo Tudong than they are laid down in any of the drafts. 1770, October 8. Breezes were very uncertain all night, attended with thunder, lightning, and heavy rain, so that though we got out from our last night's disagreeable situation and sailed all night, we were not in the morn at all ahead. So we anchored at six. At eight, Dr. Solander and myself went ashore on a small island belonging to the Mille Ile, not laid down in the draft, laying from Pulo Bedro north by east five miles. The hole was not above five hundred yards long and one hundred broad, yet on it was a house and a small plantation, in which, however, at this time was no plant from whence any profit could be derived, except ricinus palma Christi, of which the castor oil is made in the West Indies. Upon the shoal, about one quarter of a mile from the island, were two people, in a canoe, who seemed to hide themselves as if afraid of us. We supposed them to be the inhabitants of our island. We found very few species of plants, but shot a bat, whose wings measured three feet when stretched out, vesp vampirus, and four plovers exactly like our English golden plover, charadrius pluvialis. With these and the few plants we returned, and very soon after a small Indian boat came alongside, having in her three turtle, some dried fish, and pumpkins. We bought his turtle, which weighed altogether 146 pound, for a dollar, with which bargain he seemed well pleased, but could scarcely be prevailed upon to take any other coin for his pumpkins, often desiring that we would cut a dollar and give him part. At last, however, a Portuguese pataca, shining and well coined, tempted him to part with his stock, which consisted of twenty-six. He told us that the island called in most drafts, Pulo Babi, was really called Po Toonda, and that called Pulo Bedro, Pulo Peon. At parting, he made signs that we should not tell at Batavia that any boat had been on board with us. At one, the sea breeze sprang up and carried us by five, the length of all the islands called Pulo Pare. Off the east end of them, however, was a shoal on which it broke a good deal, which we could not weather so were obliged to anchor abreast a passage between it and the island, in which was twenty-two fathom water, not having daylight to carry us through. On all the islands of Pulopari were coconut trees, some houses and vessels hauled up, and along the sides of the beach were neat fishing weirs. 1770, October 9. A fine land breeze, which held the greatest part of the night, ran us by morn abreast of the island of Edam, so that we saw the vessels at anchor in Batavia Road and on Rust Island. At ten it left us, and we anchored. By eleven it cleared up towards Batavia, so much that we saw distinctly the dome of the great church. At one half after, sea breeze set in, and before four, we were at anchor in Batavia Road. A boat came immediately on board us from a ship, which had a broad pennant flying. The officer on board her inquired who we were, etc., and immediately returned. Both himself and his people were almost as spectres, no good omen of the healthiness of the country we were arrived at. Our people, however, who truly might be called rosy and plump, for we had not a sick man amongst us, jeered and flouted much at their brother seamen's white faces. By this time our boat was ready, which went ashore with the first lieutenant, who had orders to acquaint the commanding officer ashore of our arrival. At night he returned, having met with a very civil reception from the Shabandar, who, though no military officer, took cognizance of all these things. I forgot to mention before that we found here the Harcourt India man, Captain Paul, and two English private traders from the coast of India. 1770 October, 10 to 20. After breakfast this morning, we all went ashore in the pinnace and immediately went to the house of Mr. Late. 
the only Englishman of any credit, resident in Batavia. We found him a very young man, under twenty, who had lately arrived here and succeeded his uncle, a Mr. Burnett, in his business, which was pretty considerable, more so, we were told, than our newcomer had either money or credit to manage. He soon gave us to understand that he could be of very little service to us, either in introductions, as the Dutch people, he said, were not fond of him, or in money matters, as he had began trade too lately to have any more than what was employed in getting more. He, however, after having kept us to dine with him, offered his assistance in showing us the method of living in Batavia, and assisting us in settling in such a manner as we should think fit. In order to this here were two alternatives, either to go to the hotel, a kind of inn kept by the order of government, where it seems all merchant strangers are obliged to reside, paying one half P.C., for warehouse room for their goods, which the master of the house is obliged to find for them. We, however, having come in a king's ship, were free from that obligation, and might live wherever we pleased, after having asked leave of the council, which was never refused. We might therefore, if we chose it, take a house in any part of the town, and bringing our own servants ashore, keep it, which would be much cheaper than living at the hotel, provided we had anybody on whom we could depend to buy in our provisions. But this not being the case, as we had none with us who understood the Malay language, we concluded that the hotel would be the best for us, certainly the least troublesome, and maybe not vastly the most expensive. Accordingly, we went there, bespoke beds, and slept there at night. The next morning we agreed with the keeper of the house, whose name was Van Hayes, the rates we should pay for living, as follows. Each person for lodging and eating two rix dollars or eight s per diem. For this he agreed, as we were five of us, who would probably have many visitants from the ship, to keep us at a separate table. For each stranger, we were to pay one rix dollar four s for dinner, and another for supper and bed, if he stayed ashore. We were to have also for ourselves and friends tea, coffee, punch, and pipes, and tobacco, as much as we could destroy. In short, everything the house afforded, except beer and wine, which we were to pay for at the following rates. Claret, 39 stivers, 3s, 3d. Hawk, 1 rix, 4s. Lisbon, 39, 3s, 3d. Sweet wine, 39, 3s, 3d. Madeira, 1 rupee, 4s, 6d. Beer, 1 rupee, 2s, 6d. Spa water, 1 rix, 4s. Besides this, we were to pay for our servants, one half a rupee, one third a day each. For these rates, which we soon found to be more than double the common charges of boarding and lodging in the town, we were furnished with a table, which under the appearance of magnificence, was wretchedly covered. Indeed, our dinners and suppers consisted of one course each, the one of fifteen, the other of thirteen dishes, of which, when you came to examine, seldom less than nine or ten were of bad poultry roasted, boiled, fried, stewed, etc., etc., and so little conscience had they in serving up dishes over and over again that I have seen the same identical roasted duck appear upon table three times as a roasted duck before he found his way into the fricassee, from whence he was again to pass into force meat. This treatment, however, was not without remedy. We found that it was the constant custom of the house to supply strangers at their first arrival with every article as bad as possible, which if they, through good nature or indolence, put up with, it was so much the better for the house. If not, it was easy to amend their treatment by degrees till they were satisfied. On this discovery we made frequent remonstrances and amended our fare considerably, so much that had we had any one among us who understood this kind of wrangling, I am convinced we might have lived as well as we could have desired. Being now a little settled, I hired a small house next door to the hotel, on the left, for which I paid ten rix d, two pounds a month. Here our books, etc., were lodged, but here we were far from private. Every Dutchman almost that came by running in and asking what we had to sell, for it seems that hardly any individual had ever been at Batavia before who had not something or other to sell. I also hired two carriages, which were a kind of open chaises, made to hold two people, and drove by a man sitting on the coach-box. 
For each of these I paid two rex, eight s, a day by the month. And now being fairly settled, we sent for Tupaya ashore to us, who had till now remained on board, on account of his illness, which was of the bilious kind, and for which he had, all along, refused to take any medicines. On his arrival his spirits, which had been very low, were instantly raised by the sights which he saw, and his boy Tayeto, who had always been perfectly well, was almost ready to run mad. Houses, carriages, streets, in short everything, were to him sights which he had often heard described, but never well understood. So he looked upon them all with more than wonder, almost made with the numberless novelties, which diverted his attention from one to the other. He danced about the streets examining everything to the best of his abilities. One of Tupaya's first observations was the various dresses which he saw worn by different people. On his being told that in this place every different nation wore their own country dress, he desired to have his, on which South Sea cloth was sent for on board, and he clothed himself according to his taste. We were now able to get food for him, similar to that of his own country, and he grew visibly better every day, so that I doubted not in the least of his perfect recovery, as our stay at this place was not likely to be very short. Ever since our arrival at this place, Dr. Sullender and myself had applied to be introduced to the general or governor on one of his public or council days. We had been put off by various foolish excuses, and at last were plainly told that as we could have no business with him, we could have no reason to desire that favor. But as we had often pressed the thing, this, as an excuse, did not satisfy us. So I went myself to the Shabandar, who is also master of the ceremonies, in order to ask his reasons for refusing so trifling a request, but was surprised at being very politely received, and told that the very next morning he would attend us, which he did, and we twenty were introduced, and had the honor of conversing for a few minutes with his high mightiness, who, however, was very polite to us. Ever since our first arrival here, we had been universally told of the extreme unwholesomeness of the place, which we, they said, should severely feel on account of the freshness and healthiness of our countenances. This threat, however, we did not much regard thinking ourselves too well seasoned to variety of climates to fear any, and trusting more than all to an invariable temperature in everything, which we had, as yet, unalterably kept during our whole residence in the warm latitudes, so had small reason to doubt our resolutions of keeping for the future. But before the end of this month, however, we were made sensible of our mistake. Poor Tupaya's broken constitution felt it first, and he grew worse and worse every day. Then Tayeto, his boy, was attacked by a cold and inflammation on his lungs. Then my servants, Peter and James, and myself, had intermitting fevers, and Dr. Solander a constant nervous one. In short, everyone on shore and many on board were ill, chiefly of intermittence, occasioned, no doubt, by the lowness of the country and the numberless dirty canals which intersect the town in all directions. Some days before this, as I was walking the streets with Tupaya, a man, totally unknown to me, ran out of his house and eagerly accosting me asked if the Indian, whom he saw with me, had not been at Batavia before. On my declaring that he had not and asking the reason of so odd a question, he told me that a year and a half before, Mr. de Bougainville had been at Batavia with two French ships, and that with him was an Indian so like this that he had imagined it to be the identical same person, had I not informed him to the contrary. On this I inquired, and found that Mr. de Bougainville, who was sent out by the French to the Malouin or Falkland Islands, in order, as they said here, to sell them to the Spaniards, had gone from thence to the River Platte, and afterwards, having passed into the South Seas, maybe to other Spanish ports, where he and all his people had got an immense deal of money in new Spanish dollars, and afterwards came here, across the South Seas, in which passage he discovered diverse lands unknown before, and from one of them brought the Indian in question. This at once cleared up the account given to us by the Indians of Otahite of the two ships which had been here ten months before us. Page 164 of this journal. These were undoubtedly the ships of Monsieur de Bougainville, and the Indian Otoru, the brother of Rete chief of Haidia. Even the story of the woman was known here. She, it seems, was a French woman, who followed a young man, sent out in the character of botanist in men's clothes. 
As for the article of the colors, the Indians might easily be mistaken, or Mr. de Bougainville, if he had traded in the South Sea under Spanish colors, might choose to go quite across with them. As for the iron which most misled us, that he undoubtedly bought in Spanish America. Besides the botanists mentioned above, these ships were furnished with one or more draughtsmen, so that they probably have done some part of our work for us. 1770, October 21. After petitioning and repetitioning the Council of the Indies, our affairs were lost settled, and orders given to heave down the ship with all expedition. So she this day went down to Kuiper, called by the English Cooper's Island, where a warehouse was allotted for her, to lay up stores, etc., we now began sensibly to feel the ill effects of the unwholesome climate we were in. Our appetites and spirits were gone, but none were yet really sick, except poor Dupaya and Tayeto, both of which grew worse and worse daily, so that I began once more to despair of poor Tupaya's life. At last he desired to be removed to the ship, where he said he should breathe a freer air, clear of the numerous houses, which he believed to be the cause of his disease, by stopping the free draught. 1770, October 28. Accordingly, on the 28th, I went down with him to Kuiper, and on his liking the shore, had a tent pitched for him, in a place he chose, where both sea breeze and land breeze blew right over him, a situation in which he expressed great satisfaction. The seamen now fell sick fast, so that the tents ashore were always full of sick. 1770, October 30. After a stay of two days, I left Tupaya, well satisfied in mind, but not at all better in body, and returned to town, where I was immediately seized with a tertian, the fits of which were so violent as to deprive me entirely of my senses, and leave me so weak as scarcely to be able to crawl downstairs. End of section 50, October 1770section 51 of the endeavor journal of sir joseph banks journal from 25 august 1768 to 12 july 1771 by joseph banks this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan section 51 november 1770 1770 november 1 to 3 my servants peter and james were as bad as myself and dr solander now felt the first attacks of his fever but never having been in his lifetime once ill resisted it in a manner resolved not to apply to a physician but worst of all was mr monkhouse the ship's surgeon he was now confined to his bed by a violent fever which grew worse and worse notwithstanding all the efforts of the physician seventeen seventy november four at last after many delays caused by dutch ships which came alongside the wharfs to load pepper the endeavour was this day got down to Onrust, where she was able to be hove down without delay. Most welcome news to us all, now heartily tired of this unwholesome country. Poor Mr. Monkhouse became worse and worse, without the intervention of one favourable symptom, so that now we had little hopes of his life. 1770, November 5. In the afternoon of this day, poor Mr. Monkhouse departed, the first sacrifice to the climate, and the next day he was buried. 1770, November 7. Dr. Solander attended his funeral, and I should certainly have done the same, had I not been confined to my bed by my fever. Our case now became melancholy. Neither of my servants were able to help me, no more than I was them, and the Malay slaves, who alone we depended upon, naturally, the worst attendants in nature, were rendered less careful of our incapacity of scolding them on account of our ignorance of the language." When we became so ill that we could not help ourselves, they would get out of call, so we were obliged to lie still till able to get up, and go in search of them. 1770, November 9. This day we received the disagreeable news of the death of Tayeto, and that his death had so much affected Dupaya that there was little hopes of his surviving him many days. 1770, November 10. Dr. Solander and myself still grew worse and worse, and the physician who attended us declared that the country air was necessary for our recovery, so we began to look out for a country house, though with a heavy heart, as we knew that we must there commit ourselves entirely to the care of the Malays, whose behavior to sick people we had all the reason in the world to find fault with. For this reason, we resolved to buy each of us a Malay woman to nurse us, 
hoping that the tenderness of the sex would prevail, even here, which indeed we found it to do, for they turned out by no means bad nurses. 1770, November 11. We received news of Topia's death. I had given him quite over, ever since his boy died, whom I knew well he sincerely loved, though he used to find much fault with him during his lifetime. 1770, November 12. Dr. Solander, who had not yet entirely taken to his bed, returned from airing this even extremely ill. He went to bed immediately. I sat by him, and soon observed symptoms which alarmed me very much. I sent immediately for our physician, Dr. Jaggi, who applied synapisms to his feet and blisters to the calves of his legs, but at the same time gave me little or no hopes of even the possibility of his living till morning. Weak as I was, I sat by him till morn, when he changed very visibly for the better. I then slept a little, and waking found him still better than I had any reason to hope. 1770, November 13. As Dr. Jaggi had all along insisted on the country air as necessary for our recovery, I immediately agreed with my landlord Van Hayes for his country house, which he immediately furnished for us, and agreed to supply us with provisions, and gave us the use of five slaves, who were there, as well as three we were to take with us at a dollar a day, four s more than our common agreement. This country house, though small and very bad, was situate about two miles out of town, in a situation that pre-proposed me much in its favor, being situate on the banks of a briskly running river, and well open to the sea breeze. Two circumstances, which must much contribute to promote circulation of air, a thing of the utmost consequence in a country perfectly resembling the low part of my native Lincolnshire. Accordingly, Dr. Solander being much better, and in the doctor's opinion not too bad to be removed, we carried him down to it this day, and also received from the ship Mr. Sporing, our writer, a seaman, and the captain's own servant, who he had sent on hearing of our melancholy situation, so that we were now sufficiently well attended, having ten Malays and two whites, besides Mr. Sporing. This night, however, the doctor was extremely ill, so much so that fresh blisters were applied to the inside of his thighs, which he seemed not at all sensible of. Nevertheless, in the morn, he was something better, and from that time recovered, though by extremely slow degrees, till his second attack. Myself, either by the influence of the bark, of which I had all along taken quantities, or by the anxiety I suffered on Dr. Solander's account, missed my fever, nor did it return for several days, till he became better. 1770, November 14. This day we had the agreeable news of the repairs of the ship being completely finished, and that she was returned again to Cooper's Island, where she proved to be no longer at all leaky. When examined, she had proved much worse than anybody expected, her main plank being in many places, so cut by the rocks that not more than one-eighth of an inch of thickness remained. And here the worm had got in and made terrible havoc, her false keel entirely gone, and her main keel much wounded. These damages were now, however, entirely repaired, and very well, too, in the opinion of everybody who saw the Dutch artificers do their work. This completion of our repairs gave us hopes that our stay here would be of no very long duration, as we had now nothing to do but to get on board our stores and provisions. But our hopes were not a little damped by the accounts we had every day from the ship, or the people were so sickly that not above thirteen or fourteen were able to stand to their work. Dr. Solander grew better, though by very slow degrees. Myself soon had a return of my egg, which now became quotidian. The captain also was taken ill on board, and of course we sent his servant to him. Soon after which both Mr. Sporing and our seamen were seized with intermittence, so that we were again reduced to the melancholy necessity of depending entirely upon the Malays for nursing us, all of whom were often sick together. 1770, November 24. We had for some nights now had the wind on the western board, generally attended with some rain, lightning, and thunder. This night grew strong at southwest and rained, etc., harder than ever I saw it before, for three or four hours. Our house rained in in every part, and through the lower part of it ran a stream, almost capable of turning a mill. In the morn I went to Batavia, where the quantities of bedding that I everywhere saw hung up to dry made a very uncommon sight for every house that I was acquainted with, and I was told almost every house in the town and neighborhood suffered more or less. 
This was certainly the shifting of the monsoon, for the winds, which had before been constantly to the eastward, remained ever after on the western board. The people here, however, told us that it did not commonly shift so suddenly, and were loath to believe that the westerly winds were really set in for several days after. Dr. Solander was recovered enough to be able to walk about the house, but gathered strength very slowly. Myself was given to understand that curing my egg was of very little consequence while the cause remained in the badness of the air. The physician, however, bled me and gave me frequent gentle purges, which he told me would make the attacks less violent, as was really the case. They came generally about the hour of two or three in the afternoon, a time when everybody in these climates is asleep, and by four or five I generally had recovered to get up and walk in the garden, etc. The rainy season was now set in, and we had generally some rain in the night. The days were more or less cloudy and sometimes wet. This, however, was not always the case, for after this time we had once a whole week of dry, clear weather. The frogs in the ditches, whose voices were ten times louder than those of European ones, made a noise on those nights when rain was to be expected almost intolerable, and the mosquitoes or gnats, who had been sufficiently troublesome even in the dry time, now breeding in every splash of water, became innumerable, especially in the moonlight nights. Their stings, however, though painful and troublesome enough at the time, never continued to itch above half an hour, so that no man in the daytime was troubled with the bites of the night before. Indeed, I never met with any whose bites caused swellings that remained twenty-four hours, except the midges or gnats of Lincolnshire, which are identically the same insect, as is called the mosquito in most parts of the world, and the sandflies of North America. End of section 51. November 1770. Section 52 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768, to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 52. December, 1770. 1770, December 1. About this time, Dr. Solander had a return of his fever, which increased gradually for four or five days, when he became once more in imminent danger. 1770, December 7. We received the agreeable news of the ship's arrival in the road, having completed all her rigging, etc., etc., and having now nothing to take in but provisions and a little water. The people on board, however, were extremely sickly, and several had died, a circumstance necessarily productive of delays. Indeed, had the ship's company been strong and healthy, we should have been before now at sea. Dr. Solander had changed much for the better within these last two days, so that our fears of losing him were entirely dissipated, for which much praise is due to his ingenious physician, Dr. Joggy, who at this juncture especially was indefatigable. 1770, December 14. Arrived the Earl of Elgin Indiaman, Captain Cook, having lost her passage to China, and being in want of anchors, cables, and other stores. Dr. Solander continued to mend, though slowly. 1770, December 16. Arrived to the Phoenix, Captain Black, a private trader from India. Our departure being now very soon to take place, I thought it would be very convenient to cure the egg, which had now been my constant companion for many weeks. Accordingly, I took deconcoction of bark plentifully, and in three or four days missed it. I then went to town, settled all my affairs, and remained impatient to have the day fixed. 1770, December 24. The 25th, Christmas Day, by our account, being fixed for sailing. We this morn hired a large country pro, which came up to the door and took in Dr. Solander, now tolerably recovered, and carried him on board the ship, where in the evening we all joined him. See account of Batavia below. 1770, December 25. There was not, I believe, a man in the ship, but gave his utmost aid to getting up the anchor. So completely tired was everyone of the unwholesome air of this place. We had buried here eight people. In general, however, the crew was in rather better health than they had been a fortnight before. While we were at work, a man was missed, who it was supposed did not intend to stay ashore, so a boat was sent after him, which, before its return, delayed us so long that we lost entirely the sea breeze, and were obliged to come to again, a few cable's lengths only, from where we lay before. 
1770, December 26. Weighed, and having very faint land breeze, got no farther than to the island of Edam. 1770, December 27. Sea breeze was faint again today, so that we got but little on our way. 1770, December 28. We had a good sea breeze which carried us to Man-Eaters Island, where we anchored for the night. 1770, December 29. We were again fortunate, and at night anchored under Pulo Babi. 1770, December 30. This day, in entering the Narrows, we found some difficulty, and at night came to an anchor under some small islands on the coast of Sumatra, almost abreast of Thwart the Way, from whence we saw a large Dutch ship at an anchor under North Island, a small island likewise on the Sumatra coast, to the north of us. Sumatra in this place was very woody, and seemed but thinly inhabited. There were, however, some cleared spots, and a few fires seen. 1770, December 31. Worked all day against the wind, hoping to see some boat come off to us, which might sell us fruits or greens. But none came. End of section 52. December 1770. Section 53 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 53. Some Account of Batavia. Part 1. Batavia, the capital of the Dutch domains in India and generally esteemed to be by much the finest town of those in the possession of Europeans in these parts, is situated in a low, fenny plain, where several small rivers which take their rise in the mountains, called Blaisberg, about forty miles inland, empty themselves into the sea. This situation seems to have been pitched upon by the Dutch, always true to their commercial interests, entirely for the convenience of water carriage which indeed few, if any, towns in Europe enjoy in a higher degree than this place. Few streets in the town are without canals of a considerable breadth, running through, or rather stagnating in them, which canals are continued for several miles round the town, and with five or six rivers, some of which are navigable thirty, forty, or maybe many more miles, into the inland country, make the carriage of every species of its produce inconceivably cheap. It is very difficult to judge of the size of the town. The size of the houses in general large, and the breadth of the streets, increased by their canals, makes it impossible to compare it with any English town. All I can say is, that when seen from the top of a building, from whence the eye take it in, at one view, it does not look near so large as it seems to be when you walk about it. Valentine, who wrote about and before the year 1726, says that in his time there were within the walls 1,242 Dutch houses, and 1,200 Chinese, without 1,066 Dutch, and 1,240 Chinese, besides 12 Iraq houses. This number, however, appeared to me to be highly exaggerated, those within the walls especially. But all of this I confess myself a very indifferent judge, having enjoyed so little health, especially towards the latter part of my stay, that I had no proper opportunities of satisfying myself in such like particulars. The streets are broad and handsome, and the banks of the canals in general planted with rows of trees. A stranger, on his first arrival, is very much struck with these, and often led to observe how much the heat of the climate must be tempered by the shade of the trees and the coolness of the water. Indeed, as to the first, it must be convenient to those who walk on foot, but a very short residence will show him that their inconveniences far overbalance any convenience he can derive from them in any but a mercantile light. Instead of cooling the air, they contribute not a little to heat it, especially the stagnating ones, of which sort are by far the greatest numbers, by reflecting back the fierce rays of the sun. In the dry season these stink most intolerably, and in the wet many of them overflow their banks, filling the lower stories of the houses near them with water. Add to this that when they clean them, which is pretty often a summer not more than three or four feet deep, the black mud taken out is suffered to lie upon their banks, that is, in the middle of the street, till it has acquired a sufficient hardness to be conveniently laden into boats. This mud stinks most intolerably, as indeed it must, being chiefly formed from human ordure of which, as there is not a necessary house in the whole town, the canals every morning receive their regular quota, 
and the more filthy requirements of housekeeping, which the uncommon policy of the country suffers everybody to throw into them. Add to this that the running ones, which are in some measure free from the former inconveniences, have every now and then a dead horse or hog stranded in the shallow parts of them, a nuisance which, as I was informed, no particular person was appointed to remove, which account I am inclined to believe, as I remember a dead buffalo laying in one of the principal streets of thoroughfare for more than a week, which was at last carried away by a flood. The houses are in general large, well built, and conveniently enough contrived for the climate. The greatest part of the ground floor is always laid out into one large room, with a door to the street and another to the yard, both which generally stand open. Below is the ground plot of one. Below stairs, where A is the street door, B the back door, C a room where the master of the house does his business, D a court to give light to the room as well as increase the draught, and E the stairs for going upstairs where the rooms are generally large, though few in number. Such in general are their townhouses, differing however in size very much, and sometimes in shape. The principles, however, on which they are built, universally the same, two doors opposite each other, and one or more courts between them to cause a draught, which they do in an imminent degree, as well as dividing the room into alcoves, in one of which the family dine, while the female slaves, who on no occasion sit anywhere else, work in another. Showy, however, as these large rooms are to a stranger, at his first seeing them, his eye has scarce measured round him, before he is sensible of the thinness of furniture, which is universal in all of them. In short, the same quantity of furniture is sufficient for them, as is necessary in our smaller rooms in Europe, as in those we entertain full as many guests at a time, as ever is done in these. Consequently, the chairs, which are spread at even distances from each other, are not very easily collected into a circle if four or five visitors arrive at once. Public buildings they have several, most of them old and executed in rather a clumsy taste. Their new church, however, which is built with a dome that is very far seen out to sea, is certainly far from an ugly building on the outside, though rather heavy, and on the inside is a very fine room. Its organ is well proportioned, being large enough to fill it, and it is so well supplied with chandeliers that few churches in Europe are so well lighted. From buildings I should make an easy transition to fortifications, was it not a subject which I must confess myself totally ignorant of. I shall attempt, however, to describe what I have seen in general terms. The city of Batavia is enclosed by a stone wall of a moderate height, old, and in many parts not in the best repair. Besides this, a river in different places, from fifty to one hundred paces broad, whose stream is rather brisk but shallow, encircles it without the walls, and within again is a canal very various in breadth, so that in passing out, or in their gates, you cross two drawbridges. This canal, useless as it seems, has, however, this merit, that it prevents all walking upon the ramparts, as is usual in fortified towns, and consequently all idle examination of the number or condition of the guns, with which they seem to be very ill provided, all those that are seen being of very light metal, and the west side of the town, where alone you have an opportunity of examining, being almost totally unprovided. In the northeast corner of the town stands the castle, or citadel, the walls of which are higher and larger than those of the town, especially near the landing place for boats, which it completely commands, and where are mounted several large and well-looking guns. The neighborhood, however, of the northeast corner, on both sides, seems sufficiently weak, especially on the east side. Within this castle, as it is called, are apartments for the governor-general and all the members of the Council of India, to which they are enjoined to repair in case of a siege. Here are also large storehouses, where are kept great quantities of the company's goods, especially European, and where almost all the writers, etc., do their business. Here are also a large quantity of cannon, laid up in store. But whether to mount on their walls or furnish their shipping, in case of the approach of an enemy, I could not learn, though from their appearance I should judge them to be intended for the latter. As for powder, they are said to be well supplied with it, and that it is dispersed in various magazines, on account of the frequency of lightning. Besides the fortifications of the town, there are numerous forts up and down the country, some between twenty and thirty miles from the town. Most of these seem to be very poor defences, and are probably intended for little more than to keep the natives in awe. They have also a kind of houses, which mount about eight guns apiece, 
and seem to me to be the best defences against Indians I have ever seen. These are generally placed in such situations as will command the navigation of three or four canals, and at the same time as many roads upon their banks. Some there are in the very town, and one of them it was, which in the time of the Chinese rebellion, as the Dutch call it, quickly leveled all the best Chinese houses to the ground. Indeed, I was told that the natives are more afraid of these than any other kind of defences. Of them are many in all parts of Java and the other islands in the possession of the Dutch. I lamented much not being able to get a drawing and plan of one, which indeed, had I been well, I might easily have done, as I suppose they never could be jealous of a defence which one gun would destroy in half an hour. If the Dutch fortifications should be even quite as weak and defenceless as I imagine, they have nevertheless some advantages in their situation among morasses, where the roads, which are almost universally a bank thrown up between a canal and a ditch, might easily be destroyed and consequently the bringing of heavy artillery very much retarded, unless they could be got upon some canal, and a sufficient number of proper boats secured to transport them, of which there are plenty, but they all muster every night, under the guns of the castle, from whence it would be impossible to take them. Delays, howsoever, from whatever cause they might happen, would be inevitably fatal. In less than a week we were sensible of the unhealthiness of the climate, and in a month's time one half of the ship's company were unable to perform their duty. But could a very small body of men get soon to the walls of Batavia, bringing with them a few battering cannon, the town must inevitably yield on account of the weakness of its defence. We were told that of a hundred soldiers who arrive here from Europe, it is a rare thing for fifty to outlive the first year, and of those fifty, half will at that time be in the hospitals, and of the other half, not ten in perfect health. Whether this account may not be exaggerated, I cannot say, but will venture to affirm that it seemed to me probable from the number of pale faces and limbs hardly able to support a musket which I saw among the few soldiers that were to be seen upon duty. The white inhabitants, indeed, are all soldiers. The younger ones mustered, and those who have served five years to be called out on any occasion. But as neither the one nor the other are ever exercised or made to do any kind of duty, it is impossible to expect much from them, more versed in handling pens than guns. The Portuguese, indeed, are generally good marksmen, as they employ themselves much in shooting wild hogs and deer. As for the Mardikers, who are certainly numerous, being Indians of all nations, who, or whose ancestors, have been slaves made free, few either of them or the Chinese know the use of firearms. Their numbers, however, might be troublesome, as some of them are esteemed brave with their own weapons, lances, swords, daggers, etc. Thus much for the land. By sea, it is impossible to attack Batavia on account of the shallowness of the water, which will scarce suffer even a longboat to come within cannon shot of the walls, unless she keep a narrow channel walled on both sides by strong piers, and running about one half a mile into the harbour, which channel terminates exactly under the fire of the strongest part of the castle, where is a large wooden boom, which is shut every night at six o'clock, and not opened again till the morn upon any pretense. It is said that before the earthquake, ships of large burthen used to come up to this place, and be likewise shut up by the boom, but at present nothing but boats attempt it. The harbour of Batavia is generally accounted as the finest in India, and indeed it answers that character, being large enough to contain any number of ships, and having such good holding ground that no ships ever think of mooring, but ride with one anchor, which always holds as long as the cable. How it is sheltered is difficult to say, the islands without it being not by any means sufficient, but so it is that there never in it runs any sea to be at all troublesome to shipping. Its greatest inconvenience is the shoal water between the ships and the mouth of the Batavia River, which when the sea breeze has blown pretty fresh, as it often does, makes such a cockling sea as it is very dangerous for boats. Our longboat once, in attempting to come off, struck two or three times, and, with difficulty, regained the river's mouth. The same even a Dutch boat, loaded with sails and rigging, for one of their Indian men, was entirely lost. Round the outside of the harbour are many small islands, some of which the Dutch make use of, as Edam, 
to which they transport all Europeans who have been guilty of crimes not worthy of death. Some of these are sentenced to remain here ninety-nine, others forty, twenty-five, etc. years, according to their deserts, during which time they work as slaves, making ropes, etc., etc. Permarent, where they have a hospital, in which people are said to recover much faster than at Batavia. Kuiper, where are warehouses belonging to the company, in which are storehouses, in which are kept many things belonging to the company, chiefly such as are of small value, as rice, etc. Here also all foreign ships, who are to be hove down at Onrust, discharge their cargoes at wharves very convenient for the purpose. Here the gun sails, etc., of the Falmouth, a gunship which was condemned here in the year on her return from the Manila, were kept, and she herself remained in the harbour with only her warrant officers on board, who had remittances most regularly from home, but no notice ever taken of the many memorials they sent, desiring to be recalled. The Dutch, however, for reasons best known to themselves, thought fit about six months before our arrival to sell her and all her stores by public auction, and send our officers home in their ships. The next island, which indeed is of more consequence to the Dutch than all the rest, is Onrust. Here they heave down and repair all their shipping, and consequently keep a large quantity of naval stores. On this island are artificers of almost all kinds that are employed in the shipbuilding way, and very clever ones, so at least all our most experienced seamen allowed, who said they had seen ships hove down in most parts of the world but never saw that business so cleverly done as here. The Dutch seem to think this island of not so much consequence, as perhaps they would do, if all their naval stores were here, the greatest part of which are at Batavia. Be it as it will, however, it seems to be so ill-defended that one sixty-gun ship would blow it up without a possibility of failing, as she might go alongside the wharfs as near as she pleased. It is generally said in Europe, that the Dutch keep a strong fleet in the East Indies, ready and able to cope with any European power which might attack them there. This is true thus far and no farther. Their Indiamen, which are all very large ships, are pierced for fifty or sixty guns each. Now, should they be attacked when all these were in India, or indeed a little before the sailing of the Europe fleet, they might, if they had sufficient warning to get in their guns, etc., etc., raise forty or fifty sail but how it would be possible for them to man this fleet, if they kept anybody at all on shore, is to me a mystery. Again, should they be attacked when the fleets are sailed, they have very few ships, and those terribly out of condition, for they keep no ships even in tolerable repair in India, except those employed to go to Ceylon and the coast, which places indeed are generally taken in the way to or from Europe. As for the eastern islands, no ships of any force are employed there, but all the trade carried on in small vessels, many of which are brigs and sloops. The country round about Batavia for some miles is one continued range of country houses and gardens, some of which are very large and all universally planted with trees, as thick almost as they can stand by each other, so that the country enjoys little benefit of being cleared, the woods standing now almost as thick as when they grew there originally with only this difference, that one is of useful, the other was of useless trees. But useful as these trees are to their respective owners, who enjoy their fruits, to the community they are certainly highly detrimental in preventing the sea breeze from penetrating into the country as it ought, or at best loading it with unwholesome vapors collected and stagnating under their branches. This, according to our modern theory, should be the reason why thunder and lightning are so frequent and mischievous here that scarce a month passes in which either ships or houses do not feel the effects of it. While we stayed, three accidents happened. The first, a few days after our arrival, dismasted a large Dutch Indiaman, which lay next ship to us, and wounding two or three of her people. Nor were we totally exempt from the consequences of that very flash, which, according to the belief of those on board, came down the lightning chain and certainly struck down the sentry who stood near it besides these frugiferous forests the country has all the appearance of unwholesomeness imaginable i may venture to call it for some miles round the town one universal flat as i know few exceptions to it this flat is intersected in many directions by rivers and still more by canals 
navigable for small vessels, but worst of all is the ditches, which, as in the marshes of Lincolnshire, are the universal fences of fields and gardens, hedges being almost totally unused here, nor are filthy fenny bogs and morasses, as well fresh and salt, wanting even in the near neighbourhood of the town, to add their baneful influence to the rest, and complete the unhealthiness of the country, which much as I have said of it, I believe I have not exaggerated. People themselves speak of it in as strong terms as I do, while the pale faces and diseased bodies of those who are said to be inured to it, as well as the preventive medicines, etc., etc., and the frequent attacks of disease they are subject to, abundantly testify to the truth of what they assert. The very churchyards show it by the number of graves constantly open in them, far disproportionate to the number of people. The inhabitants themselves talk of death with the same indifference as people in a camp. It is hardly a piece of news to tell anyone of the death of another, unless the dead man is of high rank or somehow concerned in money matters with the other. If the death of any acquaintance is mentioned, it commonly produces some such reflection as, well, it is very well he owed me nothing, or I should have had to get it from his executors. So much for the neighborhood of Batavia. As far round it as I had an opportunity of going, I saw only two exceptions to this general description. One, where the general's country house is situated, which is a gradually rising hill of a tolerable extent, but so little raised above the common level, that you are hardly sensible of being upon it by any mark but the canals leaving you and the ditches, being changed into bad hedges. The governor himself has, however, strained a point, to enclose his own garden with a ditch, to be in fashion, I suppose. The other is the place where a famous market called Passar Tanabank is held. Here, and here only during my whole stay, I had the satisfaction of mounting up a hill of about ten yards perpendicular height, and tolerably steep. About forty miles inland, however, are some pretty high hills, where, as we were informed, the country is healthy in a high degree, and even in certain heights tolerably cool. There European vegetables flourish in high perfection, even strawberries, which bear heat very ill. The people who live there also have color in their cheeks, a thing totally unknown at Batavia, where the milk-white faces of all the inhabitants are unstained with any color, especially the women who never go into the sun, are consequently free from tan, and have certainly the whitest skins imaginable. From what cause it proceeds is difficult to say, but in general it is observed that they keep their health much better than the men, even those lately arrived from Europe. On these hills some of the principal people have country houses, which they visit once a year. The general especially has one, said to be built upon the plan of Blenheim House, near Oxford, but never finished. Physicians also often send people here for the recovery of health lost in the low country, and say that the effects of such a change of air is almost miraculous, working an instant change in favor of the patient, who during his stay there remains well, but no sooner returns to his necessary occupations at Batavia than his complaints return in just the same degree as they were in before his departure. End of section 53. Part 1 of Some Account of Batavia. Section 54 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 54. Some Account of Batavia. Part 2. Few parts of the world, I believe, are better furnished with necessaries, as well as luxuries of life than the island of Java. The unhealthiness of the country about Batavia is in this particular rather an advantage to it, for the very cause of it, a low, flat situation, is likewise the cause of a fruitfulness of soil hardly to be paralleled, which is sufficiently testified by the flourishing condition of the immense quantities of fruit trees all round the town, as well as by the quantity and excellence of their crops of sugar-cane, rice, Indian corn, etc., etc. Indeed, the whole island is allowed to be uncommonly fruitful by those who have seen it, and in general as wholesome, excepting only in such low finny spots as the neighbourhood of Batavia, far fitter to sow rice upon than to build towns. The tame quadrupeds are horses, cattle, buffaloes, sheep, goats, and hogs. The horses are small, 
never exceeding in size what we call a stout galloway, but nimble and spirited. They are said to have been found here when the Europeans first came round the Cape of Good Hope. The cattle are said to be the same as those in Europe, but differ from them in appearance so much that I am inclined to doubt. They have, however, the polyurea, which naturalists make to be the distinguishing mark of our species. On the other hand, they are found wild not only on Java, but on several of the eastern islands. The flesh of those that I eat in Batavia was rather finer grained than European beef, but much drier, and always terribly lean. Buffaloes are very plentiful, but the Dutch are so much prejudiced against them that they will not at all eat their flesh, nor even drink their milk, affirming that it causes fevers. The natives, however, and Chinese do both, and have no such opinion concerning them. Their sheep, which are that sort whose ears hang down and have hair instead of wool, are most intolerably bad, lean, and tough to the last degree. They have, however, a few cape sheep, which are excellent, though intolerably dear. We gave two pounds five s apiece for four, which we bought for sea stock, the heaviest of which weighed only forty-five pounds. Their goats are much of a par with their sheep, but their hogs are certainly excellent, especially the Chinese, which are so immensely fat that no one thinks of buying the fat with a lean. The butcher, when you buy it, cuts off as much as you please and sells it to his countrymen, the Chinese, who melt it down and eat it instead of butter with their rice. Notwithstanding the excellence of this pork, the Dutch are so prejudiced in favor of everything which comes from fatherland that they will not at all eat it, but use entirely the Dutch breed, which are sold as much dearer than the Chinese here, as Chinese are dearer than them in Europe. Besides these domestic animals, their woods afford some wild horses and cattle, but these only in the distant mountains, and they are very scarce. Buffaloes are not wild upon Java, though they are upon Makassar, and several of the eastern islands plentifully. The neighborhood of Batavia, however, is pretty plentifully supplied with deer of two kinds, and wild hogs both which are very good meat, and often shot by the Portuguese, who sell them tolerably cheap. Monkeys also there are, though but few in the neighborhood of Batavia. On the mountains, and in the more desert part of the island, are tigers, it is said in too great abundance, and some rhinoceroses, but neither of these animals are ever heard of in the neighborhood of Batavia, or indeed any well-peopled part of the island. Fish are in immense plenty, many sorts of them very excellent, and inconceivably cheap but the Dutch, true to the dictates of luxury, buy none of these which are scarce. We, who in the course of our long migration in the warm latitudes had learned the real excellence of many of the cheapest sorts, wondered much at seeing them the food of none but slaves. On inquiry, however, of a sensible housekeeper, he told us that he, as well as us, knew that for one shilling he could purchase a better dish of fish than he did for ten. But, said he, I dare not do it, for should it be known that I did, I should be looked upon in the same light as one in Europe who covered his table with offals, fit for nothing but beggars or dogs. Turtle is also here in abundance, but despised by Europeans. Indeed, for what reason I know not. It is neither so sweet nor so fat as our West India turtle, even in England. They have also a kind of large lizards or iguanas, some of which are said to be as thick as a man's thigh. I shot one about five feet long, and it proved very good meat. Poultry is prodigiously plentiful. Very large fowls, ducks also, and geese are cheap. Pigeons are rather dear, and turkeys extravagant. In general, what we eat at Batavia were lean and dry, but this, I am convinced, proceeds from being ill-fed, as I have eaten there of every kind as good or better than commonly met with in Europe. Wild fowl, in general, is here scarce, I saw during my stay one wild duck in the fields, but never one to be sold. Snipes, however, of two kinds, one exactly the same as those in Europe, and a kind of thrushes are plentifully sold every day by the Portuguese, who, for I know not what reason, seem to monopolize all the wild game. Nor is the earth less fruitful of vegetables than she is of animals. Rice, which everybody knows is to the inhabitants of these countries, the common corn, which serves instead of bread, is very plentiful. One kind of it is planted here, and in many of the eastern islands, which in the western parts of India is totally unknown. It is called by the natives paddy gunang, that is, mountain rice. This, contrary to the other sort, which must be under water three parts of the time of its growth, 
is planted upon the sides of hills where no water but rain can possibly come they take however the advantage of planting it in the beginning of the rainy season by which means they reap it in the beginning of the dry how far this kind of rice might be useful in our west indian islands where they grow no bread corn at all i leave to the judgment of those who know their respective interests and whether the cassava or manihot their substitute for bread is not as wholesome and cheaper than anything else which could be introduced among them besides rice they grow also indian corn or maize which they gather when young and toast in the ear they have also vast variety of kidney beans and lentils which they call kajang and make a great part of the food of the common people they also have millet yams both wet and dry sweet potatoes and some european potatoes not to be despised but dear their gardens produce cabbage lettuce cucumbers radishes china white radishes which boil almost as well as turnips carrots parsley celery pigeon peas citisus cajan kidney beans of two sorts dolichos chinensis and lignosus eggplant solanum melangina which eats delicately broiled with pepper and salt a kind of greens much like spinach convolvulus reptans onions very small but good asparagus scarce and very bad they had also some strong-smelling european plants as sage hyssop and rue which they thought smelt much stronger here than in their native soils though i cannot say i was sensible of it but the produce of the earth from whence they derive the greatest advantage is sugar of it they grow immense quantities and have vast crops with little care of the finest largest canes imaginable which i am inclined to believe contain in an equal quantity a far larger proportion of sugar than our west india ones white sugar is sold here for about two and a half d a pound besides which the molasses makes their arrack in which as in rum it is the chief ingredient a small quantity of rice only and some coconut wine being added which i suppose gives it its particular flavour indigo also they grow a little of but i believe no more than is necessary for their own use the fruits of the east indies are in general so much cried up by those who have eat of them and so much preferred to our european ones that i shall give a full list of all the sorts which were in season during our stay and afterwards my judgment of each which i must confess is not so much in their favour as that of the generality of europeans after their return home though while here i did not find that they were more fond of them or spoke more in their praise when compared with european fruits than i did pineapple bromelia ananas sweet oranges citrus orant sinens pumelos citrus decumanus lemon citrus medica limon lime citrus mango mangifera indica bananas musa grapes vitus vinifera tamarinds tamarindus indica watermelons cucurbita citrullus pumpkins cucurbita pepo pawpaws carica papaya guava cidium pomiferum sweet sop anona squamosa custard apple anona ridiculata cashew apple anacardium occidentale coconut cocos nucifera mangostan garcinia mangostana jambu eugenia malacensis jambu ar eugenia jambu ar mawar eugenia jambos pomegranate punica granitum durian nanka cetodium coliflor jampada cetodium rambutan jambulan boa bidinar ramphus jujuba nam nam cinometra coliflora catapa terminalia catapa canari canarium communi magia limonia suntol blimbing averhoa blimbi blimbing bessi averhoa carambola cherima averhoa acida solac calamus rotang zelica besides these they have several fruits which the natives only eat as keller guilindina moringa succum of two or three kinds the same as is called breadfruit in the south seas all the kinds here however are so incomparably inferior to the south seas ones that was it not for the great similitude of the outward appearance of both tree and fruit they would scarce deserve that name bilinju netum nimon boabuni etc etc all which i shall pass over in silence 
as not deserving to be mentioned to any but hungry people, and passed to those of a more graceful flavor, among the first of which the pineapple, called hernanas, will always appear. These are here very large and so plentiful, that in cheap times I have been told that a man who buys them at the first hand may get them for a farthing apiece. When we were there, we could get, without much haggling, two or three for two halfpenny at the common fruit shops. In quality they are certainly good and well flavored, as good, but not a bit better, than those which are called good in England. So luxuriant are they in their growth, that most of them have two or three crowns, and a large number of suckers from the bottom of the fruit. I have counted nine. These are so forward that they often, while still adhering to the mother shoot out their fruit, which by the time the large one is ripe, are come to a tolerably large size. Of these I have seen three upon one apple, and have been told that nine have been seen, but that was esteemed so great a curiosity that it was preserved in sugar and sent to the Prince of Orange. Two. Oranges are tolerably good, but while we were here, were very dear, seldom less than sixpence apiece. Three. Pumplemoses, called in the West Indies shaddocks, were well flavored but had no juice in them, which we were told depended upon the season. 4. Lemons were very scarce, but the want of them was amply made up by the plenty of five limes, of which the best were to be bought for about twelve pence a hundred. Seville oranges I saw two or three only, which were almost all peel. Besides these there were many sorts of oranges and lemons, none of which are at all esteemed by Europeans or indeed by the natives themselves. Six mango. This fruit during our stay was so infested with maggots, which bred in the inside of them, that out of ten scarce four would be free, nor were those which were by any means so good as those of Brazil. Europeans commonly compare this fruit with a melting peach, to which in softness and sweetness it certainly approaches, but in flavor as certainly falls much short of any that can be called good. The climate, as I have been told here, is too hot and damp for them and on the coast of India they are much better. Here are as many sorts of them, almost as of apples, in England, some much superior to others. Some of the worst sorts are so bad that the natives themselves can hardly eat them when ripe, but use them as an acid, when just full grown. One sort, called by the manga kawani, has so strong a smell that a European can scarce bear one in the room. These, however, the natives are fond of. The best sorts for eating are first, manga dudul, incomparably better than any other. Next, manga shantok and manga gure. And besides these three, I know no other which a European would at all be pleased with. Seven of bananas, here in likewise innumerable kinds, three only of which are good to eat as fruit, viz. pasang mas, pasang raja, and pasang ambon, all of which have a tolerably vinous taste. The rest, however, are useful in their way. Some are fried with batter, others boiled in lieu of bread, which is here a dearer article than meat, etc. One of the sorts, however, deserves to be taken notice of by botanists, it being contrary to the nature of the rest of its tribe full of seeds, from whence it is called pisang batu, or pisang bidjis. It has, however, no excellence to recommend it to the taste, or any other way except it is, as the Malayers think, good for the flux. 8. Grapes are to be had here, but in no great perfection. They are, however, sufficiently dear, a bunch about the size of a fist, costing a shilling or eighteen pence. Nine, tamarinds are prodigiously common, and as cheap. The people, however, either do not know how to put them up, as the West Indians do, or do not practice it, but cure them with salt, by which means they become a black mass, so disagreeable to the sight and taste, that few Europeans choose to meddle with them. Ten, watermelons are plentiful, and good as are also eleven pumpkins, which are certainly almost or quite the most useful fruit which can be carried to sea, keeping without any care for several months, and making with sugar and lemon juice a pie hardly to be distinguished from apple pie, as well as with pepper and salt, a substitute for turnips not to be despised. Twelve pawpaws. This fruit, when ripe, is full of seeds and almost without flavor, but while green, if pared, the core taken out and boiled, is also as good or better than turnips. 13. Guava is a fruit praised much by the inhabitants of our West Indies, who I suppose have a better sort than we met with here, where the smell of them alone was so abominably strong that Dr. Solander, whose stomach is very delicate, could not even bear them in the room, nor did their taste make any amends 
partaking much of the goatish rankness of their smell. Baked in pies, however, they lost much of this rankness, and we less nice ones eat them very well. 14. Sweet Sop Also a West Indian fruit is nothing but a vast quantity of large kernels, from which a small proportion of very sweet pulp may be sucked, but almost totally devoid of flavor. 15. Custard apple likewise is common to our West Indies, where it has got its name, which well enough expresses its qualities, for certainly it is like a custard, and a good one too, as can be imagined. 16. Cashew apple is seldom or never eat, on account of its astringency. The nut that grows on the top of it is well known in Europe, where it is brought from the West Indies. 17. Coconut is well known, everywhere, between the tropics. Of it are infinite different sorts. The best we met with for drinking is called Kalapa Edju, and easily known by the redness of the flesh between the skin and the shell. 18. Mangostan. As this and some more fruits are peculiar to the East Indies, I shall give a short description of them. This is about the size of a crab apple, and of a deep red wine color. At the top of them is a mark, made by five or six small triangles joined in a circle, and at the bottom several hollow green leaves the remains of the flower. When they are to be eat, the skin, or rather flesh, which is thick, must be taken off, under which are found six or seven white kernels, placed in a circular figure. The pulp with which these are enveloped is what is eat, and few things, I believe, are more delicious. So agreeably is acid mixed with sweet in this fruit, that without any other flavor it comes in competition with, if not excels, the finest flavored fruits. So wholesome also are these mangostans that they, as well as sweet oranges, are allowed without stint to people in the highest fevers. 19. Jambu is esteemed also a most wholesome fruit. It is of a deep red and oval shape, the largest as big as a small apple. It has not much flavor, but is certainly very pleasant, on account of its coolness. There are several sorts of it, but without much reference to the kinds, the largest and reddest are always the best. 20. Jambu Ayer. Of these are two sorts, alike in shape, resembling a bell, but differing, one red and the other white. In size, they a little exceed a large cherry. In taste, they are totally devoid of flavor or even sweetness, being nothing more than water, a little acidulated, and yet their coolness recommends them very much. 21. Jambu Ayer Mawar. Is more pleasant to the smell than the taste, in the latter resembling something the conserve of roses, as in the former the fresh scent of those flowers. Twenty-two pomegranate is the same fruit in England, and everywhere else that I have met with it, in my opinion, but ill repaying any one who takes the trouble of breaking its tough hide. Twenty-three, durian in shape resembles something, a small melon, but has a skin covered over with sharp conical spines, whence the name dur, signifying in the Malay language a spine. This fruit, when ripe, divides itself longitudinally into seven or eight compartments, each of which contains six or seven nuts, not quite so large as chestnuts, coated over with a substance both in color and consistency, resembling much very thick cream. This is the delicate part of the fruit, which the natives are vastly fond of, but few Europeans at first, however, can endure its taste, which resembles sugared cream mixed with onions. The smell also prejudices them much against it, being most like that of rotten onions. 24. Nanka, called in some parts of India Jack, has, like the durian, a smell very disagreeable to strangers, like very mellow apples with a little garlic. The taste, however, in my opinion, makes amends for the smell, though I must say that among us English I believe I was single in that opinion. Authors tell strange stories of the immense size to which this fruit grows in some countries, which are favorable to it. Rumphius says that they are sometimes so large that a man cannot easily lift one of them. The Malays told me that at Mandura they were so large that two men could but carry one of them. At Batavia, however, they never exceed the size of a large melon, which in shape they resemble, but are coated over with angular spines, like the shootings of some crystals, which, however, are soft, and do not at all prick anyone who handles them. 25. Jampada differs from Nanka in little else than size. 26. Rambutan is a fruit seldom mentioned by Europeans. It is in appearance much like a chestnut with a husk on, 
being like it covered with soft prickles, but smaller and of a deep red color. When eat, the skin must be cut, and under it is a fruit, the flesh of which indeed bears but a small proportion to the stone, but makes rich amends for the smallness of its quantity by the elegance of its acid, superior to any other maybe in the whole vegetable kingdom. 27. Jambalon is in size and appearance not unlike a damson in England, but has always rather too astringent a flavor to allow it to be compared even with that fruit. 28. Boa bidara is a round yellow fruit about the size of a musket ball. In flavor, it is compared to an apple, but like the former, has too much astringency to be compared with anything but a crab. 29. Num num is shaped something like a kidney, very rough and rugged on the outside, and about three inches long. It is seldom eat raw, but fried with batter, makes very good fritters. 30. Catapa, 31. Canary, are both nuts, the kernels of which are compared to almonds, and indeed are full of sweet, but the difficulty of getting their kernels out of their tough rinds and hard shells is so great that they are nowhere publicly sold, nor did I taste any others than those which, for curiosity's sake, I gathered from the tree, and had opened under it. 31. Magia, under a hardish brittle shell, contains a lightly acid pulp, which is not eat unless mixed with sugar, nor is it then to be called pleasant. 33. Suntul, is by far the worst fruit of any I have or shall mention. It is in size and shape much like magia, as large as a middling apple but rounder. It has a thick hide containing within it kernels, like the mangustan, the taste of which is both acid and astringent, without one merit to recommend it. Indeed, I should not have thought it eatable, had I not seen it often publicly exposed to sale upon the fruit stalls. 34. Blimbing. 35. Blimbing Bessie. 36. Chirima. Are all three species of one genus, which, though they differ much in shape, agree in being equally acid, too much so to be used without dressing, except only Blimbing Bessie, which is sweeter than the other two. They make, however, excellent sour sauce, and as good pickles. 37. Salak is the fruit of a most prickly bush. Itself is as big as a walnut and covered over with scales, like those of a lizard or snake. These scales, however, easily strip off, and leave two or three soft and yellow kernels, in flavor to me resembling a little strawberries. In this, however, I was particular, for no one but myself liked them. In short, I believe, I may say that bad as the character is that I have given of these fruits, I eat as many of them as any one, and at the time thought as well, and spoke as well of them, as the best friends they had. My opinions were then as they are now. Whether my shipmates may change theirs between here and home, I cannot tell. Besides, they no doubt have many more, which were not in season during our stay. We were told also that several kinds of European fruits had been planted up in the mountains, where they came to great perfection, but this I can only advance upon the credit of report. Several other fruits they have, also which they preserve in sugar as kimkit, boa atop, etc., etc., but these require to be that way prepared before they are at all eatable. Batavia consumes a quantity of fruits hardly to be believed, the greatest part of which, before they are sold, are overripe or otherwise bad, nor can a stranger easily get any that are good, unless he goes to a street called Pasar Pasang, which lies north from the great church and very near it. Here live none but Chinese who sell fruit, they are in general supplied from gentlemen's gardens in the neighborhood of the town, and consequently have the best, and always fresh. For this excellence of their goods, however, they are well paid, for they will not take less for any kind than three or four times as much as the market price. Nor did we ever grudge to give it, as their fruit was always ten times better than any in the market. The chief supplies of Batavia come from a pretty considerable distance, where great quantities of land are cultivated merely for the sake of fruits. The country people to whom these land belong meet the townspeople at two great markets, one on Mondays, called Bazaar Sinin, the other on Saturdays, called Bazaar Tanabank, held in very different places for the convenience of different districts, each, however, about five miles from Batavia. Here the best of the fruits may be got at the cheapest rates. The sight of these markets is to a European very entertaining. The immense quantities of fruit exposed here is almost beyond belief. Forty or fifty cartloads of pineapples, packed as carelessly as we would do turnips in England, is nothing extraordinary, and everything else is in the same profusion. 
The time of these markets is, however, so ill-contrived that, as on Monday and Saturday, all the fruit for the ensuing week, both for retailers and housekeepers, must be bought in. Before Friday, there is no good fruit in the hands of any people but the Chinese in Pisar Pisang. Thus much for meat. In the article of drink, nature has not been quite so bounteous to the inhabitants of this island as she has to some of us sons of the less abundant north. They are not, however, totally devoid of strong liquors, though their religion, Mahometanism, forbids them the use of such, by this means driving them from liquid to solid intoxicators, as opium, tobacco, etc., etc. Besides their arrack, which is too well known in Europe to need any description, they have palm wine, made from a species of palm called in the Malay and Javan language, Aran. This liquor is extracted from the branches, which were to have borne flowers, but are cut by the people who make it their business, and joints of bamboo cane hung under them, into which the liquor intended for nature, for the nourishment of both flowers and fruit, distills in tolerable abundance. And so true is nature to her paths, that as long as the fruit of that branch would have remained unripe, so long she supplies the liquor or sap but no longer. This liquor is sold in three states. The first is almost as it comes from the tree, prepared only a little by some method unknown to me, which causes it to keep thirty-six or forty-eight hours, instead of only twelve. In this state it is sweet and pleasant, only tasting a little of smoke, which though at first disagreeable becomes agreeable by use, and not at all intoxicating. It is called tuac manis, or sweet palm wine. The other two, one of which is called tuac cras, and the other tuac kuning, are prepared by laying certain herbs and roots in them, and then fermenting so that their taste is altered from sweet to a rather astringent and disagreeable taste, and they have acquired the property of intoxicating in a pretty high degree. Besides this, they have tuac from the coconut tree, but very little of this is drank as a liquor, it being mostly used for putting into the arak, in which, when intended to be good, it is a necessary ingredient. Next to eating and drinking, and one more delicious as well as less blamable luxury, the inhabitants of this part of India seem to place their chief delight in sweet smells, of burning rosins, etc., and sweet-scented woods, but more than all in sweet flowers, of which they have several sorts very different from ours in Europe, of which I shall give a short account, confining myself, however, to such as were in season during our stay here, beginning with a list of them. All these sorts were sold about the streets every night at sunset, either strung upon strings and wreaths of about two feet, a Dutch L, long, or made up into different sorts of nosegays, either of which cost about a halfpenny apiece. But I shall now proceed to give a short description of each. 1. Champaka. It grows upon a tree as large as an apple tree, and like its spreading, the flower itself consisting of fifteen longish, narrow petala which give it the appearance of being double, though in reality it is not. Its color is yellow, much deeper than that of a jonquil, which flower, however, it somewhat resembles in scent, only is not so violently strong. 2. Kananga is a green flower, not at all resembling any European flower, either in appearance, which is much more like a bunch of leaves than a flower, or smell, which, however, is very agreeable. 3. Mulati is well known in English hothouses, under the name of Arabian jasmine. It is here in prodigious abundance, and certainly as fragrant as any flower they have. But of this, as well as all the Indian flowers, it may be said that though full as sweet as any European ones, even of the same sorts, they have not that overcoming strength. In short, their smell, though very much the same, is much more delicate and elegant than any we can boast of. 4 and 5. Kombang Karknasi and Kombang Tonkwan are much alike in shape and smell. Small flowers of the dog's bane kind, hardly to be compared to any in our English gardens, but like all the past, most elegant in their fragrance. 6. Sundal Malam. The same as our English tuberose. This flower is less in size considerably, as well as more mildly fragrant than ours in Europe. The Malay name signifies intriguer of the night, from an idea rather pretty. The heat of the climate here allows few or no flowers to smell in the day, and this especially, from its want of smell and modest white array, seems not at all desirous of admirers. But when night comes its fragrance is diffused around and attracts the attention, as well as gains the admiration of every passer-by. 7. Bongong Tangjong is shaped quite like a star of seven or eight rays, about one half an inch in diameter. 
It is of a yellowish color, and like its fellows, a modest, agreeable smell. But its chief use is contrasting the mulatti on the reefs which the ladies here wear in their hair, and this it does very prettily. Besides these, there are, in private gardens, many other sweet flowers which are not in sufficient plenty to be brought to market, as Cape jasmine, several sorts of Arabian jasmine, though none so sweet as the common, etc., etc. Table of Flowers and Species Names 1. Champaca, Michaelia Champaca 2. Cananga, Euveria Cananga 3. Mulati, Nyctanthi Sambac 4. Caracnasi 5. Combang Tonquin, Pergularia Glabra 6. Sundal Malum, Poanthes Tuberosa 7. Bonga Tanjong, Mimisops Alengi They have also a mixture of several of these flowers and leaves of a plant called Pandang, Pandanus, chopped small, with which they fill their hair and cloths, etc. But their great luxury is strewing their beds full of this mixture and flowers, so that you sleep in the midst of perfumes. A luxury scarce to be expressed, nor at all conceived in Europe, where stewing under three or four blankets, even fragrant odors cannot enjoy that liberty they do in India under none, or at most the covering of a single piece of fine chintz. Before I leave the productions of this country, I cannot help saying a word or two about spice, though in reality none but pepper is a native of the island of Java, and but little even of that. Of pepper, however, I may say that large as the quantities of it are that are annually imported into Europe, little or none is used in this part of the Indies. Capsicum, or cayenne pepper, as it is called in Europe, has almost totally supplied its place. As for cloves and nutmegs, the monopoly of the Dutch has made them too dear to be plentifully used by the Malays, who are otherwise very fond of them. Cloves, though said to be originally the produce of Makian or Bakian, a small island far to the eastward, and only fifteen miles to the northward of the line, from whence they were, when the Dutch came here disseminated, over most or all of the eastern isles, are now entirely confined to Amboina and its neighboring small isles. The Dutch, having by different treaties of peace, made with the conquered kings of all the other islands, stipulated that they should have only a certain number of trees in their dominions, and in future quarrels as a punishment, lessened their quantity till at last they have left them none, nor any right to have any. Nutmegs have been in the same manner extirpated in all the island, except their native banda, which easily supplies this world, and would as easily supply another, if the Dutch had but another to supply. Of nutmegs, however, there certainly are a few upon the eastern coast of New Guinea, a place on which the Dutch hardly dare set their feet, on account of the treachery and warlike disposition of the natives. There may be also both cloves and nutmegs, upon others of the islands far to the eastward, for those I believe neither the Dutch nor any other nation seem to think it worth while to examine at all into. End of section 54. Part 2 of Some Account of Batavia. Section 55 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 55. Some Account of Batavia, Part 3. The town of Batavia, though the capital of the Dutch dominions in India, is so far from being peopled with Dutchmen that I may safely affirm that of the Europeans inhabiting it and its neighborhood, not one-fifth part are Dutchmen. Besides these are native, Portuguese, Indians, and Chinese, the last two many times exceeding the Europeans in number. Of each of these I shall speak separately, beginning with the Europeans, of which there were some especially in the troops of almost every nation in Europe. The Germans, however, are so much the most numerous, that they two or three times exceed in number all other Europeans together. Fewer English are settled here than of any other nation and next to them French. The politic Dutch, well knowing that the English and French, being maritime powers, must often have ships in the East Indies, and will demand and obtain from them the subjects of their respective kings, will not enter either Englishmen or Frenchmen into their service unless they give in their place of nativity to be in some place out of their own country. This trick, foolish as it is, was played with us, 
in the case of an Irishman, who we got on board, and they demanded for a Dane, offering to prove by their books that he was born at Elsinore, but our captain convinced by the man's language what countryman he was, refused to give him up so resolutely that they soon ceased their demands. Notwithstanding the very great number of other Europeans, the Dutch are political enough to keep all or near all the great posts, as rods of India, governors, etc., in their own hands. Other nations may make fortunes here by traffic if they can, but not by employments. No man can come over here in any other character than that of a soldier in the company's service, in which before they can be accepted they must agree to remain five years. As soon, however, as ever they arrive at Batavia, they, by applying to the council, may be allowed to absent themselves from their corps, and enter immediately into any vocation in which they have any money or credit to set them up in. Women may come out without any of these restrictions, or indeed any others, be they of what nation they will. We were told that there were not in Batavia twenty women born in Europe. The rest of the white women, who were not very scarce, were born of white parents, possibly through three or four families, as many generations distant from their European mothers. These imitate the Indian in every particular. Their dress, except in form, is the same. Their hair is worn in the same manner, and they chew betel as plentifully as any Indians, notwithstanding which I never saw a white man chew it during my whole stay. Merchandise is carried on in an easier and more indolent way here, I believe, than in any other part of the world. The Chinese carry on every manufacture of the place, and sell the produce to the resident merchants, for indeed, they dare not sell to any foreigner. Consequently, when a ship comes in and bespeaks one hundred leggers of a rack or anything else, he has nothing to do but to send orders to his Chinaman to deliver him on board such a ship, which done he brings the master of the ship's receipt for the goods to his employer, who does nothing but receive money from the stranger, and reserving his profit, pay the Chinaman his demands. With imports, however, they must have a little more trouble. For them they must examine, receive, and preserve in their own warehouses, as other merchants do. To give a character of them in their dealings, I need only say that the jewel known to English merchants, by the name of fair dealing, is totally unknown here. They have joined all the art of trade that a Dutchman is famous for to the deceit of an Indian. Cheating by false weights and measures, false samples, etc., etc., are looked upon only as arts of trade. If you do not find them out, tis well. If you do, well, they say, then we must give you what is wanting, and refund without a blush, or the least wrangle, as I myself have seen in matters relating to the ship. But their great forte is asking one price for their commodities, and charging another, so that a man who has laid in one hundred picol of sugar, as he thinks at five dollars a picol, after it has been a week or ten days on board, will have a bill brought him in at seven nor will the merchant go from his charge unless a written agreement or witnesses can be brought to prove the bargain. For my own part, I was fortunate enough to have heard this character of them before I came here, and wanting nothing but daily provision agreed immediately in writing for every article at a certain price, which consequently my landlord could never depart from. I also, as long as I was well, constantly once a week looked over my bill and took it into my possession, never, however, without scratching out the charges of things, which I had never had, to a considerable amount, which was always done without a moment's hesitation. Next to the Dutch are the Portuguese, who are called by the native Oran Serrane, that is, Nazarenes, to distinguish them from other Europeans, notwithstanding which they are included in the general name of Kapir or Kafir, an opprobrious term given by the Mahometans to all those who have not entered into their faith, of whatsoever religion they may be. These, though formerly they were Portuguese, have no longer any pretensions to more than the name. They have all changed their religion and become Lutherans, and have no communication or even knowledge of the country of their forefathers. They speak indeed a corrupt dialect of the Portuguese language, but much oftener Malay. None of them are suffered to employ themselves in any but mean occupations. Many make their livelihood by hunting, taking in washing, and some by handicraft trades. Their customs are precisely the same as those of the Indians. Like them, they chew betel, and are only to be distinguished from them by their noses being sharper, their skins considerably blacker, and their hair dressed in a manner different from that used by the Indians. 
the Dutch, Portuguese, and Indians, here, are entirely waited upon by slaves, whom they purchase from Sumatra, Malacca, and almost all their eastern islands. The natives of Java only have an exemption from slavery, enforced by strong penal laws, which I believe are very seldom broke through. The price of these slaves is from ten to twenty pounds sterling apiece, excepting young girls, who are sold on account of their beauty. These sometimes go as high as one hundred, but I believe never higher. They are a most lazy set of people, but contented with a little boiled rice, with a little of the cheapest fish, is the food which they prefer to all others. They differ immensely in form of body and disposition, consequently in value, according to the countries they come from. African Negroes, called here Papua, are the cheapest and worst disposed of any, being given up to stealing and almost incorrigible by stripes. Next to them are the Bugis and the Macassars, both inhabitants of the island of Celebes. They are lazy and revengeful in the highest degree, easily giving up their lives to satisfy their revenge. The island of Bali sends the honestest and most faithful, consequently the dearest slaves. And Nias, a small island on the coast of Sumatra, the handsomest women, but of tender delicate constitutions, ill able to bear the unwholesome climate of Batavia. Besides these are many more sorts, whose names and qualifications I have entirely forgot. The laws and customs regarding the punishment of slaves are these. A master may punish a slave as far as he thinks proper by stripes, but should death be the consequence, he is called to a very severe account, if the fact is proved, very rarely escaping with life. There is, however, an officer in every quarter of the town, called Marineau, who is a kind of constable. He attends to quell all riots, takes up all people guilty of crimes, etc., but is more particularly used for the apprehending of runaway slaves, and punishing them for that or any other crime for which their master thinks they deserve a greater punishment than he chooses to inflict. These punishments are inflicted by slaves bred up to the business. On men they are inflicted before the door of their master's house, on women for decency's sake, within it. They are stripes given in number according to custom and the nature of the crime, with rods made of split rattans, which fetch blood at every stroke. Consequently, they may be, and sometimes are, very severe. A common punishment costs the master of the slave a rixdollar, 4s, and a severe one, about a ducatoon, 6s, 8d. For their encouragement, however, and to prevent them from stealing, the master of every slave is obliged to give him three double chays, 7.5d, a week. Extraordinary as it may seem, there are very few Javans, that is, descendants of the original inhabitants of Java, who live in the neighborhood of Batavia. But as many countries as the Dutch import slaves from, so many sorts of Indians are there, who are either slaves made free or the descendants of such. They are altogether called by the name of Oran Slam, or Islam, a name by which they distinguish themselves from all other religions, it signifying believers of the true faith. They are again subdivided into innumerable divisions, every country keeping themselves in some degree distinct from the rest. The dispositions generally observed in the slaves are, however, verified in the free men who completely inherit the different vices or virtues of their respective countries. Many of these employ themselves in cultivating gardens and selling fruits and flowers. Betel and Arek, called here Siri and Penang, is all grown by them, of which an immense quantity is chewed by Portuguese, Chinese, and Slams, slaves, and freemen. The lime that they use here is, however, slacked, by which means their teeth are not eat up in the same manner as the Savu people, who use it unslacked. They mix with it also a substance called gambir, which is brought from the continent of India, and the better sort of women use with their chew many sorts of perfumes, as cardamons, etc., etc., to give their breath an agreeable smell. Many also get a likelihood by fishing, and carrying goods upon the water, etc., etc. Some, however, there are who are very rich, and live splendidly in their own way, which consists almost entirely in a number of slaves. In the article of food, no people can be more abstemious than they are. Boiled rice is of rich as well as poor, the principal part of the subsistence. This, with a small proportion of fish, buffalo, or fowl, and sometimes dried fish and dried shrimps, brought here from China, is the chief of their food. Everything, however, must be highly seasoned with cayenne pepper. 
They have also many pastry dishes made of rice flour, and other things I am totally ignorant of, which are very pleasant. Fruit also they eat much, of especially plantains. Their feasts are plentiful, and in their way magnificent, though they consist more of show than meat. Artificial flowers, etc., are in profusion, and meat plentiful, though of no great variety of dishes. Their religion of Mahometanism denies them the use of strong liquors, nor, I believe, do they trespass much in that way, having always tobacco, betel, and opium to intoxicate themselves. Their weddings are carried on with vast form and show, the families concerned, borrowing as many gold and silver ornaments as possible to adorn the bride and bridegroom, so that their dresses are always costly. The feasts and ceremonies relating to them last in rich men's families a fortnight or more, all which time the man, though married the first day, is by the women kept from his wife. The language spoke among them is entirely Malay, or at least so called, for I believe it is a most corrupt dialect of that language, for notwithstanding that Java has two or three, and almost every little island beside its own language, distinct from the rest, yet none use or I believe remember their own language, so that this lingua franca Malay is the only language you will hear spoken in the neighborhood, and I have been told over a very large part of the East Indies. Their women, and in imitation of them the Dutch also, wear as much hair as ever they can nurse up on their heads, which by the use of oils, etc., is incredibly great. It is universally black, and they wear it in a kind of circular wreath upon the tops of their heads, fastened there with a bodkin, in a taste inexpressibly elegant. I have often wished that one of our ladies could see a Malay woman's head dressed in this manner, with her wreath of flowers, commonly Arabian jasmine, round that of hair, for in that method of dress there is certainly an elegant simplicity and unaffected show of the beauties of nature, incomparably superior to anything I have seen in the laboured headdresses of my fair countrywomen. Both sexes bathe themselves in the river constantly, at least once a day, a most necessary custom in hot climates, where the profuse perspiration attracts and retains dirt of all kinds in a high degree their teeth also, disgustful as they must appear to an European, from their blackness, occasioned by their continual chewing of betel, are a great object of their attention. Every one must have them filed into a fashionable form, which is done with whetstones by a most troublesome and painful operation. First, both the upper and under teeth are rubbed till they are perfectly even and quite blunt, so that the two jaws lose not less than one half a line each in the operation. Then a deep groove is made in the middle of the upper teeth, crossing them all, and itself cutting through at least one-fourth of the thickness of the teeth, so that the enamel is quite cut through, a fact which we Europeans, who are taught by our gentrificators that any damage done to the enamel is mortal to the tooth, find it difficult to believe. Yet among these people, where this custom is universal, I have scarce seen even in old people a rotten tooth. Much may certainly be attributed to what they chew so continually, which themselves, and indeed every one else, agree is very beneficial to the teeth. The blackness, however caused by this, of which they are so proud, is not a fixed stain, but may be rubbed off at pleasure, and then their teeth are as white as ivory, but very soon again regain their original blackness. No one who has ever been in these countries can be ignorant of the practice here, which is called a mock which is that an Indian intoxicated with opium rushes into the street with a drawn dagger in his hand and kills everybody he meets, especially Europeans, till he himself is either killed or taken. This happened at Batavia three times while we were there to my knowledge, and much oftener, I believe, for the mariner or constable, whose business it is to apprehend such people himself, told me that there was scarce a week when either himself or some of his brethren were not called upon to seize or kill them. So far, however, from being an accidental madness, which drove the people to kill whomsoever they met, without distinction of persons, the three that I knew of, and I have been told all others, have been severely injured, chiefly in love affairs, and first revenged themselves on the party who had injured them. It is true that they had made themselves drunk with opium before they committed this action, and when it was done rushed out into the streets, foaming at the mouth like mad dogs with their drawn cries or dagger in their hands. But they never attempted to hurt anyone or seize them. 
whoever ran away or even went on the other side of the street was safe. To prove that these people distinguished persons, mad as they are with the use of opium, there is a famous story in Batavia of one who run amok on account of stripes and ill usage, which he had received from his mistress and her elder daughter, but on the contrary had always been well used by the younger. He stabbed first the eldest daughter. The youngest, hearing the bustle, ran to the assistance of her mother and placed herself between him and her, attempting to persuade him from his design but he repeatedly pushed her on one side before he could get at her mother, who, when he had killed, he ran out as usual. These people are generally slaves, who indeed are by much the most subject to insults, which they cannot revenge. Free men, however, sometimes do it. One of them who did it while I was there was free, and of some substance. The cause was jealousy of his own brother, whom he killed, with two more that attempted to oppose him before he was taken. He, however, never came out of his house, which he attempted to defend, but so mad was he with the effects of the opium, that out of three muskets which he attempted to use against the officers of justice, not one was either loaded or primed. The Marino, as he is called, a petty officer of justice, somewhat resembling our constable, who regulates all riotous proceedings, etc., etc., has also these amucks committed to his charge. If he takes them alive, his reward is great. If he kills them, that reward is lost, notwithstanding which three out of four are killed, so resolute and active is their resistance when attacked, and that they have contrivances, like large tongs or pinchers, to catch them and hold them till disarmed. Those who are taken are generally wounded severely, for the Marino's assistants, who are all armed with hangers, know how to lame the man if once they can get within reach of him. The punishment of this crime is always breaking upon the wheel nor is it ever relaxed, but so strictly adhered to, that if an amok, when taken is judged by the physicians, to be in danger from his wounds, he is executed the very next day, as near as possible to the place where he committed his first murther. Among their absurd opinions proceeding from their original idolatry, of which they have some, is certainly the custom of consecrating meat, money, etc., to the devil, whom they call Satan. This is done either in cases of dangerous sickness, when they by these means try to appease the devil, who they believe to be the cause of all sickness, and make him spare the diseased man's life, or in consequence of dreams. If any man is restless and dreams much for two or three nights, he immediately concludes that Satan has taken that method of laying his commands upon him, which if he neglects to fulfill, he will certainly suffer sickness or death as a punishment for his inattention. Consequently, he begins to labor over in his brains, all the circumstances of his dream, and try his utmost to put some explanation or other upon them. In this, if he fails, he sends for the Cowan or priest, who assists him to interpret them. Sometimes Satan orders him to do this or that or the contrary, but generally he wants either meat or money, which is always sent him and hung up on a little plate made of coconut leaves on the boughs of a tree near the river. I have asked them what they thought the devil did with the money and whether or no they thought that he eat the victuals. As for the money, they said, so that the man ordered to do so did but part with it, it signified not who took it. Therefore it was generally a prey to the first stranger who found it. And the meat he did not eat, but bringing his mouth near it, he sucked at once all the savoriness out of it, without disturbing its position in the least, but rendered it tasteless as water. But what is much more difficult to reconcile to the rules of human reason is the belief which these people have that women who bring forth children sometimes bring forth at the same time young crocodiles as twins to the children. These creatures are received by the midwives most carefully and immediately carried down to the river where they are turned loose, but have victuals supplied them constantly from the family especially the twin who is necessitated to go down to the river every now and then and give meat to this sudara, as it is called, who, if he is deprived of such attention, constantly afflicts his relations with sickness. The existence of an opinion so contradictory to human reason, and which seemed totally unconnected with religion, was with me a long subject of doubt, but the universal testimony of every Indian I ever heard to speak of it was not to be withstood. It seems to have taken its rise in the island of Celebes and Bouton, very many of the inhabitants of which have crocodiles in their families. From thence it has spread itself all over the eastern islands, 
even to Timor and Saram, and west again as far as Java and Sumatra, on which islands, however, such instances are very scarce among the natives. To show how firmly this prejudice has laid hold of the minds of these ignorant people, I shall repeat one story out of the multitude I have heard, confirming it from ocular demonstration. A slave girl who was born and bred up among the English at Benkulin, on the island of Sumatra, by which means she had learnt a little English, told me that her father, when on his deathbed, told her that he had a crocodile for his sudara, and charged her to give him meat, etc., after he was gone, telling her in what part of the river he was to be found. She went, she said, constantly, and calling him by his name Rajaputi, White King. He came out of the water to her, and eat what she brought. He was, she said, not like the other crocodiles, but handsomer, his body being spotted and his nose red. Moreover, he had bracelets of gold on his feet, and earrings of the same metal in his ears. I heard her out patiently, without finding fault, with the absurdity of her giving ears to a crocodile. While I am writing this, my servant, who I hired at Batavia, and is a mongrel between a Dutch man and a Javan woman, tells me that he has seen at Batavia a crocodile of this kind. It was about two feet long, being very young. Many, both Malays and Dutch, saw it at the same time. It had gold bracelets on. Ah, I said, why such a one at Batavia told me of one which had earrings likewise, and you know that a crocodile has no ears. Ah, but, said he, these Sudara Oran are different from other crocodiles. They have five toes on each foot, and a large tongue which fills their mouth. And they have ears also, but they are very small. So far will a popular error deceive people, unused to examine into the truth of what they are told. The Bugis, Makassar, and Boatons, many of whom have such relations left behind in their own country, make a kind of ceremonial feast in memory of their relations. A large party of them go in a boat furnished with plenty of provisions of all kinds, and music. In this they row about in places where crocodiles or alligators are most common, singing and crying by turns, each invoking their relation. In this manner they go on, so they are fortunate enough to see, or fancy at least, that they see one when at once their music stops, and they throw overboard provisions, betel, tobacco, etc., imagining, I suppose, that their civility to the species will induce their kindred at home to think well of them, though unable to pay their proper offerings. Next come the Chinese, who in this place are very numerous, but seem to be people of small substance. Many of them live within the walls and keep shops, some few of which are furnished with a pretty rich show of European as well as Chinese goods. But far the greatest number live in a quarter by themselves, without the walls, called Kampon China. Besides these, there are others scattered everywhere about the country, where they cultivate gardens, sow rice and sugar, or keep cattle and buffaloes, whose milk they bring daily to town. Nor are the inhabitants of the town and camp on China less industrious. You see among them carpenters, joiners, smiths, tailors, slipper-makers, and dyers of cottons, embroiderers, etc. In short, the general character of industry given to them by all authors who have wrote upon them is well exemplified here, though the more genteel parts of their custom cannot, on account of the want of rich and well-worn people, be found among them. Those China alone can show. Here nothing can be sought for but the native disposition of the lower class of people. There is nothing, be it of what nature it will, clean or dirty, honest or dishonest, provided there is not too much danger of a halter, which a Chinese will not readily do for money. They work diligently and laboriously, and loth to lose sight of their main point, money-getting. No sooner do they leave work than they begin to game, either at cards, dice, or some other of the thousand games they have which are unknown to us in Europe. In this manner they spend their lives working and gaming, scarce allowing themselves time for the necessary refreshments of food and sleep. In short, it is as extraordinary a sight to see a Chinaman idle as it is to see a Dutchman or Indian at work. In manners they are always civil, or rather obsequious, in dress always neat and clean to a high degree, from the highest to the lowest. 
To attempt to describe either their dresses or persons would be only to repeat some of the many accounts of them that have been published, as every one has been wrote by people who had much better opportunities of seeing them, and more time to examine them than I have had. Indeed, a man need go no farther to study them than the china paper, the better sort of which represents their persons, and such of their customs, dresses, etc., as I have seen most strikingly like, though a little in the caricature style. Indeed, some of the plants, which are common to China and Java, as bamboo, are better figured there than in the best botanical authors that I have seen. In eating they are easily satisfied, not but that the richer have many savoury dishes. Rice, however, is the chief food of the poorer, with a little fish or flesh, as they can afford it. They have a great advantage over the Malays, not being taught by their laws or religion to abstain from any food that is wholesome, so that besides pork, dogs, cats, frogs, lizards, and some kinds of snakes, as well as many sea animals looked upon by other people to be by no means eatable, are their constant food. In the vegetable way they also eat many things which Europeans would never think of, even if starving with hunger, as the young leaves of many trees, that lump of bractea and flowers at the end of a branch of plantains, the flowers of a tree called by the Malays combang ture, Escanomi grandiflora, the pods of kelor, guilandina moringa, two sorts of blights, amaranthus, all which are boiled or stewed, also the seeds of terati, nympha nulimbo, which indeed are almost as good as hazelnuts. All these, however, the Malays also eat, as well as many more whose names I had not the opportunity of learning, as my illness rendered me weak and unable to go about, prevented me from mixing with these people, as I should otherwise have done. In their buryings the Chinese have an extraordinary superstition, which is that they will never more open the ground in the place where a man has been buried, by which means it happens that their burying grounds in the neighborhood of Batavia cover many hundred acres, on which account the Dutch, grudging the quantity of ground laid waste by this method, will not sell them ground for it, but at enormous prices, notwithstanding which they will always raise money to purchase grounds whenever they can find a Dutch in a humor to sell it, and actually had while we were there a great deal of land intended for that purpose, but not yet begun upon. Their funerals are attended with much purchased and some real lamentations, the relations of the deceased attending, as well as women hired to weep. The corpse is nailed up in a large, thick wooden coffin, not made of plank, but hollowed out of the trunk of a tree. This is let down into the grave and then surrounded, eight or ten inches thick, with their mortar, or chinum, as it is called, which in a short time becomes hard as stone, so that the bones of the meanest among them are more carefully preserved from injury than those of our greatest and most respected people. Of the government here I can say but very little, only that an uncommonly great subordination is kept up, every man who is able to keep house, having a certain rank acquired by the length of his services to the company, which ranks are distinguished by the ornaments of the coaches and dresses of the coachmen, of such as have them. As for instance, one must ride in a plain coach, another paints his coach with figures, and gives his coachman a laced hat, another gilds his coach, etc., the governor-general, as he is called, who resides here, is superior over all the Dutch governors and other officers in the East Indies, who to a man are obliged to come to him at Batavia to have their accounts passed, and if they are found to have been at all negligent or faulty, it is a common practice to delay them there one, two, or three years, according to the pleasure of the governor, for no one can leave the place without his consent and approbation. Next to the general are the Radin van India, or members of the council, called here Edela Hiran, and by the corruption of the English idoliers, in respect to whom every one who meets them in a carriage is obliged to drive on one side of the road, and stop there till they are passed, which distinction is expected by their wives and even children, and commonly paid to them. Nor can the coachmen who are hired be restrained from paying this slavish mark of respect by anything but the threats of instant death as some of our captains have experienced, who thought it beneath the dignity of the rank they held under his Britannic Majesty's service to submit to any such a humiliating ceremony. Justice is administered here by a parcel of gentlemen of the law, who have ranks and dignities among themselves, as in Europe. 
In civil matters I know nothing of their proceedings, but in criminal they are rather severe to the natives, and too lenient to their countrymen, who, whatever crime they have committed, are always allowed to escape, if they choose it, and if brought to trial very rarely punished with death, while on the other hand the poor Indians are flogged, hanged, broke upon the wheel, and even impaled without mercy. While we were there, three remarkable crimes were committed by Christians. Two duelists killed each his antagonist, and both fled. One took refuge on board our ship, bringing with him so good a character from the Batavians that the captain gave him protection, nor was he ever demanded. The other, I suppose, went on board some other, as he was never taken. The other was a Portuguese who, by means of a false key, had robbed an office to which he belonged of fourteen or fifteen hundred pounds. He, however, was taken, but instead of death condemned to a public whipping and banishment to Banda for ninety-nine years. The Malays and Chinese have each proper officers of their own who administer justice among them in civil cases, liable to an appeal to the Dutch court, which, however, rarely happens. Before the Chinese rebellion as the Dutch, or massacre as the Chinese themselves and most Europeans call it, in 1740, when the Dutch, upon maybe too slight an information, massacred no man knows how many thousand Chinese, unresisting, for a supposed rebellion, which they to this day declare to have been never so much as thought of by them, the Chinese had two or three of their body in the council, and many more privileges than now. Nor have they from that time to this, by any means, recovered either their former opulence or numbers. Every one now who has got anything considerable, choosing to retire with it, either to China or anywhere, rather than remain in the power of a people who have behaved so ill to them. The taxes paid by these people to the company are very considerable, among which that commonly said to be paid for the liberty of wearing their hair is not inconsiderable. It is, however, no other than a kind of head money or poll tax, for no Chinese can wear his hair who has ever been in China, it being a principle of their religion, never to let their hair grow again once it has been shaved off. These taxes are paid monthly when a flag is hoisted at a house in the middle of the town, appointed for that purpose. The money current here is ducats, worth eleven s sterling, ducatoons, six and eight, imperial rix dollars, five, rupees, two and six, shillings, and six, dubchis, and two and a half, and dwats, and one quarter. Spanish dollars were, when we were there, at five and five, and we were told were never lower than five and four, even at the company's warehouse. For English guineas I could get no more than nineteen, for though the Chinamen would give twenty, for some of the brightest they would, for those at all worn, give no more than seventeen. Strangers must, however, be cautious in receiving money, as there are of several kinds two sorts, milled and unmilled. Ducatoons, for example, when milled, are worth six and eight, unmilled only six. All accounts are kept in rix dollars and stivers, both imaginary coins, at least here, the first worth four, the other worth and one. It must also be remarked that this valuation of their coin is rated on the supposition of a stiver being worth a penny, which is really worth more, a current rix dollar of 48 stivers being worth four and six. End of section 55. Part 3 of An Account of Batavia. Section 56 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 56. January, 1771. 1771, January 1. Worked all night and today likewise. At night, anchored under a high island, called in the drafts Krakatoa, and by the Indians Pulo Rakata. I had been unaccountably troubled with mosquitoes ever since we left Batavia, and still imagined that they increased instead of decreasing, although my opinion was universally thought improbable. Today, however, the mystery was discovered, for on getting up water today, Dr. Sullender, who happened to stand near the scuttle cask, observed an infinite number of them in their water state in it, who, as soon as the sun had a little effect upon the water, began to come out in real effective mosquitoes incredibly fast. 
1771, January 2. This morn when we rose, we saw that there were many houses and much cultivation upon Krakatoa, so that probably a ship might meet with refreshments, who chose to touch here in preference to Prince's Island. The wind was so foul and balked us so often that after having sailed the whole day, we were glad at night to come back again to our old berth under Krakatoa. 1771, January 3. Though we had again got under way in the night, yet this morn we had gained but little, nor did we much more all day. At night, however, a breeze sprung up at southeast, and we sailed on cheerily. 1771, January 4. Soon after dinner time today, we anchored under Princess Island and went ashore. The people who met us carried us immediately to a man whom they told us was their king, with whom, after a few compliments, we proceeded to business. That was to settle the price of Churchill, in which we did not well agree. This, however, did not at all discourage us, as we doubted not but that in the morn we should have them at our own price. So we walked a little way along shore, and the Indians dispersed. One canoe, however, remained, and just as we went off sold us three turtle on a promise that we should not tell the king. 1771, January 5. Ashore today, trading. The Indians dropped their demands very slowly, but were very civil. Towards noon, however, they came down to the offered price, so that before night we had bought up a large quantity of turtle. In the evening I went to pay my respects to His Majesty the King, who I found at his house, in the middle of a rice field, cooking his own supper. He received me, however, very politely. 1771, January 6. Many people were down at the trading place with fowls, fish, monkeys, small deer, etc., etc., but few or no turtle. They said that we had bought them all the day before. 1771, January 8. In the morn the ship, which had in the night been driven something nearer the shore, was so near being ashore that the foot of the rudder touched several times, and indeed gave the first intimation of our danger, but by the alertness of the officers she was hove into deep water in a very short time. The day was rainy throughout, and very few Indians came to the watering place, so that nothing was bought but a few fish and fowls. 1771, January 9. Fine weather today, and rather more trade than usual. Early in the morn eight guns were heard, within Pepper Point, but no ship had been seen by either us or the islanders, so we could not even guess the occasion of them. 1771, January 10. Little trade. The people brought down a deer of a kind, weighing about forty pound. Our stock of turtle was now considerably increased, some few having been bought every day, though the joint number did not equal what had been bought the first day. 1771, January 11. My servant Sander, who I had hired at Batavia, having found out that these people had a town somewhere along the shore to the westward, and not very far off, I resolved to visit it. But knowing that the inhabitants were not at all desirous of our company, kept my intentions secret from them. In the morn I set out, accompanied by our second lieutenant, and went along shore, telling all whom I met that I was in search of plants, which indeed was also the case. In about two hours we arrived at a place where were about four or five houses. Here we met an old man, and ventured to ask him questions about the town. He said it was very distant, but we, not much relying on his information, proceeded on our way, as did he in our company, attempting, however, several times to lead us out of the pathway which we were now in. We remained firm to our purpose, and soon got sight of our desired object. The old man then turned our friend and accompanied us to the houses, I suppose near four hundred in number, divided into the old and new town, between which was a brackish river. In the old town we met with several old acquaintances, one of whom, at the rate of two d a head, undertook to transport us over the river, which he did in two very small canoes, which we prevented from oversetting by laying them alongside each other and holding them together. In this manner we safely went through our navigation, and arrived at the new town, where the king's and all the nobility's houses were, which the inhabitants very freely showed to us. The most of them were shut up, the people in general at this time of year, living in their rice fields, to defend the crops from monkeys, birds, etc. When our curiosity was satisfied, we hired a large sailing boat, for which we gave two rupees for S, which carried us home time enough to dine upon the deer we had bought the day before, which proved very good and savoury meat. 
in the evening when we went ashore we were acquainted that an axe had been stole from one of our people this as the first theft we thought it not proper to pass over so immediate application was made to the king who after some time promised that it should be returned in the morn seventeen seventy one january twelve the hatchet was brought down according to promise the thief they said afraid of conviction had in the night conveyed it into the house of the man who brought it trade as usual two or three hundred weight of turtle in a day with fowls etc myself was this day seized with a return of my batavia fever which i attributed to being much exposed to a burning sun in trading with the natives seventeen seventy one january thirteen it was resolved to sail to-morrow which the natives had been informed of yesterday so they brought down rather more turtle than usual my fever returned but i resolved not to attempt to cure it till in the main ocean i should meet with a better air than this uncleared island could possibly have in the eve after my fit i went ashore to the king to whom time after time i had made small presents altogether not of five shillings value carrying two quires of paper which as he had done everything else he most thankfully received we had much conversation the purport of which was his asking why the english ships did not touch here as they used to do i told him that as they had not on the island turtle enough to supply one ship they could not expect many but advised him to breed cattle sheep and buffaloes which advice however he did not seem much to approve see account of batavia seventeen seventy one january fourteen our intention of sailing this morn was delayed by want of wind it being calm till eleven o'clock when a gentle breeze sprang up which was favourable the morning however was not thrown away for the indians seeing us not gone wrought fish and some turtle which were bought our breeze though favourable was however so slack that by night we had got no farther than abreast of the town where we anchored seventeen seventy one january fifteen weighed again and stood out to sea with a breeze so gentle that at night we were still in sight of land seventeen seventy one january sixteen this morn we waked in the open ocean nothing in sight but sea and sky the winds though fair continued yet so gentle that we hardly knew whether we went on or stood still at night a booby made us a visit and slept his last sleep in the stomachs of some of our men not induced quite to forsake the old trade of booby eating even by the present abundance of victuals seventeen seventy one january seventeen calms and light breezes still detained us till eve when a pleasant breeze sprung up and gave us hopes of soon gaining the trade wind which we impatiently longed for especially myself who had my fever every day nor was i the only sick man many began to complain of purgings some tropic birds and gannets pelicanus risk were seen seventeen seventy one january eighteen in the morn rain with light breezes several man-of-war birds and some shearwaters were about the ship seventeen seventy one january nineteen light breezes all day a ship in sight but not too far off to distinguish her colours seventeen seventy one january twenty weather as usual two ships in sight who showed us dutch colours and then sailed ahead of us letting us know that sure as our ship might be she was too slow to outsail even a dutchman several tropic birds were seen in the eve the wind came foul myself who had began with the bark yesterday missed my fever to-day the people however in general grew worse and many had now the dysentery or bloody flux seventeen seventy one january twenty one the wind remained as it was but one of the dutchmen had so far outsailed us as to be entirely out of sight the other however was not so much ahead but that we sometimes flattered ourselves with thinking that we could sail as fast as her some few gannets and porpoises were about the ship seventeen seventy one january twenty two our friend the slow dutchman was this morn out of sight the wind still foul almost all the ship's company were now ill with either fluxes or severe purgings myself far from well mr sporing very ill and mr parkinson very little better his complaint was a slow fever seventeen seventy one january twenty three myself was too ill to-day to do anything one of our people died of the flux in the evening seventeen seventy one january twenty four my distemper this day turned out to be a flux attended as that disease always is 
with excruciating pains in my bowels, on which I took to my bed. In the eve, Mr. Sporing died. 1771, January 25. One more of the people died today. Myself endured the pains of the damned almost. At night, they became fixed in one point in my bowels, on which the surgeon of the ship thought proper to order me the hot bath, into which I went four times at the intervals of two hours, and felt great relief. 1771, January 26. Though better than yesterday, my pains were still almost intolerable. In the evening, Mr. Parkinson died, and one of the ship's crew. 1771, January 28. Self something easier, but still in great pain. This day, Mr. Green, our astronomer, and two of the people died. All of the same complaint as I labored under. No very encouraging circumstance. 1771, January 29. Self still bad. Three more of the people died this day. 1771, January 30. For the first time, I found myself better and slept some time, which my continual pains had never suffered me to do before, notwithstanding the opiates which were constantly administered. One person only died today, but so weak were the people in general that officers and men included, not more than eight or nine, could keep the deck, so that four in a watch was all they had. 1771, January 31. This day I got out of my bed in good spirits and free from pain, but very weak. My recovery has been as rapid as my disease was violent, but to what cause to attribute either the one or the other? We were all equally at a loss. The wind which came to east and southeast yesterday blew today in the same direction, so we had little reason to doubt its being the true trade, a circumstance which raised the spirits of even those who are the most afflicted with the tormenting disease, which now raged with its greatest violence. End of section 56, January 1771. Section 57 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 57. Some Account of Prince's Island. Prince's Island, as it is called by the English, in Malay, Pulo Salan, and in the language of its inhabitants, Pula Paniatan, is a small island situated in the western mouth of the Straits of Sunday. It is woody, and has no remarkable hill upon it, though the English call the small one, which is just over the anchoring place, the pike. This island was formerly much frequented by India ships of many nations, but especially English, who have of late forsaken it on account, it is said, of the badness of the water, and stop either at North Island, a small island on the Sumatra coast, without the east entrance of the Straits, or at New Bay, a few leagues only from Princess Island, at neither of which places, however, any quantity of refreshments can be procured. Its chief produce is water, which is situated in such a manner that if you are not careful in filling high enough up the brook, it will inevitably be brackish, from which circumstance alone I believe it has got a bad name with almost all nations. Turtle, of which, however, its supplies are not great, so that if a ship comes second or third in the season, she must be contented with small ones, and no great plenty of them, as indeed was in some measure our case. We bought at very various prices according to the humor of the people, but altogether, I believe, they came to about one half penny or three quarters a pound. They were of the green kind, but not very fat or well flavored in any degree, as they are in most other parts, which I believe is in great measure, owing to the people keeping them sometimes very long in crawls of brackish water, where they have no kind of food given to them. Fowls are tolerably cheap. A dozen of large ones sold when we were there for a Spanish dollar, which is five D apiece. They have also plenty of monkeys and small deer, Moscus pygmaeus, the largest of which are not quite so big as a new fallen lamb, and another kind of deer called by them munchak, about the size of a sheep. The monkeys were about one half a dollar, two and six, the small deer two d, the larger of which they brought down only two, a rupee or two s. Fish they have many various kinds which are sold by hand, as you can bargain. We found them, however, always tolerably cheap. Vegetables they have, coconuts a dollar for one hundred, if you choose them, or one hundred and thirty, if you take them as they come. 
plantains plenty, some watermelons, pineapples, jackas, pumpkins, also rice, chiefly of the mountain sort, which grows on dry land, yams and several other vegetables, all which are sold reasonably enough. The inhabitants are Javans, whose Raja is subject to the Sultan of Bantam, from whom they receive orders, and to whom they possibly pay a tribute. But of that particular I am not certain. Their customs, I believe, are very much like those of the Indians about Batavia. Only they seem much more jealous of their women, so much so that I never saw one the whole time of our stay, except she was running away full speed to hide herself in the woods. Their religion is Mahometanism, but I believe they have not a mosque upon the island. They were, however, very strict in the observance of their fast, the same as the Ramadan of the Turks, during which we happened to come. Not one would touch victuals till sunset or even chew their beetle, but one half or an hour before all went home to cook the kettle, nor would they stay for anything but view of extraordinary profit. Their food was nearly the same as the Batavian Indians, adding only to it the nuts of the palm called Cycus circinalis, with which on the coast of New Holland some of our people were made ill, and some of our hogs poisoned outright. Their method of preparing them to get out their deleterious qualities, they told me were first to cut the nuts into thin slices, and dry them in the sun, then to steep them in fresh water for three months, afterwards pressing the water from them, and drying them in the sun once more. They, however, were so far from being a delicious food, that they never used them but in times of scarcity, when they mixed the preparation with their rice. Their town, which they called Samadang, consisted of about three hundred houses. Great part of the old town, however, was in ruin. Their houses were all built up on pillars, four or five feet above the ground. The plan of that of Gandang, a man who seemed to be next in riches and influence to the king, will give an idea of them all. It was walled with boards, a luxury none but the king and himself had, but in no other respect differed from those of the middling people, except being a little longer. The walls were made of bamboo, planted on small perpendicular sticks, fastened to the beams. The floors were also of bamboo. Each stick, however, laid at a small distance from the next, so that the air had free passage from below, by which means these houses were always cool. The thatch of palm leaves was always thick and strong, so that neither rain nor sunbeams could find entrance through it. When we were at the town, there were very few inhabitants there. The rest lived in occasional houses built in the rice fields, where they watched the crop to prevent the devastations of monkeys, birds, etc. These occasional houses are smaller than those of the town. The posts which support them also, instead of being four or five feet in height, are eight or ten. Otherwise the divisions, etc., are quite the same. Their dispositions, as far as we saw them, were very good. At least they dealt very fairly with us, upon all occasions. Indian-like, however, always asking double whatever they could take, for whatever they had to dispose of. This, however, produced no inconveniences to us, who were used to this kind of traffic. In making out bargains they were very handy, and supplied the want of small money reasonably well, by laying together a quantity of any thing, and when the price was settled, dividing it among each other according to the proportion each had brought to the general stock. They would sometimes change our money, giving 240 duats for a Spanish dollar, that is, 5 s sterling, and 92, that is, 2 s sterling for a Bengal rupee. The money they chose, however, was duats in all small bargains. Double chase they had, but were very nice in taking them. Their language is different, both from the Malay and Javan. They all, however, speak Malay. These specimens of languages, so near each other in situation, I chose to give together, and selected the words without any previous choice, as I had wrote them down on a paper, that the similar and dissimilar words might equally be seen. As for the parts of the body, which I have made the subject of this and all my specimens of language, I chose them in preference to all others, as the names of them are easily got from people of whose language the inquirer has not the least idea. What I call the Javan is the language spoke at Samarang, a day's journey from the seat of the emperor of Java. I have been told that there are several other languages upon the island, but those I had no opportunity of collecting words from, meeting with no one who could speak them. A table of words. Prince's Island, Jalma, Java, Un Lanang, Malay, Oran Laki Laki. 
Prince's Island, Bikang, Java, Ung Wadang, Malay, Purampuan, Prince's Island, Orukulataki, Java, Lari, Malay, Anak, Prince's Island, Holo, Java, Andas, Malay, Kapala, Prince's Island, Irung, Java, Irung, Malay, Idung, Prince's Island, Mata, Java, Moto, Malay, Mata, Prince's Island, Chole, Java, Kuping, Malay, Kuping, Prince's Island, Kutok, Java, Untu, Malay, Gigi, Prince's Island, Bietung, Java, Wutong, Malay, Prot, Prince's Island, Serret, Java, Selet, Malay, Pantat, Prince's Island, Pimping, Java, Pu Pu, Malay, Paha, Prince's Island, Hulutur, Java, Dunsul, Malay, Lontur, Prince's Island, Mantis, Java, Sikkil, Malay, Kauki, Prince's Island, Cuckoo, Java, Cuckoo, Malay, Cuckoo, Prince's Island, Langan, Java, Tangan, Malay, Tangan, Prince's Island, Ramo, Java, Langan, Malay, Jari, Jaring. The Prince's Islanders call their language Katagunung, which is the mountain language, and say that it is spoken upon the mountains of Java from whence their tribe originally came, first to New Bay, a few leagues off only, and thence to Prince's Island, driven there by the quantities of tigers. The Malay, Javan, and Prince's Island all have words in them either exactly alike or else plainly deriving their origin from the same source with others in the language of the South Sea Islands. This is particularly visible in their numbers, from whence one should at first be inclined to suppose that their learning at least had been derived originally from one and the same source. But how that strange problem of the numbers of the black inhabitants of Madagascar, so vastly similar to those of Otahite, could have come to pass surpasses, I confess, my skill to conjecture. The numbers that I give overleaf in the comparative table I had from a negro-born slave at Madagascar, who was at Batavia with an English ship from whence he was sent for, merely to satisfy my curiosity in the language. There being much fewer words in the prince's island language, similar to South Sea words, is owing in great measure to my not having taken a sufficient quantity of words upon the spot to compare with it. Specimens of Language South Sea 1. Mata Malay Majta Java Moto Princess Island Mata and I South Sea 2. Ma Malay Makan Java Mangan To eat Princess Island No entry South Sea 3. Ainu Malay Menem Java Numbi To drink Princess Island No entry South Sea 4. Mate Malay Mate Java Mate To kill Princess Island, no entry. South Sea, Utu. Malay, Kutu, a Laos. Java and Princess Island, no entries. South Sea, 6, Iwa. Malay, Udian. Java, Udan, rain. Princess Island, no entry. South Sea, 7, Owe. Malay and Java, no entry. Princess Island, Awe. Bamboo cane. South Sea, 8, U. Malay, no entry. Java, Susu, abreast. Prince's Island, no entry. South Sea 9, Manu. Malay, no entry. Java, Manu. Prince's Island, Manuk, a bird. South Sea Island 10, Aiea. Malay, Iken. Java, Iwa, a fish. Prince's Island, no entry. South Sea 11, Uta. Malay, Utan, inland. Java and Prince's Island, no entry. South Sea, 12, Tapao. Malay, no entry. Java, Tapaan, the foot. Princess Island, no entry. South Sea, 13, to Ura. Malay, Udang. Java, Urang, a lobster. Princess Island, no entry. South Sea, 14, Uefe. Malay, Ubi. Java, Uwe, yams. Princess Island, no entry. South Sea, 15, Etanu. Malay, Tanan, Java, Tandur, to bury. Princess Island, no entry. South Sea, 16, Enamu. Malay, Namuk, a mosquito, 
Java, and Prince's Island, no entries. South Sea 17, Hiaru. Malay, Garu. Java, Garu. To scratch. Prince's Island, no entry. South Sea 18, Taru. Malay, Talas. Java, Talas. Cocos Roots. Prince's Island, no entry. South Sea 19, O2. Malay and Java, no entries. Prince's Island, Sungut, the mouth. South Sea 20, Ito. Malay and Java, no entries. Prince's Island, Tau. Sugarcane. Table of Numbers. South Sea 1, Tahi, Malay, Satu. Java, Sigi. Prince's Island, Hegi. Madagascar, Ifsi. South Sea 2, Rua. Malay, Dua. Java, Loro. Prince's Isle, Dua. Madagascar, Rua. South Sea 3, Toru. Malay, Tiga. Java, Tulu. Prince's Island, Tolu. Madagascar, Tello. South Sea 4, Ha. Malay, Ampat. Java, Papat. Prince's Island, Opat. Madagascar, Ifats. South Sea 5, Rima. Malay, Lima. Java, Limo. Prince's Island, Lima. Madagascar, Limi. South Sea 6, Feni. Malay, Anam. Java, Nunam. Prince's Isle, Gunop. Madagascar, Eni. South Sea 7, Hetu. Malay, Tuju. Java, Petu. Prince's Isle, Tuju. Madagascar, Fitu. South Sea 8, Waru. Malay, Delapan. Java, Wolo. Prince's Isle, Delapan. Madagascar, Walu. South Sea 9, Iva. Malay, Sembalan. Java, Songo. Prince's Isle, Salapan. Madagascar, Sivi. South Sea 10, Ahuru. Malay, Sapulu. Java, Sapulu. Prince's Isle, Sapulu. Madagascar, Furu. South Sea 11, Matahi. Malay, Sabilas. Java, Suvalas. No entries for Prince's Isle and Madagascar. 12. South Sea, Maru. Malay, Dubalas. Java, Roalas. No entry, Prince's Isle and Madagascar. South Sea 20, Tahitau. Malay, Duapulu. Java, Rompulu. No entry, Prince's Isle and Madagascar. South Sea 100, Rimatau. Malay, Saratus. Java, Satus. Prince's Isle, Satus. Madagascar, no entry. South Sea 200, Manu. Malay, Dua Ratus. Java, Rongatus. No entry, Prince's Island and Madagascar. South Sea 1000, Lima Manu. Malay, Sorabu. Java, Siawu. Prince's Isle, Siawu. No entry for Madagascar. South Sea 2000, Manu Tine. No entry for Malay, Java, Prince's Isle or Madagascar. Notobene. In the Isle of Uliatia, six is called Ono. The Madagascar language has also some words similar to Malay words, as Uron the nose, in Malay Irong Lala, the tongue Lida Tang, the hand Tangantan, the ground Tana. From the similitude of language between the inhabitants of the eastern Indies and the islands in the South Sea, I should have ventured to conjecture much did not Madagascar interfere, and how any communication can ever have been carried between Madagascar and Java to make the brown, long-haired people of the latter speak a language similar to that of the black, woolly-headed natives of the other is, I confess, far beyond my comprehension. Unless the Egyptian learning, running in two courses, one through Africa, the other through Asia, might introduce the same words, and which is still more probable numerical terms, into the languages of people who never had any communication with each other, but this point requiring a depth of knowledge in antiquities, I must leave to antiquarians to discuss. End of section 57. Some account of Prince's Island. Section 58 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771. By Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 58. February 1771. 1771, February 1. Fine, brisk trade kept up our spirits and helped to raise me fast. 
Two of the people died today, nevertheless. 1771, February 2. Breeze continued today. The surgeon began to think that the rapid progress of the disease was checked by it, but declared at the same time that several people were still without hopes of recovery. 1771, February 3. Some of the people who were the least affected began now to show signs of amendment, but two of the bad ones died, notwithstanding. 1771, February 4. Weather fine. As no one had been taken ill since we got the trade wind, we were now well convinced of its salutary effects. 1771, February 5. Weather as usual, but though it prevented it, could not cure entirely our disease. One more dying of it today. 1771, February 7. Our people, who were not very bad, before the first of this month were now almost universally recovered, but there were still several in the ship who at that time were very bad. These remained unalterably the same, neither becoming better nor worse. Through the whole course of this distemper, medicine has been of little use, the sick generally proceeding gradually to their end, without a favorable symptom, till the change of weather stopped in a manner instantaneously the malignant quality of the disease. 1771, February 8. A large Dutch ship in sight, but she soon outsailed us as her fellows had done before her. 1771, February 11. One more of the people died. 1771, February 12. Another died. 1771, February 14. A third died today. Neither of these people had grown either better or worse for many days. 1771, February 18. An uncommonly large number of tropic birds were about the ship this day. 1771, February 20. Lost another man. 1771, February 24. An albatross scene, the first sign we have had of approaching the south again, which we have for some days done pretty fast. 1771, February 26. Lost three more people today, and got the wind at northeast. For the first time it has varied from the true trade. 1771, February 27. At four this morn we were taken aback by a strong breeze of wind at southwest not without some danger, as our people yet only recovering from their late illnesses, had scarce strength to get the ship before the wind. All morn it blew fresh from the same point, but at night veered round to the south. Many albatrosses in sheer waters were about the ship all day. 1771, February 28. Wind still at south. Blew fresh, but weather dry and clear. In the even came to southeast. Several fish were about the ship. End of section 58, February 1771. Section 59 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August, 1768 to 12 July, 1771, by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 59, March. 1771. 1771, March 1. Light winds and variable all day. 1771, March 2. Winds and weather much as yesterday. At night, a bank of clouds were seen to the westward, which had very much the appearance of land. 1771, March 3. Wind at southwest with dirty, foggy weather. In the evening, some of the people thought they saw land, but that opinion was rejected almost without examination as the journals in the ship, which had been kept by the log, were still above a hundred leagues, and those which had been corrected by observations of the sun and moon, full forty. The night was chiefly calms and light breezes, with fog and mist. 1771, March 4. Day broke, and showed us at its earliest dawn how fortunate we had been in the calms of last night. What was then supposed to be land proved really so, and not above five miles from us so that another hour would have infallibly have carried us upon it. But fortunate as we might think ourselves to be yet unshipwrecked, we were still in extreme danger. The wind blew right upon the shore, and with it a heavy sea ran, which broke mountains high upon the rocks, with which it was everywhere lined, so that though some in the ship thought it possible, the major part did not hope to be able to get off. Our anchors and cables were accordingly prepared, but the sea ran too high, to allow us a hope of the cables holding, should we be drove to the necessity of making use of them. And should we be drove ashore, the breakers gave us little hope 
of saving even our lives. At last, however, after four hours spent in the vicissitudes of hope and fear, we found that we got gradually off, and before night were out of danger. The land from whence we so narrowly escaped is part of the Terra de Natal, laying between the rivers Sangua and Formas, about twenty leagues to the southward of the Bay of Natal. The shore seemed everywhere steep and rocky, but the hills inland rose in gradual slopes, spotted here and there with woods, and where it was not looked green and pleasant. 1771, March 5. For this day or two we have thought it rather colder than we should choose. At noon today the thermometer in the shade was at seventy. Land today in sight and no more. 1771, March 6. Foul wind and cloudy weather all day. 1771, March 7. Fair wind accompanied with clear weather. Over the land, however, at least in that direction, hung clouds and appearances of rain, as indeed was generally the case. For these some days past the seamen have found the ship to be drove hither and thither by currents in a manner totally unaccountable to them. 1771, March 8. Calmish. Many birds were observed, such as albatrosses, black and grey shearwaters, chiefly settling upon the water. The surface was pretty thickly strewed with the substance that I have before often mentioned under the name of sea sawdust. The sea water likewise emitted a strong smell like that of seaweeds rotting on the shore. 1771, March 9. Struck soundings today on the Cape Bank. The water on it appeared thick and muddy. Many birds, especially gannets, were seen about the ship. In the night especially, the forepart of it, a very heavy dew fell. 1771, March 10. In the morn the water was clear and blue, very unlike the muddy complexion it had yesterday. At ten the land was seen, which proved to be to the eastward of Cape das Aguilas. It appeared low and sandy near the shore with high land rising behind, it inland resembling very some parts of New Holland. In the evening Cape das Aguilas was not more than six leagues off, so that we doubted not at all of being round it before morn. At nightfall, however, the wind came right ahead and threatened a gale. 1771, March 11. All last night the wind was foul. The current, however, assisted us a little. In the morn the water was clear, but we saw gannets and albatrosses. Soon after, the wind favored, and we got round Cabo das Aguilas, when we had the water again very thick and foul, with many birds about the ship. At night were abreast of the high land, between Cabo das Aguilas and Cabo Falso. The water was as full of shining insects as we have seen it in the voyage. In the day, several fires were seen ashore. 1771, March 12. In the morn saw Cape Falso, and soon after the Cape of Good Hope, off which we observed a rock, not laid down in the charts. The breeze was fresh and fair. It carried us as far as Table Bay, off which we anchored. In coming along shore, we saw several smokes upon the next hill, before the lion's rump, and when at an anchor fires upon the side, and near the top of the Table Mountain. In the bay were several ships, four French, two Danes, one English, viz. the Admiral Pocock, Indiaman, and several Dutch. 1771, March 13. Wind so fresh at southeast that we could not attempt to go ashore. No boat, indeed, in the whole harbor attempted to stir. The Dutch Commodore hauled down his broad pennant, a signal for all boats belonging to him, to keep on board. John Thomas died. 1771, March 14. Table Bay. In the morn moderate, so that the ship was got under way, and steered into the harbor to her proper berth. A Dutch boat came on board to inquire from whence we came, and brought with her a surgeon who examined our sick, and then gave leave for them and us to come ashore, which we accordingly did at dinner time. 1771, March 16. Captain Riddle sailed this day for England. 1771, March 17. Dr. Solander, who had been on board the Indiaman last night, was this morn taken violently ill with a fever and pain in his bowels. A country physician was immediately sent for, who declared on hearing his case that it was the common consequence of Batavia fevers, and that the doctor would be much worse and would for some time suffer very much by his bowel complaint but upon the whole he declared that there was no danger. I could not, however, help being a good deal alarmed in my own opinion. 
1771, March 18. The Houghton India man, Captain Smith, came into the road. 1771, March 30. The Duke of Gloucester Indiaman, Captain Lauder, came into the road. 1771, March 31. Dr. Salander, after having been confined to his better chamber ever since the 17th of this month, with an irregularly intermitting fever and violent pains in his bowels, which alarmed me very much at several different times, this day came downstairs for the first time, very much emaciated by his tedious illness. End of section 59. March 1771. Section 60 of the Endeavour Journal of Sir Joseph Banks. Journal from 25 August 1768 to 12 July 1771 by Joseph Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Section 60. April 1771. 1771, April 3. French vessels. Theodosio Seaman died very suddenly. He had enjoyed an uninterrupted state of good health during all our times of sickness. 1771, April 7. The Europa Indiaman Captain Pelly came into the bay. Of the four French vessels which we found in this harbor, three are now sailed, and the fourth is ready for sea. Of them, two were sixty-four gun ships, the other a large snow, and the fourth, which still remains, a frigate. All these came from the Ile de France for provision of which they carry away from hence a prodigious quantity, and consequently must have many mouths to feed upon that island, from whence it is probable they meditate some stroke at our East Indian settlements in the beginning of a future war, which, however, our India people are not at all alarmed at, trusting entirely to the vast standing armies which they constantly keep up, the support of which in the Bengal alone costs 840,000 pounds a year. M. de Bougainville, pleased with the beauty of the ladies of Otaheite, gave that island the name of Cipre. In his return home he touched at Ile de France, where the person who went out with him, in the character of natural historian, was left and still remains. Otoroo, the Indian, whom he brought from thence, was known on board his ship by the name of Tuutavi, a plain corruption of Bougainville, with whom it may be supposed he meant to change names, according to his custom. This man is now at L'Ile de France, from whence a large ship is very soon to sail and carry him back to his own country, where she is to make a settlement, in doing which she must necessarily follow the tract of Abel Janssen Tasman, and consequently, if she does not discover Cook's Straits, which in all probability she will do, must make several discoveries on the coast of New Zealand. Thus much the French, who were here made no secret of, how necessary, then, will it be for us to publish an account of our voyage as soon as possible after our arrival, if we mean that our own country shall have the honour of our discoveries? Should the French have published an account of M. de Bougainville's voyage before that of the second dolphin, how infallibly will they claim the discovery of Cipre or Otahite as their own, and treat the dolphins having seen it as a fiction, which we were enabled to set forth with some show of truth? as the endeavour really did see it, a twelve-month, however, after M. de Bougainville, which, if England chooses to exert her prior claim to it, as she may hereafter do, if the French settle, it may be productive of very disagreeable consequences. See account of Cape of Good Hope below. 1771, April 14. Sailed from the road, but having very little wind, were obliged to anchor abreast of Robin Island. 1771, April 15. In the morn it was quite calm, so a boat was hoisted out, in order to land on the island, in hopes of purchasing some refreshments, especially of garden stuff and salading, with which two articles it is said to abound. But as soon as the boat came near the shore, the Dutch hailed her, and told the people in her at their peril to attempt landing, bringing down at the same time six men with muskets, who paraded on the beach as long as she stayed, which was but a short time not thinking it worth while to risk landing, in opposition to them, when a few cabbages was the only reward to be expected. This island, which is named after the seals that formerly used to frequent it, called in Dutch Robin, is low and sandy, situate in the mouth of Table Bay. Here are confined such criminals as are judged not worthy of death, 
for terms of years proportioned to the heinousness of their crimes. They are employed as slaves in the company's service, chiefly in digging for limestone, which, though very scarce upon the continent, is plentiful here. Their reason for not letting foreigners land here is said to be this. Formerly, a Dutch ship, which by sickness had lost the greatest part of her crew, came into the Cape and asked for assistance, which being refused, she came down to this island, and sending her boats ashore, secured the guard, and took on board as many of the criminals as she thought proper to navigate the ship home. In the evening, we had a fair breeze of wind, with which we put to sea. This night, M. Molyneux, master of the ship, died. 1771, April 16. In the course of this day, we took our final farewell of the tableland, having a pleasant breeze, and fair. 1771, April 17. Many birds, such as albatrosses, and some shearwaters, were about the ship. Also many pieces of trumpet weed floating by. 1771, April 18. Moderate weather, but a great rolling sea from the southward. 1771, April 19. Got the wind at northwest right in our teeth. Not strong, however. 1771, April 20. Wind and weather continuing just as yesterday. 1771, April 21. Got the wind again astern, with pleasant weather, which already altered much for the warmer. 1771, April 23. Foul wind again. Very veerable. 1771, April 25. Crossed the tropic this day with a fresh breeze of wind at southwest. So far we are unlucky, not having as yet met with the trade wind, which ships in general meet at latitude 30 at this time of the year, as we have been told. 1771, April 26. Saw two sternas, probably blown off from the coast of Africa, though they seem little to regard the ship, but flew towards the sea. In the even Dr. Sullender and several more heard a noise rumbling like distant thunder, which was in general supposed to be a gun from some ship not in sight. The doctor, however, thought that its duration was considerably longer than that of a gun fired in the open sea, where there is no echo. 1771, April 27. A large shoal of whales passed us today, who seemed to keep a pretty regular course, nearly in the same direction as the ship. 1771, April 28. This day we crossed our first meridian, and completed the circumnavigation of the globe, in doing which we as usual lost a day, which I should upon this occasion have expended properly, had I not lost it the second time, I know not how, in my irregular journal at the Cape. End of section 60. April 1771.